This book contains up to four sides per cassette. Side 1. Lord Valentine's Castle by Robert Silverberg Copyright 1979-1980 by Robert Silverberg Narrated by Noah Siegel This book contains 444 pages on 15 sides. If you would like to skip over any remaining announcements or introductory material, place your cassette player and fast forward until a beep is heard. Stop at that point to hear the table of contents, or at the second beep to locate the beginning of the book. Annotation On the immense planet Majipur, young Valentine undertakes an epic journey through strange and wonderful places to reclaim his throne as the rightful ruler of the planet. 1979 From the Book Jacket Robert Silverberg's eagerly awaited epic, his first novel in some years, is the grand romantic saga of a prince in his heroic quest to reclaim his birthright in his realm. Unable to remember his past, and not caring much about his future, Valentine finds himself on the outskirts of the legendary city of Pidruid, on the immense planet of Majipur. Joining a band of four-armed jugglers and a few humans, he sets out with the troop on an epic journey, performing in strange and wonderful cities before enraptured audiences. It is one of his companions, the beautiful Carabella, who holds him close as uneasy dreams unsettle his sleep, and when the dreams become even more threatening, it is another companion, a mystic dwarf, who helps him solve the mystery of who he is and from whence he came. Accompanied by a growing host of friends and supporters, Valentine's quest becomes an exciting pilgrimage across the vast continents and seas of Majipur to the great castle of the Coronal, where he must face the ultimate test to regain what is rightfully his. Rich in suspense and action, and written with an enthralling sweep and inventiveness, Robert Silverberg's Lord Valentine's Castle is bound to be among the most read and loved novels of the new decade. About the Author Robert Silverberg's novels and short stories have earned him the high regard of an international audience. He is perhaps best known for his books Dying Inside, The Book of Skulls, and Night Wings. Born in New York City, Mr. Silverberg now lives near San Francisco. For David Hartwell, Paige Cuddy, John Bush, they pushed very gently. Contents Book One The Book of the King of Dreams Side One Book Two The Book of the Metamorphs Side Four Book Three The Book of the Isle of Sleep Side Seven Book Four The Book of the Labyrinth Side Ten Book 5. The Book of the Castle. Side 12. Acknowledgements. For assistance with the technical aspects of juggling in this novel, I am indebted to Catherine Crowell of San Francisco and to those extraordinary performers, the Flying Karamazov Brothers, who may not be aware until this moment of just how much help they rendered. However, the concepts of the theory and practice of juggling as expressed herein are primarily my own, especially as regards the capabilities of forearm jugglers, and neither Ms. Crowell nor the Karamazovs should be held responsible for any implausibilities or impossibilities in these pages. Invaluable assistance in other aspects of writing this book was provided by Martha Randall. Among Ms. Randall's contributions are the texts of some of the songs found herein. For additional criticism of the manuscript in its troublesome early stages, I am grateful to Barbara Silverberg and Suzanne L. Hufek. And I owe thanks to Ted Chichak of the Scott Meredith Literary Agency for his support and encouragement and professional acumen. Robert Silverberg A Map Showing the Planet of Majipur 
three continents and an island lying in the great sea. In the northwest corner of the grouping is Zimroel, rectangular in shape. Due east of Zimroel is the much smaller Isle of Sleep, round in shape. Southwest of the Isle of Sleep, and extending southwest, is the Rodamont Archipelago. Due east of the Isle of Sleep is the largest of the continents in this grouping, Alhanroel, trapezoidal in shape with a long peninsula extending from the southwest corner. South of these three lands, and separated from them by the inner sea, is Suvrael, a long, narrow continent, and one just west of the center of the continent, the Gonga Mountains, which extend south and east at the southern end. From the northeast shore runs the river Zimmer on an angle southeast to the center of the eastern shore. The river Staichi extends south and slightly west from the river Zimmer at the point of the city, Nimoya, so that the river lies a bit east of the center of the continent. Also lying on the river Zimmer is the city Kintor, midway along the length of the river. On the eastern shore of Zimruel, the city of Pilaplok lies on the southern side of the long, very narrow bay into which the river Zimmer empties. Cities found in the northwest corner of the continent are Pidruid, situated on a tiny bay, Falkinkip, north and a little east of Pidruid, and Dulorn, due east of Pidruid, across a range of hills or small mountains, at the foot of which sits Dulorn. Farther down the western seaboard of Zimruel, halfway between the center of the continent and its southwest tip, lies the city of Tillamon. At the southernmost tip is the city Narobal. The southern coast describes a concave arc at its center. The whole of the southeast corner is swamps and marshes. At the northeast corner are the Kintor marshes. Toward the south of the Gongar Mountains, lies the city of Velethis, and due east of the northern end of the mountain range, and at the center of the continent, is to be found the city Illyrivoin. A map of the Isle of Sleep, which lies between Zimruel and Alhanruel. This verdant island is made up of four circular concentric levels. The first cliff leads up to the second level, the second cliff leads up to the third level, and the third cliff leads up to the fourth level, in the center of which is found the inner temple. On the northeast coast of the first level is the city of Numenor. Diametrically opposite Numenor, on the southwest coast of the first level, is the city of Teleus. Extending southwest of the Isle of Sleep in the inner sea is the Rodamont Archipelago which comprises a group of small, flat islands of varying shapes. A map of Alhanroel. This continent is somewhat trapezoidal in shape. A gulf, the Gulf of Stoian, is formed on the west coast as a result of a slightly extended northwest corner and a rather long peninsula, Stoianzar Peninsula, on the southwest corner. The city of Stoian lies on the north coast of the Stoianzar Peninsula, several miles in from the tip. On the west coast of Alhanroel, just north of the point at which the Stoianzar Peninsula begins its extension westward into the inner sea, is found the city of Trenon, which is situated on the mouth of the river Trey, which empties into the Gulf of Stoian. The river Trey originates in a range of hills, northeast of which is the city of Velalesia. East and somewhat north of the center of the continent is Castle Mount, from which extend, like the points of a star, six rivers, four of which empty into the Great Sea, running from Castle Mount, one northwest, another northeast, another due east, and the fourth southeast. A fifth river extending due west empties into the Gulf of Stoian and at whose mouth is found the city of Eleazar. The sixth river, the river Glage, runs southwest through the Glage Valley to the labyrinth. A detail of the Glage Valley and Castle Mount. 
Castle Mount is a very tall mountain on top of which sits the castle. In the foothills surrounding Castle Mount lies Amblemorn. Around Amblemorn are the origins of the various tributaries which converge southwest of Castle Mount to form the River Glage, which runs through Glage Valley. The River Glage empties into Lake Roghoys and extends again from the other side of the lake to the Labyrinth. On the north bank of the River Glage are found the cities Macroprosopus and southwest of Macroprosopus, Penduain. To the northwest of Lake Roghoys is the city of Velalesia. Book One The Book of the King of Dreams And then, after walking all day through a golden haze of humid warmth that gathered about him like fine wet fleece, Valentine came to a great ridge of outcropping white stone overlooking the city of Pidruid. It was the provincial capital, sprawling and splendid, the biggest city he had come upon since... since... the biggest in a long while of wandering at any rate. There he halted, finding a seat at the edge of the soft, crumbling white ridge, digging his booted feet into the flaking, ragged stone, and he sat there staring down at Pidruid, blinking as though newly out of sleep. On this summer day twilight was still some hours away, and the sun hung high to the southwest beyond Pidruid, out over the great sea. I will rest here for a while, Valentine thought, and then I will go down into Pidruid and find lodging for the night. As he rested, he heard pebbles tumbling past him from a higher point on the ridge. Unhurriedly he looked back the way he had come. A young herdsman had appeared, a boy with straw-colored hair and a freckled face, leading a train of fifteen or twenty mounts down the hill road. They were fat, sleek, purple-skinned beasts, obviously well looked after. The boy's own mount looked older and less plump, a wise and toughened creature. Hoy, he called down to Valentine. Where are you bound? Pidruid. And you? The same. Bringing these mounts to market. Thirsty work it is, too. Do you have wine? Some, Valentine said. He tapped the flask at his hip, where a fiercer man might wear a weapon. Good red mid-country wine. I'll be sorry to see the last of it. Give me a drink and I'll let you ride into town with me. Done, said Valentine. He got to his feet as the boy dismounted, and scrambled down the ridge toward him. Valentine offered him the flask. The boy was no more than fourteen or fifteen, he guessed, and small for his age, though deep through the chest and brawny. He came hardly elbow high to Valentine, who was tall but not unusually so, a sturdy man just above middle height, with wide, flat shoulders and big, capable hands. The boy swirled the wine in the flask, inhaled in a knowing way, nodded his approval, took a deep gulp, sighed. I've been eating dust all the way from Falcon Kip, and this sticky heat, it chokes you. Another dry hour and I'd have been a dead one. He returned the wine to Valentine. You live in town? Valentine frowned. No. Here for the festival, then? Festival? You don't know. Valentine shook his head. He felt the pressure of the boy's bright, mocking eyes, and was confused. I've been traveling. I haven't followed the news. Is this festival time in Pidruid? This week it is, said the boy, beginning on Star Day. The grand parade, the circus, the royal celebration. Look down there. Don't you see him entering the city even now? He pointed. Valentine sighted along the boy's outstretched arm and squinted, peering at Pidruid's southern corner, but all he saw was a jumble of green-tiled rooftops and a tangle of ancient streets following no rational plan. Again he shook his head. There, the boy said impatiently. 
down by the harbor, see? The ships, the five tremendous ones, with his banner flying from the rigging. And there's the procession, coming through Dragon Gate, just beginning to march Black Highway. I think that's his chariot, coming up now by the Arch of Dreams. Don't you see? Is there something wrong with your eyes? I don't know the city, said Valentine mildly. But yes, I see the harbor, the five ships. Good. Now follow along inland a little way. The big stone gate, and the wide highway running through it, and that ceremonial arch, just this side of, I see it now, yes. And his banner over the chariot. Whose banner? If I sound dim, forgive me, but whose? Whose? Lord Valentine's banner. Lord Valentine's chariot. Lord Valentine's bodyguard marching through the streets of Pidruid. Don't you know the coronal has arrived? I didn't. And the festival. Why do you think there's a festival at this time of summer, if not to welcome the coronal? Valentine smiled. I've been traveling and I haven't followed the news. Would you like more wine? There's not much left, the boy said. Go on. Finish it. I'll buy more in Pidruid. He handed over the flask and turned toward the city again, letting his gaze travel down the slope and across the woodsy suburbs to the dense and teeming city, and outward toward the waterfront, and to the great ships, the banners, the marching warriors, the chariot of the coronal. This must be a great moment in the history of Pidruid, for the coronal ruled from far off Castle Mount, all the way on the other side of the world, so distant that he and it were almost legendary. Distances being what they were on this world of Majipur. Coronals of Majipur did not come off into the western continent, but Valentine was oddly unmoved by the knowledge of the presence of his glittering namesake down below there. I am here, and the colonel is here, he thought, and he will sleep tonight in some splendid palace of the masters of Pidruid, and I will sleep in some pile of hay, and then there will be a grand festival. And what is that to me? He felt almost apologetic, being so placid in the face of the boy's excitement. It was a discourtesy. He said, Forgive me. I know so little of what's been happening in the world these past months. Why is the colonel here? He makes the grand processional, said the boy, to every part of the realm to mark his coming to power. This is the new one, you know. Lord Valentine, only two years on his throne. The brother to Lord Voriax who died. You knew that, that Lord Voriax was dead, that Lord Valentine was our coronal. I had heard, said Valentine vaguely. Well, that's he down there in Pidruid, touring the realm for the first time since he got the castle. He's been down south all month, in the jungle provinces. And yesterday he sailed up the coast to Pidruid, and tonight he enters the city, and in a few days there'll be the festival, and food and drink for everyone, games, dancing, delights, a great market, too, for I'll sell these animals for a fortune. Afterward he travels overland through the whole continent of Zimroel, from capital to capital, a journey of so many thousands of miles it makes my headache to think of it. And from the eastern shore... He'll sail back to Alhanroel and Castle Mount, and none of us in Zimruel will see him again for twenty years or more. A fine thing it must be to be coronal. The boy laughed. That was good wine. My name's Shanamir. What's yours? Valentine. Valentine? Valentine? An auspicious name. A common one, I'm afraid. Put Lord in front of it and you'd be the coronal. It's not as easy as that. Besides, why would I want to be coronal? The power, said Shanamir, wide-eyed. The fine clothes, the food, the wine, the jewels, the palaces, the women. The responsibility, Valentine said somberly. The burden. Do you think the coronal does nothing but drink golden wine and march in grand processions? Do you think he's put there just to enjoy himself? The boy considered. Perhaps not. 
He rules over billions upon billions of people, across territories so huge we can't comprehend them. Everything falls on his shoulders to carry out the decrees of the Pontifex, to sustain order, to support justice in every land. It tires me to think of it, boy. He keeps the world from collapsing into chaos. I don't envy him. Let him have the job. Shanamir said after a moment, You're not as stupid as I first thought, Valentine. Did you think I was stupid then? Well, simple, easy of mind. Here you are a grown man, and you seem to know so little of certain things. And I half your age, and I have to explain. But perhaps I misjudge you. Shall we go down into Pidruid? Two. Valentine had his pick of the mounts the boy was taking to market, but they all seemed alike to him, and after making a pretense of choosing, he picked one at random, vaulting lightly into the creature's natural saddle. It was good to ride, after so long on foot. The mount was comfortable, as well it might be, for they had been bred for comfort for thousands of years, these artificial animals, these witchcraft creatures out of the old days, strong and tireless and patient, able to convert any sort of trash into food. The skill of making them was long forgotten, but now they bred of themselves, like natural animals, and it would be a slow business getting about on Majipur without them. The road to Pidruid led along the high ridge for more than a mile, then began sudden sharp switchbacks down into the coastal plain. Valentine let the boy do most of the talking as they made the descent. Shanamir came, he said, from a district two and a half days' journey inland, to the northeast. There he and his brothers and his father raised mounts for sale at Pidruid Market, and turned a good living at it. He was thirteen years old, and had a high opinion of himself. He had never been outside the province of which Pidruid was the capital. But some day he meant to go abroad, to travel everywhere on Majipur, to make the pilgrimage to the Isle of Sleep and kneel before the Lady, to cross the inner sea to Alhanruel and achieve the ascent of Castle Mount, even to go down south, maybe, beyond the steaming tropics, into the burnt and barren domain of the King of Dreams. For what was the use of being alive and healthy on a world as full of wonders as Majipur, if you did not journey hither and thither about on it? And you, Valentine? he asked suddenly. Who are you? Where from? Whither bound? Valentine was caught by surprise, lulled by the boy's prattle and the steady gentle rhythm of the mount as it padded down the broad twisting road, and the burst of jabbing questions left him unprepared. He said only, I come from the eastern provinces. I have no plans beyond Pidruid. I'll stay here until I have reason to leave. Why have you come? Why not? Ah, said Shanamir. All right. I know purposeful evasion when I hear it. You're the younger son of a duke in Nimoy or Pilliplock, and you sent someone a mischievous dream and were caught at it, and your father gave you a pouch of money and told you to vanish to the far side of the continent, right? Precisely, Valentine said with a wink. And you're loaded with royals and crowns, and you're going to set yourself up like a prince in Pidruid, and drink and dance until your last coin is gone. And then you'll hire aboard a sea-going vessel, and ship out for Alhanruel. And you'll take me with you as your squire. Isn't that so? You have it exactly, my friend, except for the money. I neglected to provide for that part of your fantasy. But you have some money, said Shanamir. Not so playfully now. You aren't a beggar, are you? They're very hard on beggars in Pidruid. They don't allow any sort of vacancy down there. I have a few coins, Valentine said, enough to carry me through festival time and a bit beyond. And then I'll see. If you do go to sea, take me with you, Valentine. If I do, I will, he promised. They were halfway down the slope now. The city of Pidruid lay in a great basin along the coast, 
rimmed by low gray hills on the inland side and along much of the shore, save only where a break in the outer range allowed the ocean to spill through, forming a blue-green bay that was Pidwood's magnificent harbor. As he approached sea level here in late afternoon, Valentine felt the offshore breezes blowing toward him, cool, fragrant, breaking the heat. Already white shoals of fog were rolling toward the shore out of the west, and there was a salty tang to the air, thick as it was now with water that had embraced the fishes and sea dragons only hours before. Valentine was awed by the size of the city that lay before him. He could not remember ever having seen a larger one. But there was so much, after all, that he could not remember. This was the edge of the continent. All of Zimruel lay at his back, and for all he knew, he had walked it from end to end, from one of the eastern ports indeed, Nimoya or Pilloplock, except that he knew himself to be a young man, not very young, but young enough, and he doubted that it was possible to have made such a journey on foot in one lifetime, and he had no recollection of having been on any sort of mount until this afternoon. On the other hand, he seemed to know how to ride, he had lifted himself knowledgeably into the beast's broad saddle, and that argued that he must have ridden at least part of the way before. It did not matter. He was here now, and he felt no restlessness. Since Pidruid was where he had somehow arrived, Pidruid was where he would stay, until there was reason to go elsewhere. He lacked Shalomir's hunger for travel. The world was so big it did not bear thinking about. Three great continents— Two enormous seas, a place that one could comprehend fully only in dreams, and even then not bring much of the truth of it away into the waking world. They said this Lord Valentine the Coronel lived in a castle eight thousand years old, with five rooms for every year of its existence, and that the castle sat upon a mountain so tall it pierced the sky, a colossal peak thirty miles high, on whose slopes were fifty cities as big as Pidruid. Such a thing as that did not bear much thought either. The world was too big, too old, too populous for one man's mind. I will live in this city of Pidruid, Valentine thought, and I will find a way to pay for my food and lodging, and I will be happy. Naturally, you don't have a bed reserved in an inn, Shanamir said. Of course not. It stands to reason you wouldn't. And naturally everything in town is full, this being festival time, and the carnal already here. So where will you sleep, Valentine? Anywhere. Under a tree, on a mound of rags, in the public park. That looks like a park there, over to the right, that stretch of green with the tall trees. You remember what I told you about vagrants in Pidruid? They'll find you and lock you deep for a month, and when they let you out... They'll have you sweeping dung until you can buy your way out of your fine, which at the pay of a dung sweeper will take you the rest of your life. At least dung sweeping steady work, Valentine said. Shonamir didn't laugh. There's an inn the mount sellers stay at. I'm known there, or rather my father is. We'll get you in somehow. But what would you have done without me? Become a dung sweeper, I suppose. You sound as though you really wouldn't mind. The boy touched his mount's ear, halting it, and looked closely at him. Doesn't anything matter to you, Valentine? I don't understand you. Are you a fool, or simply the most carefree man on Majipur? I wish I knew, said Valentine. At the foot of the hill... The ridge road joined with a grand highway that came running down out of the north and curved westward toward Pidruid. The new road, wide and straight along the valley floor, was rimmed with low white markers stamped with the double crest of Pontifex and Coronal, the labyrinth and the starburst, and was paved in smooth blue-gray stuff of light resiliency, a springy, flawless roadbed that probably was of great antiquity, as were so many of the best things of this world. The mounts plodded tirelessly. Synthetic things that they were, they scarcely understood fatigue, and would clop from Pidruid to Pillarplock without resting and without complaining. From time to time, Shanamir glanced back, 
checking for strays, since the beasts were not tied. But they remained blandly in their places, one after another, blunt snout of one close behind coarse ropey tail of another, along the flank of the highway. Now the sun was faintly tinged with late-day bronze, and the city lay close before them. A stunning sight presented itself in this part of the road. On both shoulders of it had been planted noble trees, twenty times the height of a man, with slim tapering trunks of dark bluish bark and mighty crowns of glistening greenish-black leaves sharp as daggers. Out of those crowns burst astounding clusters of bloom, red-tipped with yellow, that blazed like beacons as far as Valentine could see. What are those trees? he asked. Fire shower palms, Shanamir said. Pidruid is famous for them. They grow only near the coast and flower just one week a year. In the winter they drop sour berries that make a strong liquor. You'll drink it tomorrow. The colonel has picked a good moment to come here then. Not by chance, I imagine. On and on the twin column of brilliant trees stretched, and they followed along until open fields yielded to the first country villas, and then suburban tracts thick with more modest homes, and then a dusty zone of small factories, and finally the ancient wall of Pidruid itself, half as high as a fire-shower tree, pierced by a pointed arch set with archaic-looking battlements. Falcon Kip Gate, Shanamir announced. The eastern entrance to Pidruid. Now we enter the capital. Eleven million souls here, Valentine, and all the races of Majipur to be found. Not just humans. No, everything here, all mixed together. Skandars and Hjorts and Lehmann and all the rest. Even so, they say, a little group of shapeshifters. Shapeshifters? The old race, the first natives. We call them something else, Valentine said vaguely. Metamorphs, is it? The same, yes. I've heard they're called that in the East. You have a strange accent, do you know that? No stranger than yours, friend. Shanamir laughed. To me, your accent's strange, and I have no accent at all. I speak normal speech. You shape your words with fancy sounds. We call them metamorphs he said, mimicking. That's how you sound to me. Is that Nimoyan talk? Valentine replied only with a shrug. Shanamir said, They frighten me, shapeshifters, metamorphs. This would be a happier planet without them. Sneaking around, imitating others, working mischief. I wish they would keep to their own territory. Mostly they do, is that not so? Mostly, but they say a few live in each city, plotting who knows what kind of trouble for the rest of us. Shanamir leaned across toward Valentine, caught his arm, peered solemnly into his face. One might meet one anywhere, sitting on a ridge looking out toward Pidruid on a hot afternoon, for example. So you think I've a metamorph in masquerade? The boy cackled. Prove that you aren't. Valentine groped for some way to demonstrate his authenticity. Found none, and made a terrifying face instead, stretching his cheeks as though they were rubber, twisting his lips in opposite directions, rolling his eyeballs high. My true visage, he said, you have discovered me. And they laughed and passed on through Falcon Kip Gate into the city of Pidruid. Within the gate everything seemed much older, the houses built in a curious angular style, humpbacked walls swelling outward and upward to tiled roofs, and the tiles themselves often chipped and broken, and interspersed with heavy clumps of low, fleshy-leaved roofweeds that had gained footholds in cracks and earthy pockets. A heavy layer of fog hovered over the city, and it was dark and cool beneath it, with lights glowing in almost every window. The main highway split, and split again, until now Shanamir was leading his animals down a much narrower street, though still a fairly straight one, with secondary streets coiling off from it in every direction. The streets were thick with folk, 
Such crowds made Valentine obscurely uncomfortable. He could not recall having had so many others so close about him at once, almost at his elbow, smack up against his mount, pushing, darting about, a jostling mob of porters, merchants, mariners, vendors, people from the hill country like Shanamir bringing animals or produce to the market, tourists in fine robes of glowing brocades, and little boys and girls underfoot everywhere. Festival time in Pidruid. Gaudy banners of scarlet cloth were strung across the street from the upper stories of buildings, two and three on every block, emblazoned with the starburst crest, hailing in bright green lettering Lord Valentine the Colonel, bidding him be welcome to this his westernmost metropolis. Is it far to your inn? Valentine asked. Halfway across town. Are you hungry? A little. More than a little. Shanamir signaled to his beasts, and they marched obediently into a cobbled cul-de-sac between two arcades, where he left them. Then, dismounting, he pointed out a tiny, grimy booth across the street. Skewered sausages hung grilling over a charcoal flame. The counterman was a leeman, squat and hammer-headed, with pocked gray-black skin and three eyes that glowed like coals in a crater. The boy pantomimed, and the Liman passed two skewers of sausages to them, and poured tumblers of pale amber beer. Valentine produced a coin and laid it on the counter. It was a fine, thick coin, bright and gleaming, with a milled edge, and the Liman looked at it as though Valentine had offered him a scorpion. Hastily, Shanamir scooped up the piece and put down one of his own, a squarish, coppery coin with a triangular hole punched in the center. The other he returned to Valentine. They retreated to the cul-de-sac with their dinner. What did I do wrong? Valentine asked. With that coin you could buy the Lehman and all his sausages, and a month of beer. Where did you get it? Why, from my purse. Are there more like that in there? It could be, said Valentine. He studied the coin, which bore on one face the image of an old man, gaunt and withered and on the other, the visage of a young and vigorous one. The denomination was fifty royals. Will this be too valuable to use anywhere, he asked. What will it buy, in truth? Five of my mounts, Shalomir said. A year's lodgings in princely style. Transportation to Alhanroel and back. Any of those. Perhaps even more. To most of us it would be many months' wages. You have no idea of the value of things? Valentine looked abashed. It would seem that way. These sausages cost ten weights. A hundred weights make a crown. Ten crowns make a royal. And this is fifty of those. Now do you follow? I'll change it for you at the market. Meanwhile, keep it to yourself. This is an honest city and a safe one, more or less. But with a purse full of those, you tempt fate. Why didn't you tell me you were carrying a fortune? Shalomir gestured broadly. Because you didn't know, I suppose. There's such a strange innocence about you, Valentine. You make me feel like a man, and I'm only a boy. You seem so much like a child. Do you know anything? Do you even know how old you are? Finish your beer and let's move along. Valentine nodded. One hundred weights to a crown, he thought. Ten crowns to a royal. And he wondered what he would have said had Shanamir pressed him on the matter of his age. Twenty-eight? Thirty-two? He had no idea. What if he were asked in earnest? Thirty-two, he decided. That had a good sound to it. Yes, I am thirty-two years old and ten crowns make a royal, and the shining piece that shows the old man and the young one is worth fifty of those. Three. The road to Shanamir's inn led squarely through the heart of Pidruid, across districts that even at this late hour were crowded and hectic. Valentine asked if that was on account of the visit of the colonel, but Shanamir said no. The city was like this all the time, for it was the major port of the western coast of Zimroel. From here went vessels to every major part of Majipur. 
up and down this busy coast, but also across the inner sea on the enormous journey to Alhanroel, a voyage requiring the better part of a year. And there was even some commerce with the sparsely populated southern continent, Suvrael, the sun-blasted lair of the King of Dreams. When Valentine thought of the totality of Majipur, he felt oppressed by the weight of the world, the sheer mass of it, and yet he knew that was foolish. For was not Majipur a light and airy place, a giant bubble of a planet, huge but without much substance, so that one felt forever buoyant, forever afloat? Why this leaden sense of pressure across his back? Why these moments of unfounded dismay? He led himself quickly back to an easier mood. Soon he would sleep, and the morning would be a day of new marvels. We cross the Golden Plaza, said Shanamir, and on the far side of it we take Water Road. That leads to the piers, and our inn is ten minutes out that way. You'll find the plaza amazing. Indeed it was. Such of it as Valentine was able to see. A vast rectangular space, wide enough to drill two armies in, bordered on all four sides by immense square-topped buildings, on whose broad, flat faces were inlaid dazzling designs in gold leaf, so that by the evening's torchlight the great towers blazed with reflected light and were more brilliant than the fire-shower trees. But there was no crossing the plaza tonight. A hundred paces from its eastern entrance it was roped off with thick braided cord of red plush, behind which stood troops in the uniform of the coronal's bodyguard, smug, impassive, arms folded across their green and gold jerkins. Shanamir leaped from his mount and trotted forward, and spoke quickly with the vendor. When he returned, he said angrily, They have it entirely blocked. May the king of dreams send them prickly sleep tonight. What's happening? The colonel has taken lodging in the mayor's palace. That's the tallest building, with the jagged golden swirls on its walls, on the far side over there. And nobody can get near it tonight. We can't even go around the plaza's inner rim, because there's such a mob piled up there, waiting for a glimpse of Lord Valentine. So it's a detour for us, an hour or more, the long way around. Well, sleep isn't that important, I suppose. Look! There he is! Shanamir indicated a balcony high on the facade of the mayor's palace. Figures had emerged on it. At this distance they were no larger than mice, but mice of dignity and grandeur, clad in sumptuous robes. Valentine could see at least that much. There were five of them, and the central personage was surely the coronal. Shanamir was straining and standing on tiptoe for a better view. Valentine could make out very little. A dark-haired man, possibly bearded, in a heavy white steepmoy fur robe over a doublet in green or light blue. The colonel stood at the front of the balcony, spreading his arms toward the crowd, who made the starburst symbol with their outstretched fingers and shouted his name again and again, Valentine! Valentine! Lord Valentine! And Shanamir, at Valentine's side, cried out to, Valentine! Lord Valentine! Valentine felt a fierce shudder of revulsion. Listen to them, he muttered, yelling as if he's the divine itself, come down for dinner in Pidruid. He's only a man, isn't he? When his bowels are full, he empties them, yes? Shanamir blinked in shock. He's the coronal. He means nothing to me, even as I mean less than nothing to him. He governs. He administers justice. He holds back chaos. You said those things yourself. Aren't such things worthy of your respect? Respect, yes, but not my worship. To worship the king is nothing new. My father has told me of olden times. They had kings as far back as old earth itself. And I'll bet they were worshipped, Valentine, in scenes far more wild than what you see here tonight. And some were drowned by their own slaves, and some were poisoned by their chief ministers, and some were smothered by their wives, and some were overthrown by the people they pretended to serve, and every last one was buried and forgotten. 
Valentine felt himself growing surprisingly warm with anger. He spat in disgust. And many lands on old earth got along without kings altogether. Why do we need them on Majipur? These expensive carnals, and the weird old pontifex hiding in his labyrinth, and the sender of bad dreams out of Suvrail? No, Shanamir, I may be too simple to understand it, but it makes no sense to me. This frenzy, these screams of delight. No one screams delight, I'll wager, when the mayor of Pidruid rides through the streets. We need kings, Shanamir insisted. This world is too big to be ruled by mayors alone. We need great and potent symbols, monarchs who are almost like gods, to hold things together. Look, look! The boy pointed toward the balcony. Up there, that little figure in the white robe, the colonel of Majipur. You feel nothing go shivering down your back when I say that? Nothing. You get no thrill? knowing that there are twenty billion people on this world, and only one is coronal, and that tonight you behold him with your own eyes, something which you will never do again? You feel no awe? None. You're a strange one, Valentine. I've never met anyone like you at all. How could anyone be untouched by the sight of the coronal? I am, said Valentine, shrugging, a little puzzled by it himself. Come, let's get out of here. This mob tires me. Let's find the inn. It was a long journey around the plaza, for all streets ran into it, but few ran parallel to it, and Valentine and Shanamir had to move in ever-widening circles while trying to proceed westward, with a train of mounts clopping placidly wherever Shanamir led. But at last they emerged from a district of hotels and fine shops, into one of warehouses and lofts, and approached the edge of the waterfront, and came finally to a weather-beaten inn of warped black timbers and frayed thatching, with stables to the rear. Shanamir housed his beasts and went through a courtyard to the innkeeper's quarters, leaving Valentine alone in the shadows. He waited a long while. It seemed to him that even here he could hear the blurred and muffled cries, Valentine! Valentine! Lord Valentine. But it meant nothing whatever to him that multitudes were crying his name, for it was the name of another. Shanamir returned in time, sprinting lightly and silently across the yard. It's arranged. Give me some money. The fifty. Smaller, much smaller. A half crown or so. Valentine groped for coins sorted through them by dim lamplight, handed several well-worn pieces to Shanamir. For the lodging, he asked. To bribe the doorkeeper, Shanamir replied. Places to sleep are hard to come by tonight. Crowding in one more means less room for everybody, and if someone counts heads and complains, it's the doorkeeper must back us up. Follow me and say nothing. They went in. The place smelled of salt air and mildew. Just within, a fat, grayish-faced short sat like an enormous toad at a desk, arranging playing cards and patterns. The rough-skinned creature barely looked up. Shanamir laid the coins before him, and the short signaled with an almost imperceptible flicker of its head. Onward, to a long, narrow, windowless room, lit by three widely spaced glow floats that yielded a hazy reddish light. A row of mattresses spanned the length of the room, one close by the next on the floor, and nearly all of them were occupied. Here, Shanamir said, nudging one with the tip of his boot. He stripped off his outer clothes and lay down, leaving room for Valentine. Dream well, the boy said. Dream well, said Valentine and kicked off his boots and shed his top garments, and dropped down beside him. Distant shouts echoed in his ears, or perhaps in his mind. It astonished him how weary he was. There might be dreams tonight, yes, and he would watch carefully for them, so that he could sift them for meaning. But first there would be deep sleep, the sleep of the utterly exhausted. 
And in the morning, a new day. Anything might befall. Anything. Four. There was a dream, of course, somewhere toward the depth of the night. Valentine placed himself at a distance from it and watched it unfold, as he had been taught from childhood. Dreams held great significance. They were messages from the powers that ruled the world, by which one was to guide one's life. They were ignored only at one's peril, for they were manifestations of the deepest truth. Valentine saw himself crossing a vast purple plain under a baleful purple sky and a swollen amber sun. He was alone and his face was drawn. His eyes were tense and strained. As he marched, ugly fissures opened in the ground, gaping cracks that were bright orange within. And things popped forth like children's toys popping from a box, laughing shrilly at him and swiftly retreating into the fissures as they closed. That was all. Not a full dream, then, for it had no story, no pattern of conflicts and resolution. It was only an image, a bizarre scene, a slice from some larger canvas not yet revealed to him. He could not even tell whether it was ascending from the lady, the blessed lady of the Isle of Sleep, or from the malevolent king of dreams. He lay half awake, pondering it a while and decided at last to give it no deeper consideration. He felt oddly adrift, cut free from his own inner self. It was as though he had not even existed the day before yesterday, and even the wisdom of dreams was concealed from him now. He slept again, a sleep unbroken except when a light patter of rain fell briefly but noisily, and he was unaware of further dreams. Early light woke him, warm golden-green light pouring in through the far end of the long, narrow hall. The door stood open. Shanamir was nowhere about. Valentine was alone, except for a couple of snorers deeper into the room. Valentine rose, stretched, flexed his arms and legs, dressed. He washed at a basin against the wall, and stepped out into the courtyard, feeling alert energetic, ready for whatever this day might bring. The morning air was thick with moisture, but warm and bright, and last night's fog had altogether burned off. Out of a clear sky came the throbbing heat of the summer sun. In the courtyard grew three great vines, one along each wall, with gnarled woody trunks broader than a man's waist, and shovel-shaped glossy leaves of a deep bronze hue, the new growth bright red. The vine was abloom with showy yellow blossoms like little trumpets, but also it bore ripened fruit, heavy blue-white berries glistening with beads of wetness. Valentine plucked one boldly and ate it. Sweet, tart as well, with the headiness of very young wine. He had another, then reached for a third and thought better of it. Circling the courtyard, he peered into the stables and saw Shanamir's mounts munching quietly on bits of straw. But no Shanamir. Off on business, perhaps. Onward now around a bend, and the odor of grilled fish came to him and made him tingle with sudden hunger. He pushed open a rickety door and found himself in a kitchen, where a small, weary-looking man was cooking breakfast for half a dozen lodgers of several races. The cook looked at Valentine without interest. Am I too late to eat, Valentine asked softly. Take a seat. Fish and beer thirty weights. He found a half-crown piece and laid it on the stove. The cook pushed a few coppers back at him and threw another fillet onto his griddle. Valentine took a seat against the wall. Several of the diners got up to depart, and one... A slender, lithe young woman with close-clipped black hair paused near him. The beer's in that pitcher, she said. You help yourself around here. Thank you, said Valentine. But she was already out the door. He poured a mug full. It was heavy, tangy stuff, thick against his tongue. 
In a minute he had his fish, crisply cooked and sweet. He ate it swiftly. Another, he said to the cook, who eyed him sourly but complied. As he ate, Valentine became aware that a lodger at the next table, a hort, thick-bodied and puffy-faced, with pebble-textured ashen skin and big bulging eyes, was peering intently at him. The strange surveillance made Valentine uncomfortable. After a time he glanced directly back at the hort, who blinked and looked quickly away. Some moments later the hort turned to Valentine again and said, Just got here, did you? Last night. Staying long? Through the festival, at least, Valentine said. Definitely there was something about the hort that he instinctively disliked. Perhaps it was merely his looks, for Valentine found shorts unattractive, coarse and bloated creatures. But that was unkind, he knew. Hjorts bore no responsibility for the way they looked, and they probably found humans equally disagreeable, pale, scrawny things with disgustingly smooth skins. Or possibly it was the intrusion on his privacy that bothered him, the staring, the questions. Or maybe just the way the hjort was decorated with fleshy daubs of orange pigment. Whatever it was, it made him feel queasy and bothered. But he felt mild guilt for such prejudices, and he had no wish to be unsociable. By way of atoning, he offered a lukewarm smile and said, My name's Valentine. I'm from Nimoya. Long way to come, said the hjort, chewing noisily. You live near here? A little way south of Pidruid. Name's Vinorcus. Dealer in hay goose hides. The short sliced fussily at his food. After a moment he returned his attention to Valentine, letting his great fishy eyes rest fixedly on him. You traveling with that boy? Not really. I met him on my way into Pidruid. The short nodded. Going back to Nimoy after the festival? The flow of questions was becoming an annoyance, but Valentine still hesitated to be impolite even in the face of this impoliteness. I'm not sure yet, he said. Thinking of staying here, then? Valentine shrugged. I really have no plans at all. Hmm, the Hjort said. Fine way to live. It was impossible to tell, from the Hjort's flat nasal inflection, whether that was meant as praise or sarcastic condemnation. But Valentine hardly cared. He had sufficiently met his social responsibilities, he decided, and fell silent. The Hjort likewise seemed to have no more to say. He finished his breakfast, pushed back his chair with a screech, and in his ungainly Hjortish way lurched toward the door, saying, off to the marketplace now. See you around. Eventually, Valentine wandered out into the courtyard, where now an odd game was in progress. Eight figures stood near the far wall, throwing daggers back and forth to one another. Six of them were skandars, big, rough, shaggy beings with forearms and coarse gray pelts, and the other two were human. Valentine recognized those two as having been breakfasting when he entered the kitchen. The sleek, slim, dark-haired woman and a lean, hard-eyed man with eerie white skin and long white hair. The daggers flew with astonishing speed, glittering as they flashed in the morning sun, and there was grim concentration on everyone's face. No one dropped a blade, no one ever seemed to catch one by the sharp side, and Valentine could not even count the number of daggers passing back and forth. Everyone appeared constantly to be throwing and catching, all hands full and more weapons traveling through the air. Jugglers, he thought, practicing their trade, getting ready to perform at the festival. The Skandars, forearmed and powerfully built, performed prodigies of coordination. But the man and the woman held their own in the patterns, juggling as deftly as the others. Valentine stood at a safe distance, watching in fascination as the daggers flew. Then one of the skandars grunted a hop, and the pattern changed. 
the six aliens began to direct their weapons only at one another, doubling and redoubling the intensity with which they passed, and the two humans moved a short way apart. The girl grinned at Valentine. Hoy, come join us. What? Play the game with us. Her eyes sparkled mischievously. A very dangerous game, I'd say. All the best games are dangerous. Here. Without warning, she flipped a dagger toward him. What's your name, fellow? Valentine, he said in a sort of gasp, and desperately nipped the dagger by its haft as it went shooting past his ear. Nicely caught, said the white-haired man. Try this. He tossed a blade, too. Valentine laughed and caught it, a little less awkwardly, and stood there with one in each hand. The aliens, wholly ignoring the byplay, continued methodically to send cascades of weapons flashing back and forth. Return the throw, the girl called. Valentine frowned. He tossed it too carefully absurdly fearful of skewering her, and the dagger described a limp arc and landed at her feet. You can do better, she said scornfully. Sorry, he said. He threw the other one with more vigor. She plucked it calmly and took another from the white-haired man and sent first one, then the other toward Valentine. There was no time to think. Snap and snap he caught them both. Sweat broke out on his forehead but he was getting into the rhythm of it. Here, he called. He gave one to her and took another from the white-haired one and sent a third through the air and found one coming at him and then another, and he wished that these were play daggers, blunt of blade, but he knew that they were not, and he stopped fretting about it. The thing to do was to make oneself into a kind of automaton, keeping the body centered and aware, looking always toward the incoming dagger and letting the outgoing one fly of its own accord. He moved steadily, catching, throwing, catching, throwing, always one blade coming toward him and one departing. Valentine realized that a true juggler would be using both hands at once, but he was no juggler, and it was all he could manage to coordinate catching and throwing. Yet he was doing well. He wondered how soon it would be before the inevitable blunder came and he was cut. The jugglers laughed as the tempo increased. He laughed with them, easily, and went on catching and throwing for a good two or three minutes before he felt his reflexes blurring from the strain. This was the moment to stop. He caught and deliberately dropped each of the blades in turn, until all three lay at his feet, and he bent over, chuckling, slapping his thighs, breathing hard. The two human jugglers applauded. The Skandars had not ceased their formidable whirling of blades, but now one cried another, Hup! and the sextet of aliens reeled in their daggers and moved off without a further word, disappearing in the direction of the sleeping quarters. The young woman danced over to Valentine. I'm Carabella, she said. She was no taller than Shanamir, and could not have been more than a few years out of girlhood. There was an irrepressible vitality bubbling within her small, muscular frame. She wore a light green doublet of close weave and a triple strand of polished quana shells at her throat, and her eyes were as dark as her hair. Her smile was warm and inviting. "'Where have you juggled before, fellow?' she asked. "'Never,' said Valentine. He dabbed at his sweaty forehead. "'A tricky sport. I don't know why I wasn't cut.' Never, cried the white-haired one. Never juggled before. That was a show of natural skill and nothing else. I suppose it has to be called that, Valentine said with a shrug. Can we believe that, the white-haired man asked. I think so, Carabella said. He was good sleet, but he had no form. Did you see how his hands moved after the daggers, out to here, across to here, a little nervous, a little eager? never waiting for the hafts to come to the proper place. And his throws, how hurried, how wild. No one who has been trained in the art could easily have pretended to such clumsiness. And why should he? This Valentine's eye is good sleet. But he tells the truth. He's never thrown. 
His eye is more than good, Sleep muttered. He has a quickness I envy greatly. He has a gift. Where are you from? Carabella asked. The East, said Valentine obliquely. I thought so. Your speech is somewhat odd. Do you come from Velethis? Kintor, maybe? From that direction, yes. Valentine's lack of specificity was not lost on Carabella, nor on Sleet. They exchanged quick glances. Valentine wondered if they could be father and daughter. Probably not. Sleet, Valentine saw, was not nearly as old as he had seemed at first. Of middle years, yes, but hardly old. The bleached look of his skin and of his hair exaggerated his age. He was a compact, taut man with thin lips and a short, pointed white beard. A scar, pale now, but once no doubt quite vivid, ran across one cheek from ear to chin. Carabella said, We are from the south. I from Tillamon, sleep from Narabal. Here to perform at the coronal's festival? Indeed. Newly hired by the troop of Zars and Kavl, the Skandar, to help them fulfill the coronal's recent decree concerning employment of humans. And you? What has brought you to Pidruit? The festival, said Valentine. To do business? Merely to see the games and parades. Sleet laughed knowingly. No need to be coy with us, friend. Hardly a disgrace to be selling mounts in the market. We saw you come in with the boy last night. No, Valentine said. I met the young herdsman only yesterday, as I was approaching the city. The animals are his. I merely accompanied him to the inn, because I was a stranger here. I have no trade of my own. One of the Skandars reappeared in a doorway. He was of giant size, half again as tall as Valentine, a formidable hulking creature, heavy-jawed and fierce, with narrow yellow eyes. His forearms hung well below his knees and terminated in hands like great baskets. Come inside, he called brusquely. Sleet saluted and trotted off. Carabella lingered a moment, grinning at Valentine. You are very peculiar, she said. You speak no lies, yet nothing you say sounds right. I think you yourself have little knowledge of your own soul. But I like you. You give off a glow. Do you know that, Valentine? A glow of innocence, of simplicity, of warmth, or of something else. I don't know. Almost shyly. She touched two fingers to the side of his arm. I do like you. Perhaps we'll juggle again. And she was gone, scampering off after sleet. Five. He was alone, and there was no sign of Shanamir. And although he found himself wishing mightily he could spend the day with the jugglers, with Carabella, there was no way he could do that. And the morning was still young. He was without plan, and that troubled him, but not excessively. There was all of Pidruid for him to explore. Out he went, down winding streets heavy with foliage. Lush vines and trees with thick weeping limbs sprouted everywhere, thriving in the moist, warm salt air. From far away came band music a gay, if somewhat strident, wheezing and pumping melody, maybe a rehearsal for the grand parade. A small river of foaming water rushed along the gutter, and the wildlings of Pidruid frolicked in it, mintons and mangy dogs and little prickly-nosed drolls. Busy, 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 a teeming city where everyone and everything, even the stray animals, had something important to do, and were doing it in a hurry all but Valentine, who strolled aimlessly, following no particular route. He paused now to peer into some dark shop festooned with bolts and swatches of fabric, now into some musty repository of spices, now into some choice and elegant garden of rich-hued blossoms sandwiched between two tall, narrow buildings. Occasionally people glanced at him 
as though marvelling that he could allow himself the luxury of sauntering. In one street he stopped to watch children playing a game, a sort of pantomime, one little boy with a strip of golden cloth tied as a circlet round his forehead, making menacing gestures in the centre of a ring, and the others dancing around him, pretending to be terrified, singing, The old king of dreams sits on his throne. He's never asleep. He's never alone. The old king of dreams comes in the night. If you've been bad, he'll give you a fright. The old king of dreams has a heart made of stone. He's never asleep. He's never alone. But when the children realized that Valentine was watching, they turned and made grotesque gestures at him, grimacing, crooking their arms, pointing. He laughed and moved on. By mid-morning, he was at the waterfront. Long elbow-angled piers thrust far out into the harbor, and every one seemed a place of mad activity. Long shoremen of four or five races were unloading cargo vessels that bore the arms of twenty ports on all three continents. They used floaters to bring the bales of goods down to dockside and convey them to the warehouses. But there was plenty of shouting and angry maneuvering as the immensely heavy bundles were jockeyed this way and that. As Valentine watched from the shadow of the wharf, he felt a rough thump between his shoulders and whirled to find a puffy-faced choleric Hjort pointing and waving arms. Over there, the Hjort said, we need six more to work the Suvarel ship. But I'm not. Quick, hurry. Very well. Valentine was not disposed to argue. He moved out onto the pier and joined a group of longshoremen who were bellowing and roaring as they guided a cargo of livestock downward. Valentine bellowed and roared with them until the animals, squealing long-faced yearling blaves, were on their way toward the stockyard or slaughterhouse. Then he quietly slipped away and moved down the quay until he came to an idle pier. He stood there peacefully for some minutes, staring out across the harbor toward the sea, the bronze-green-white-capped sea, squinting as though if he tried hard enough, he could see around the bend of the globe to Alhanroel and its castle mount. Rising heaven high. But of course there was no seeing Alhanroel from here. Across tens of thousands of miles of ocean. Across a sea so broad that certain entire planets might conveniently be fitted between the shores of one continent and the other. Valentine looked down, between his feet, and let his imagination plummet into Majipur's depths. Wondering what lay straight through the planet from here. The western half of Alhanroel, he suspected. Geography was vague and puzzling to him. He seemed to have forgotten so much of his schoolboy knowledge, and had to struggle to remember anything. Possibly right now, he was diametrically across the world from the lair of the Pontifex, the terrifying labyrinth of the old and reclusive High Monarch. Or perhaps, more likely, the Isle of Sleep lay downward from here, the blessed isle where the sweet lady dwelled, in leafy glades where her priests and priestesses endlessly chanted, sending benevolent messages to the sleepers of the world. Valentine found it hard to believe that such places existed, that there were such personages in the world, such powers, a pontifex, a lady of the isle, a king of dreams, even a coronal, though he had beheld the coronal with his own eyes only last night. Those potentates seemed unreal, what seemed real was the dockside at Pidruid, the inn where he had slept, the grilled fish, the jugglers, the boy Shanamir and his animals. All else was mere fantasy and mirage. The day was warm now, and growing quite humid, although a pleasant breeze blew toward shore. Valentine was hungry again. At a stand at the edge of the quay he bought for a couple of coppers a meal of strips of raw blue-fleshed fish marinated in a hot, spicy sauce and served on slivers of wood. He washed it back with a beaker of fire-shower wine, startling golden stuff that tasted hotter even than the sauce. Then he thought of returning to the inn. But he realized that he knew neither the name of the inn nor the name of its street, only that it lay a short distance inland from the waterfront district. Small loss if he never found it, for he had no possessions except those he carried on him. But the only people he knew in all of Pidruid were Shanamir and the jugglers, 
and he did not want to part from them so soon. Valentine started back and promptly lost himself in a maze of indistinguishable alleyways and streetlets that ran back and forth across Water Road. Three times he found inns that seemed the right one, but each, when he approached it closely, proved to be some other. An hour passed, or more, and it grew to be early afternoon. Valentine understood that it would be impossible for him to find the inn, and there was a pang of sadness at that for he thought of Carabella and the touch of her fingers to the side of his arm, and the quickness of her hands as she caught the knives, and the brightness of her dark eyes. But what is lost, he thought, is lost, and no use weeping over it. He would find himself a new inn and new friends before dark. And then he turned a corner and discovered what must surely be Pidruid Market. It was a vast enclosed space, nearly as huge as the Golden Plaza, but there were no towering palaces and hotels with golden facades here, only an endless sprawl of tile-roofed sheds and open stockyards and cramped booths. Here was every fragrance and stink in the world, and half the produce of the universe for sale. Valentine plunged in, delighted, fascinated. Sides of meat hung from great hooks in one shed. Barrels of spice spilling their contents occupied another. In one stockyard were giddy spinnerbirds, standing taller than scandars on their preposterous bright legs, pecking and kicking at one another while dealers in eggs and wool bargained over them. In another were tanks of shining serpents, coiling and twisting like streaks of angry flame. Nearby was a place where small sea dragons, gutted and pithed, lay stacked for sale in foul-smelling heaps. Here was a place of public scribes, doing letters for the unlettered, and here a money-changer deftly haggling for currencies of a dozen worlds, and here a row of sausage stands, fifty of them and identical, with identical-looking leemen side by side tending their smoky fires and twirling their laden skewers. And fortune-tellers, and sorcerers, and jugglers, though not the jugglers Valentine knew, and in a clear space squatted a storyteller, relating for coppers some involuted and all but incomprehensible adventure of Lord Stiermott, the famed coronel of eight thousand years ago, whose deeds now were the stuff of myth. Valentine listened for five minutes but could make no sense of the tale, which held fifteen or twenty off-duty porters in rapture. He went on, past a booth where a golden-eyed droon with a silver flute played slinky tunes to charm some three-headed creature in a wicker basket past a grinning boy of about ten, who challenged him to a game involving shells and beads, past an aisle of vendors who were selling banners that bore the coronal's starburst, past a fakir who hovered suspended over a vat of some nasty-looking hot oil, past an avenue of dream-speakers and a passageway thronged with drug-dealers, past the place of the interpreters and the place of the jewel-sellers, and at last... After turning a corner where all manner of cheap garments were for sale, he arrived at the stockyard where mounts were sold. The sturdy purple beasts were lined up flank to flank by the hundreds, maybe even the thousands, standing impassively and peering without interest at what appeared to be an auction taking place before their noses. Valentine found the auction as difficult to follow as the storyteller's tale of Lord Stiermott. Buyers and sellers faced each other in two long rows, and made hacking gestures across their wrists at one another, supplementing those movements with grimaces, the banging together of fists, and the sudden outward thrust of elbows. Nothing was said, and yet much evidently was communicated, because scribes stationed along the row constantly scribbled deeds of sale that were validated by thumb chops in green ink and frantic clerks affixed tags stamped with the labyrinth seal of the pontifex to the haunches of one beast after another. Moving along the line of the auction, Valentine at last came upon Shonamir, hacking and elbowing and banging fists with consummate ferocity. In minutes it was all over, and the boy came bounding out of the line with a whoop of joy. He caught Valentine by the arm and whirled him gleefully about. All sold! All sold! And at a premium price! He held out a wad of chits that a scribe had given him. 
Come with me to the treasury, and then it's nothing left but play for us. How late did you sleep? Late, I suppose. The inn was almost empty. I didn't have the heart to wake you. You were snoring like a blave. What have you been doing? Exploring the waterfront, mainly. I stumbled into the marketplace while trying to get back to the inn. It was by luck I came upon you. Ten minutes more and you'd have missed me forever, said Shanamir. Here, this place. He tugged at Valentine's wrist and pulled him into a long, brightly lit arcade where clerks behind wickers were changing chits into coins. Give me the fifty, Shanamir murmured. I can have it broken for you here. Valentine produced the thick, gleaming coin and stood aside while the boy joined a line. Minutes later, Shanamir returned. These are yours, he said, dumping into Valentine's outstretched purse a shower of money, some five royal pieces and a jingle of crowns. And these are mine, the boy said, grinning wickedly and holding up three big fifty royal pieces of the kind he had just changed for Valentine. He popped them into a money band under his jerkin. A profitable trip it was. At festival time, everyone's in a fever to spend his money fast. Come now, back to the inn, and let's celebrate with a flask of fire shower wine, eh? The treat's mine. The inn, it turned out, was no more than fifteen minutes from the market, on a street that suddenly looked familiar as they entered it. Valentine suspected that he had come within a block or two of it in his fruitless quest. No matter. He was here, and with Shanamir. The boy, relieved at being rid of his animals and excited over the price he had had for them, chattered on and on about what he would do in Pidruid before he returned to his countryside home. The dancing, the games, the drinking, the shows. As they sat in the tavern of the inn at work on Shanamir's wine, Sleet and Carabella appeared. May we join you, Sleet asked. Valentine said to Shanamir, These are jugglers, members of a Skandar troop here to play in the parade. I met them this morning. He made introductions. They took seats and Shanamir offered them drinks. Have you been to market, said Sleet. Been and done, Shanamir said. A good price. And now, Carabella asked. The festival for a few days, said the boy. And home to Falkenkip, I suppose. He looked a little crestfallen at the thought. And you, Carabella said, glancing at Valentine, do you have plans? To see the festival. And then? Whatever seems right. They were finished with the wine. Sleet gestured sharply, and a second flask appeared. It was poured around generously. Valentine felt his tongue tingling with the heat of the liquor and his head becoming a little light. Carabella said, Would you think to be a juggler and join our troop then? It startled Valentine. I have no skill. You have skill aplenty, said Sleet. What you lack is training. That we could supply. Carabella and I. You would learn the trade quickly. I take an oath on it. And I would travel with you and live the life of a wandering player? And go from town to town, is that it? Exactly. Valentine looked across at Shanamir. The boy's eyes were shining at the prospect. Valentine could almost feel the pressure of his excitement, his envy. But what is all this about, Valentine demanded. Why invite a stranger, a novice, an ignoramus like me, to become one of your number? Carabella signaled to Sleet who quickly left the table. She said, Zalzan Kavl will explain. It is a necessity, not a caprice. We are short-handed, Valentine, and we have need of you. She added, Besides, have you anything other to do? You seem adrift in this city. We offer you companionship as well as a livelihood. A moment and Sleet returned with the giant Skandar. Zalzan Kavl was an awesome figure, massive, towering. He lowered himself with difficulty into a seat at their table. It creaked alarmingly beneath his bulk. Skandars came from some windswept icy world far away. 
and though they had been settled on Majipur for thousands of years, working in rough trades needing great strength or unusual quickness of eye, they had a way of eternally looking angry and uncomfortable in Majipur's warm climate. Perhaps it was only a matter of their natural facial features, Valentine thought, but he found Zalzan Kaval and others of his kind an off-puttingly bleak tribe. The Skandar poured himself a stiff drink with his two inner arms and spread the outer pair wide across the table as though he were taking possession of it. In a harsh, rumbling voice he said, I watched you do the knives with sleet and carabella this morning. You can serve the purpose. Which is? I need a third human juggler, and in a hurry. You know what the new colonel has lately decreed concerning public entertainers. Valentine smiled and shrugged. Zalzan Kavol said, It is foolishness and stupidity, but the colonel is young and I suppose must let fly some wild shafts. It has been decreed that in all troops of performers made up of more than three individuals, one third of the troop must be Majipuri citizens of human birth, this to be effective as of this month. A decree like that, said Carabella, can accomplish nothing but to set race against race, on a world where many races have lived in peace for thousands of years. Zalzan Kavl scowled. Nevertheless, the decree exists. Some jackal in the castle must have told this Lord Valentine that the other races are growing too numerous, that the humans of Majipur are going hungry when we work. Foolishness and dangerous. Ordinarily, no one would pay attention to such a decree. But this is the festival of the coronal, and if we are to be licensed to perform, we must obey the rules, however idiotic. My brothers and I have earned our keep as jugglers for years, and done no harm to any human by it. But now we must comply, so I have found Sleet and Carabell in Pidruid, and we are working them into our routines. Today is two-day. Four days hence we perform in the colonel's parade, and I must have a third human. Will you apprentice yourself to us, Valentine? How could I learn juggling in four days? You will be merely an apprentice, said the Skandar. We will find something of a juggling nature for you to do in the grand parade that will disgrace neither yourself nor us. The law does not, as I see it, require all members of the troop to have equal responsibilities or skills. But three of us must be human. And after the festival? Come with us from town to town. You know nothing about me, and you invite me to share your lives. I know nothing about you, and I want to know nothing about you. I need a juggler of your race. I'll pay your room and board wherever we go, and ten crowns a week besides. Yes? Carabella's eyes had an odd glint, as though she were telling him, You can ask twice that wage and get it, Valentine. But the money was unimportant. He would have enough to eat and a place to sleep, and he would be with Carabella and Sleet, who were two of the three human beings he knew in this city, and he realized with some confusion, in all the world. For there was a vacancy in him where a past should be. He had hazy notions of parents and cousins and sisters, and a childhood somewhere in eastern Zimruel, and schooling and travels. But none of it seemed real to him. Nothing had density and texture and substance. And there was a vacancy in him where a future should be, too. These jugglers promised to fill it. But yet... One condition, Valentine said. Zalzan Kavl looked displeased. Which is? Valentine nodded toward Shanamir. I think this boy is tired of raising mounts in Falcon Kip, and may want to travel more widely. I ask that you offer him a place in your troop as well. Valentine, the boy cried. As groom or valet, or even a juggler if he has the art, Valentine went on, and that if he is willing to go with us, you accept him along with me. Will you do that? Zalzan Kavl was silent a moment, as if in calculation. 
and there was a barely audible growling sound from somewhere deep within his shaggy form. At length he said, Have you any interest in joining us, boy? Have I? Have I? I feared as much, said the Skandar morosely. Then it is done. We hire the both of you with thirteen crowns the week with room and board. Done? Done, said Valentine. Done, cried Shanamir. Zulz and Kavl knocked back the last of the fire shower wine. Sleet, Carabella, take this stranger to the courtyard and begin making a juggler out of him. You come with me, boy. I want you to have a look at our mounts. Six. They went outside. Carabella darted off to the sleeping quarters to fetch equipment. Watching her run, Valentine took pleasure in her graceful movements, imagining the play of supple muscles beneath her garments. Sleep plucked blue-white berries from one of the courtyard vines and popped them into his mouth. What are they, Valentine asked. Sleep tossed him one. Focus. In Narabal, where I was born, a thoka vine will sprout in the morning and be as high as a house by afternoon. Of course, the soil bursts with life in Narabal, and the rain falls every dawn. Another? Please. With a deft, quick wrist flip, Sleet chucked a berry over. It was the smallest of gestures, but effective. Sleet was an economical man, bird light without an ounce of excess flesh, his gestures precise, his voice dry and controlled. Chew the seeds, he advised Valentine. They promote virility. He managed a thin laugh. Carabella returned, bearing a great many colored rubber balls that she juggled briskly as she crossed the yard. When she reached Valentine in sleet, she flipped one of the balls to Valentine, and three to Sleet, without breaking stride. Three she retained. Not knives, Valentine asked. Knives are showy things. Today we deal in fundamentals, Sleet said. We deal in the philosophy of the art. Knives would be a distraction. Philosophy? Do you think juggling's a mere trick, the little man asked, sounding wounded. An amusement for the gapers? A means of picking up a crown or two at a provincial carnival? It is all those things, yes. But first it is a way of life, friend. A creed. A species of worship. And a kind of poetry, said Carabella. Sleek nodded. Yes, that too. And the mathematics? It teaches calmness, control, balance. A sense of the placement of things and the underlying structure of motion. There is silent music to it. Above all, there is discipline. Do I sound pretentious? He means to sound pretentious, Carabella said. There was mischief in her eyes. But everything he says is true. Are you ready to begin? Valentine nodded. Sleet said, Make yourself calm. Cleanse your mind of all needless thought and calculation. Travel to the center of your being and hold yourself there. Valentine planted his feet flat on the ground, took three deep breaths, relaxed his shoulders so that he could not feel his dangling arms, and waited. I think, said Carabella, that this man lives most of the time at the center of his being or else that he is without a center, and so can never be far from it. Are you ready, Sleet asked? Ready. We will teach you basics, one small thing at a time. Juggling is a series of small, discreet motions done in quick sequence that give the appearance of constant flow and simultaneity. Simultaneity is an illusion, friend, when you are juggling, and even when you are not. All events happen one at a time. Sleet smiled coldly. He seemed to be speaking from ten thousand miles away. 
Close your eyes, Valentine. Orientation in space and time is essential. Think of where you are and where you stand in relation to the world. Valentine pictured Majipur, mighty ball hanging in space, half of it or more than half engulfed by the great sea. He saw himself standing rooted at Zimmerwell's edge with the sea behind him and a continent unrolling before him, and the inner sea punctuated by the Isle of Sleep, and Alhanroel beyond, rising on its nether side to the great swollen bulge of Castle Mount, and the sun overhead, yellow with a bronze-green tint, sending blistering rays down on dusty Suvrail and into the tropics, and warming everything else and the moon somewhere on the far side of things, and the stars farther out, and the other worlds, the worlds from which the Skandars came, and the Hjorts, and the Lehmen, and all the rest, even the world from which his own folk had emigrated, old earth, fourteen thousand years ago, a small blue world absurdly tiny when compared to Majipur, far away, half forgotten in some other corner of the universe and he journeyed back down across the stars to this world, this continent, this city, this inn, this courtyard, this small plot of moist, yielding soil in which his boots were rooted, and told Sleet he was ready. Sleet and Carabella stood with arms hanging straight, elbows at their sides, and brought their forearms up to a level position, cupped hands outstretched, one ball in the right hand. Valentine imitated them. Sleet said, Pretend that a tray of precious gems rests on your hands. If you move your shoulders or elbows, or raise or lower your hands, the gems will spill. Eh? The secret of juggling is to move your body as little as possible. Things move. You control them. You remain still. The ball that Sleet held traveled suddenly from his right hand to the left, though there had not been a flicker of motion in his body. Carabella's ball did the same. Valentine, imitating, threw the ball from hand to hand, conscious of effort and movement. Carabella said, You use too much wrist and much too much elbow. Let the cup of your hand open suddenly. Let the fingers stretch apart. You are releasing a trapped bird. So, the hand opens, the bird flies upward. No wrist at all, Valentine asked. Little, and conceal what you use. The thrust comes from the palm of your hand. So. Valentine tried it. The shortest of upward movements of the forearm, the quickest of snaps with the wrist. Propulsion from the center of his hand and from the center of his being. The ball flew to his cupped left hand. Yes, said Sleet, again. Again, again, again. For fifteen minutes the three of them popped balls from one hand to the other. They made him send the ball in a neat, unvarying arc in front of his face, holding it in a plane with his hands and they would not permit him to reach upward or outward for a catch. Hands waited. Ball traveled. After a time he was doing it automatically. Shonamir emerged from the stables and stared, bemused, at the single-minded tossing. Then he wandered away. Valentine did not halt. This hardly seen juggling, this rigid one-ball toss, but it was the event of the moment, and he gave himself up to it entirely. He realized eventually that Sleet and Carabella had stopped throwing, that he alone was proceeding, like a machine. Here, said Sleet, and flipped him a thockerberry fresh from the vine. Valentine caught it between ball tosses, and held it as if thinking he might be asked to juggle with it. But no, Sleet pantomimed that he was to eat it, his reward, his incentive. Carabella now put a second ball in his left hand, and a third next to the original one in his right. Your hands are big, she said. This will be easy for you. Watch me, then do as I do. 
she popped the ball back and forth between her hands, catching it by making a four-pointed basket out of three fingers and the ball she held in the center of each hand. Valentine imitated her. Catching the ball was harder with a full hand than with an empty one, but not greatly so, and soon he was flawless. Now, said Sleet, comes the beginning of art. We make an exchange. So. One ball traveled in a face-high arc from Sleet's right hand to his left. As it journeyed, he made room for it in his left by popping the ball he held there upward and across, under the incoming ball, into his right. The maneuver seemed simple enough, a quick reciprocal toss. But when Valentine tried it, the balls collided and went bounding away. Carabella, smiling, retrieved them. He tried again with the same result, and she showed him how to throw the first ball so it would come down on the far side of his left hand, while the other traveled inside its trajectory when he launched it rightward. He needed several tries to master it, and even after he did he sometimes failed to make the catch, his eyes going in too many directions at once. Meanwhile, Sleet, machine-like, completed exchange after exchange. Carabella drilled Valentine in the double throw for what seemed like hours, and perhaps was. He grew bored at first, once he was perfect at it, and then he passed through boredom into a state of utter harmony, knowing that he could throw the balls like this for a month without wearying or dropping one. And suddenly he perceived that Sleet was juggling all three at once. Go on, Carabella urged. It only looks impossible. He made the shift with an ease that surprised him, and evidently surprised Sleet and Carabella, too, because she clapped her hands and he, without breaking rhythm, released a grunt of approval. Intuitively, Valentine threw the third ball as the second was moving from his left hand to the right. He made the catch and returned the toss. And then he was going. A throw, a throw, a throw and a catch, a throw and a catch, a catch, a throw. Always a ball on a rising arc and one descending into the waiting hand, and one waiting to be thrown. And he kept it up for three, four, five interchanges before he realized the difficulty of what he was doing, and broke his timing, sending all three balls spraying across the courtyard as they collided. You have a gift, Sleep murmured, a definite gift. Valentine was embarrassed by the collision. But the fact that he had dropped the balls did not appear to matter nearly as much as that he had been able to juggle them at all on the first try. He rounded them up and began again, Sleet facing him and continuing the sequence of tosses that he had never interrupted. Mimicking Sleet's stance and timing, Valentine began to throw, dropped two balls on the first try, reddened and muttered apologies, started again, and this time did not stop. Five, six, seven interchanges. Ten. And then he lost count, for they no longer seemed like interchanges, but all part of one seamless process, infinite and never-ending. Somehow his consciousness was split, one part making precise and accurate catches and tosses, the other monitoring the floating and descending balls, making rapid calculation of speed, angle, and rate of descent. The scanning part of his mind relayed data instantly and constantly to the part of his mind that governed the throwing and catching. Time seemed divided into an infinity of brief strokes, and yet paradoxically he had no sense of sequence. The three balls seemed fixed in their places, one perpetually in midair, one in each of his hands, and the fact that at each moment a different ball held one of those positions was inconsequential. Each was all. Time was timeless. He did not move. He did not throw. He did not catch. He only observed the flow. And the flow was frozen outside time and space. Now Valentine saw the mystery of the art. He had entered into infinity. By splitting his consciousness, he had unified it. He had traveled to the inner nature of movement and had learned that movement was illusion and sequence an error of perception. His hands functioned in the present, his eyes scanned the future, 
and nevertheless there was only this moment of now. And as his soul journeyed toward the heights of exultation, Valentine perceived, with the barest flicker of his otherwise transcendent consciousness, that he was no longer standing rooted to the place, but somehow had begun to move forward, drawn magically by the orbiting balls which were drifting subtly away from him. They were receding across the courtyard with each series of throws, and he experienced them now as a series once again, rather than as an infinite seamless continuum. And he was having to move faster and faster to keep pace with them, until he was virtually running, staggering, lurching around the yard, Sleet and Carabella scrambling to avoid him, and finally the balls were out of his reach altogether, beyond even his last desperate lunge. They bounced off in three directions. Valentine dropped to his knees, gasping. He heard the laughter of his instructors and began to laugh with them. What happened, he asked finally. I was going so well, and then, and then... Small errors accumulate, Carabella told him. You get carried away by the wonder of it all, and you throw a ball slightly out of the true plane and you reach forward to catch it, and the reaching causes you to make the next throw out of plane as well, and the next and so on until everything drifts away from you, and you give chase, and in the end pursuit is impossible. It happens to everyone at the beginning. Think nothing of it. Pick up the balls, said Sleet. In four days you juggle before the coronal. 7. He drilled for hours, going no further than the three-ball cascade, but repeating it until he had penetrated the infinite a dozen times, moving from boredom to ecstasy to boredom so often that boredom itself became ecstasy. His clothing was soaked with sweat, clinging to him like warm, wet towels. Even when one of Pidrid's brief light rain showers began, he continued to throw the balls. The rain ended and gave way to a weird twilight glow, the early evening sun masked by light fog. Still, Valentine juggled. A crazy intensity overcame him. He was dimly aware of figures moving about the courtyard. Sleet, Carabella, the various Skandars, Shanamir, strangers, coming and going. But he paid no attention. He had been an empty vessel into which this art, this mystery, had been poured. And he dared not stop, for fear he would lose it and be drained and hollow once again. Then someone came close and he was suddenly empty-handed, and he understood that Sleet had intercepted the balls, one by one, as they arced past his nose. For a moment Valentine's hands went on moving anyway in persistent rhythms. His eyes would not focus on anything but the plane through which he had been throwing the balls. Drink this, Carabella said gently, and put a glass to his lips. Fire shower wine. He drank it like water. She gave him another. You have a miraculous gift, she told him. Not only coordination, but concentration. You frightened us a little, Valentine, when you would not stop. By star day you will be the best of us, said Sleet. The colonel himself will single you out for applause. Eh, hey, Zalzankavl, what do you say? I say he is soaking wet and needs clean clothes, the Skandar rumbled. He handed Sleet some coins. Go to the bazaar, buy something that fits him before the booths close. Carabella, take him out back to the cleanser. We eat in half an hour. Come with me, Carabella said. She led Valentine, who still was dazed, through the courtyard to the sleeping quarters and behind them. A crude open-air cleanser had been rigged against the side of the building. The animal, she said angrily. He could have given you a word of praise, but praise isn't his way, I suppose. He was impressed, all right. Zalzan Kavl? Impressed? Yes, astonished. But how could he praise a human? You have only two arms. Well, praise isn't his way. Here, get out of those. Quickly she stripped, and he did the same, dropping his soggy garments to the ground. 
By bright moonlight he saw her nakedness and was delighted. Her body was slim and lithe, almost boyish, but for the small round breasts and the sudden flaring of the hips below her narrow waist. Her muscles lay close beneath the skin and were well developed. A flower had been tattooed in green and red on the crest of one flat buttock. She led him under the cleanser, and they stood close together as the vibrations rid them of sweat and grime. Then, still naked, they returned to the sleeping quarters, where Carabella produced a fresh pair of trousers and soft gray fabric for herself, and a clean jerkin. By then Sleet had come back from the bazaar with new clothes for Valentine, a dark green doublet with scarlet trim, tight red trousers, and a light cloak of blue that verged on black. It was a costume far more elegant than the one he had shed. Wearing it, he felt like one raised to some high rank, and moved with conscious hauteur as he accompanied Sleet and Carabella to the kitchen. Dinner was stew. An anonymous meat at its base, and Valentine did not dare ask, washed down with copious drafts of fire-shower wine. The six Skandars sat at one end of the table, the four humans at the other, and there was little conversation. At meal's end, Zalzan Kavl and his brothers rose without a word and strode out. Have we offended them, Valentine asked? It is their normal politeness, said Carabella. The short who had spoken to him at breakfast, Vinorkis, now crossed the room and hovered by Valentine's shoulder, staring down in that fishy-eyed way of his. Evidently it was a habit. Valentine smiled awkwardly. Vinorkis said, Saw you juggling in the yard this afternoon. You are pretty good. Thank you. Hobby of yours? Actually, I've never done it before. But the Skandars seem to have hired me for their troop. The Hjort looked impressed. Really? And will you go on tour with them? So it appears. Whereabouts? I have no idea, said Valentine. Perhaps it hasn't even been decided yet. Wherever they want to go will be good enough for me. Ah, the free floating life, Vinorkis said. I've meant to try it myself. Perhaps your Skandars would hire me, too. Can you juggle? I can keep accounts. I juggle figures. Vinorkis laughed vehemently and gave Valentine a hearty slap on the back. I juggle figures. Do you like that? Well, good night to you. Who was that, Carabella asked, when the short was gone? I met him at breakfast this morning. A local merchant, I think. She made a face. I don't think I like him. But it's so easy not to like Hjort's. Ugly things. She rose gracefully and stretched. Shall we go? He slept soundly again that night. To dream of juggling might have been expected after the afternoon's events. But instead he found himself once more on the purple plain. A disturbing sign. For the Majipuri know from childhood that dreams of recurring aspect have extra significance, probably dark. The lady rarely sends recurring dreams, but the king is given to the practice. Again the dream was a fragment. Mocking faces hovered in the sky, whirlpools of purple sand churning alongside the path, as if creatures with busy claws and clacking palps were moving beneath. Spikes sprouted from the ground. The trees had eyes. Everything held menace, ugliness, foreboding. But the dream was without characters and without events. It communicated only sinister foreboding. The world of dreams yielded to the world of daybreak. This time he was the first to waken, when the earliest strands of light entered the hall. Next to him Shalomir slumbered blissfully. Sleet lay coiled like a serpent far down the hall. And near him was Carabella, relaxed, smiling in her dreams. The Skandars evidently slept elsewhere. The only aliens in the room were a couple of lumpish shorts and a trio of runes tangled in a weave of limbs that defied comprehension. From Carabella's trunk, Valentine took three of the juggling balls, 
and went outside into the misty dawn to sharpen his burgeoning skills. Sleet, emerging an hour later, found him at it and clapped his hands. You have the passion, friend. You juggle like one possessed. But don't tire yourself so soon. We have more complicated things to teach you today. The morning's lesson had to do with variations on the basic position. Now that Valentine had mastered the trick of throwing three balls so that one was always in the air, and he had mastered it, no question of that, attaining in one afternoon a control of technique that Carabella said had taken her many days of practice. They had him moving about, walking, trotting, turning corners, even skipping, all the while keeping the cascade going. He juggled the three balls up a flight of stairs and down again. He juggled in a squatting position. He juggled standing on one leg like the solemn Gehorna birds of the Zimmer Marsh. He juggled while kneeling. By now he was absolutely secure in the harmony of eye and hand, and what the rest of his body might be doing had no effect on that. In the afternoon, sleep moved him to new intricacies, throwing the ball from behind his back in mid-volley, throwing it up under one leg, juggling with crossed wrists. Carabella taught him how to bounce a ball against a wall and work the return smoothly into the flow, and how to send a ball from one hand to the other by letting it hit the back of his hand, instead of catching and throwing. These things he grasped swiftly. Carabella and Sleet had stopped complimenting him on the quickness of his mastery. It was patronizing to shower him constantly with praise but he did not fail to observe the little glances of astonishment that often passed between them, and that pleased him. The Skandars juggled in another part of the courtyard, rehearsing the act they would do in the parade, a miraculous thing involving knives and sickles and blazing torches. Occasionally Valentine glanced over, marveling at what the four-armed ones were achieving, but mainly he concentrated on his own training. So went Sea Day. On Four Day they began teaching him how to juggle with clubs instead of balls. This was a challenge, for although the principles were mainly the same, clubs were bigger and clumsier, and it was necessary for Valentine to throw them higher in order to have time to make the catches. He began with one club, tossing it from hand to hand. This is how you hold it, said Carabella. This is how you throw. This is how you catch. And he did as she said, bending a thumb now and then, but soon learning the skills. Now, she said, put two balls in your left hand and a club in your right. And he threw, confused for a moment by the differences in mass and spin. But not for long. And after that it was two clubs in his right hand and a ball in his left. And late four-day afternoon he worked with three clubs, wrists aching and eyes tight with strain, working all the same, unwilling and almost unable to stop. That evening he asked, When will I learn how to throw the clubs with another juggler? Carabella smiled. Later, after the parade, as we travel eastward through the villages. I could do it now, he said. Not in time for the parade. You've performed wonders, but there are limits to what you can master in three days. If we had to juggle with a novice, we'd be forced to come down to your level, and the colonel won't take much joy in that. He admitted the justice of what she said. Still, he longed for the time when he would take part in the interplay of the jugglers, and pass clubs or knives or torches with them as a member of a single, many-souled entity in perfect coordination. There was rain four day night, Unusually heavy rain for subtropical pidruid in summer, when quick showers were the rule, and five-day morning the courtyard was spongy wet and tricky of footing. But the sky was clear and the sun was bright and hot. Shanamir, who had been roaming the town during the days of Valentine's training, reported that preparations for the great parade were well advanced. Ribbons and streamers and flags everywhere, he said standing at a wary distance as Valentine began a morning warm-up with the three clubs. And the starburst banner! They've lined the route with it! 
from Falcon Kip Gate to Dragon Gate, and out Dragon and all along the waterfront is what I hear. Miles and miles of decoration, even cloth of gold and green paint in the roadway. They say the cost runs to thousands of royals. Who pays? Valentine asked. Why the people of Pidruid said Shanamir in surprise. Who else? Those of Nimoya, those of Velithis. Let the Carnal himself pay for his festival, I'd say. And whose money would that be, except the taxes of the whole world? Why should cities in Alhanroel pay for festivals in Zimroel? Besides, it's an honor to host the Carnal. Pidruid pays gladly. Tell me, how do you manage to throw a club and catch one at the same time with the same hand, Valentine? The throw comes first, my friend, by only a little. Watch very carefully. I am watching. I still can't figure it out. When we have time, after the parade's done with, I'll show you how it works. Where are we going after here? I don't know. Eastward, Carabella told me. We'll go wherever there's a fair or a carnival or a festival that will hire jugglers. Will I become a juggler too, Valentine? If you want to. I thought you wanted to go to sea. I just want to travel, said Shanamir. It doesn't have to be by sea, so long as I don't have to go back to Falcon Kip. Eighteen hours a day in the stables, currying mounts. Oh, no, not for me, not any more. Do you know the night I left home I dreamed I had learned how to fly? It was a dream from the lady, Valentine. I knew it at once, and the flying meant I would go where I hoped to go. When you told Zarzan Kabul he had to take me along if he wanted you, I trembled. I thought I was going to... going to... I felt all... He caught himself. Valentine, I want to be a juggler as good as you are. I'm not very good. I'm only a beginner. But, growing bold, Valentine threw the clubs in lower, faster arcs, showing off. I can't believe you just learned how on two day. Sleet and Carabella are good instructors. I never saw anyone learn anything so fast, though, Shanamir said. You must have an extraordinary mind. I'll bet you were someone important before you became a wanderer, yes. You seem so cheerful, so simple, and yet... And yet, hidden depths, Valentine said amiably, trying to throw a club from behind his back and hurling it with an agonizing crack against his left elbow. All three clubs splattered to the wet ground, and he winced and rubbed the bruise. A master juggler, he said. You see, ordinarily it takes weeks of training to learn to hit your elbow like that. You did it to change the subject, Shanamir said sounding more than half serious. Eight. Star Day morning. Parade day. The Colonel's Day. The first day of the grand festival of Pidruid. And Valentine lay curled in sleep, dreaming a quiet dream of lush green hills and limpid pools flecked with blue and yellow pond anemones, when fingers poking in his ribs awakened him. He sat up, blinking and mumbling. Darkness, long before dawn. Carabella crouching over him. He sensed the cat-like grace of her, heard her light laughter, picked up the creamy fragrance of her skin. Why so early, he asked. To get a good place when the colonel goes by. Hurry, everyone's up already. He scrambled to his feet. His wrists were a little sore from juggling with the clubs, and he held out his arms, letting his hands loll and flop. Carabella grinned and took them in hers and looked up at him. You'll juggle magnificently today, she said softly. I hope so. There's no doubt of it, Valentine. Whatever you set out to do, you'll do supremely well. That's the sort of person you are. You know what sort of person I am? Of course I do. Better than you know, I suspect. Valentine, can you tell the difference between sleeping and waking? He frowned. I don't follow you. There are times when I think it's all the same to you. 
that you're living a dream or dreaming a life. Actually, I didn't think that. Sleep did. You fascinate him. And sleep doesn't fascinate easily. He's been everywhere. He's seen much. He's seen through everything, and yet he talks constantly of you. He tries to comprehend you, to see into your mind. I didn't realize I was so interesting. I find myself boring. Others don't. Her eyes were sparkling. Come now, dress, eat, off to the parade. In the morning we watch the coronal go by. In the afternoon we perform. And at night? At night? Yes, at night. At night we hold festival, she cried, and sprang away from him and out the door. In morning mist, the troop of jugglers headed for the place that Zars and Kabul had secured for them along the grand processional highway. The coronal's route began in the Golden Plaza, where he was lodged. From there he would move eastward along a curving boulevard that led out one of the city's secondary gates, and around to the great road on which Valentine and Shanamir had entered Pidruid, the one bordered by twin columns of fire-shower palms in bloom, and thence via Falkenkip Gate back into the city, and across it down Water Road through the Arch of Dreams and out Dragon Gate to the waterfront, to the edge of the bay, where a reviewing stand had been erected in Pidruid's chief stadium. So the parade was double in nature. First a progress of the coronal past the people, and then the people past the coronal. It was an event that would last all through the day and into the night beyond, and probably toward Sunday's dawn. Because the jugglers were part of the royal entertainment, it was necessary for them to take up a position somewhere near the waterfront end of things. Otherwise they would never be able to cross the congested city in time to reach the stadium for their own performance. Zalzan Kaval had obtained a choice location for them close by the Arch of Dreams, but it meant that they would spend the better part of the day waiting for the parade to come to them. No help for it. On foot they cut diagonally through the back streets, emerging at last at the lower end of Water Road. As Shanamir had reported, the city was lavishly decorated, cluttered with ornament, banners and bunting dangling from every building, every light globe. The roadbed itself had been freshly painted in the coronal's colors, gleaming bright green bordered by golden stripes. At this early hour, the route was already lined with viewers, and no open spaces, but a space in the crowd swiftly was made when the Skandar jugglers appeared and Zalzan Kaval produced his sheaf of tickets. People on Majipur normally tended to courtesy and graceful accommodation. Besides, there were few who cared to argue points of precedence with six surly skandars. And then the waiting. The morning was warm and swiftly growing hot, and there was nothing for Valentine to do but stand and wait, staring at the empty highway, at the ornate black polished stonework of the Arch of Dreams. Carabella jammed up against his left side. Shanamir pushed close on the right. Time ticked infinitely slowly that morning. The wells of conversation quickly ran dry. One moment of diversion came when Valentine picked a startling phrase out of the murmur of conversation from the rose behind him. Can't see what all this cheering's about. I don't trust him one bit. Valentine listened more carefully. A pair of spectators, gay rogs by the slippery sound of their voices, were talking about the new coronal and not in any complimentary way. Issuing too many decrees, if you ask me. Regulating this, regulating that, getting his fingers in here and there. No need for it. He wants to show that he's on the job, the other said mildly. No need, no need. Things went along well enough under Lord Voriax and Lord Malabor before him, without all these fussy rules. Smacks of insecurity, if you ask me. Quiet. Today of all days, this is no way to talk. If you ask me, the boy's not sure he's really coronal yet, so he makes sure we all take notice of him, if you ask me. I didn't ask you. In worried tones. And another thing. These imperial proctors all over the place, suddenly. What's he doing? Setting up his own worldwide police? Spying for the coronal, are they? 
What for? What's he up to? If he's up to anything, you'll be the first one pulled in. Will you be quiet? I mean no harm, the first Gayrog said. Look, I carry the Starburst banner like everyone else. Am I loyal or am I loyal? But I don't like the way things are going. It's a citizen's right to worry about the state of the realm, isn't it? If matters are not to our liking, we should speak up. That's our tradition, isn't it? If we allow small abuses now, who knows what sort of things he'll be doing five years on? Interesting, Valentine thought. For all this frantic cheering and waving, the new colonel was not universally loved and admired. How many of these others, he wondered, are merely pumping up their enthusiasm out of fear or self-interest? The gay rogs fell silent. Valentine scanned for other conversations, but heard nothing of interest. Again time crawled. He turned his attention to the arch and studied it until he had memorized its features, the carved images of ancient powers of Majipur, heroes of the murky past, generals in the early Metamorph Wars, colonels who antedated even legendary Lord Stiamat, pontifexes of antiquity, ladies offering benign blessings. The arch, said Shanamir, was the oldest surviving thing in Pidruid, and the holiest, nine thousand years old, carved from blocks of black velleth into marble that were immune to the ravages of the weather. To pass beneath it was to ensure the protection of the lady and a month of useful dreams. Rumors of the colonel's progress across Pidruid enlivened the morning. The colonel, it was said, had left the Golden Plaza, had entered by way of Falkenkip Gate, had paused to bestow double handfuls of five-crown pieces in the sectors of the city inhabited primarily by runes and hjorts, had stopped to comfort a wailing infant, had halted to pray at the shrine of his late brother Lord Voriax, had found the heat too great and was resting for some hours at midday, had done this, had done that, had done something else. The coronal, the coronal, the coronal! All attention was on the coronal this day. Valentine pondered what sort of life it must be, constantly making grand circuits of this sort, showing oneself in city after city on eternal parade, smiling, waving, throwing coins, taking part in unending gaudy spectacle, demonstrating in one's physical person the embodiment of the power of the government, accepting all this homage, this noisy public excitement, and somehow still managing to hold the reins of the government. Or were there reins to hold? The system was so ancient, it probably ran of its own accord. A pontifex, old and by tradition reclusive, hidden in a mysterious labyrinth somewhere in central Alhanuel, making the decrees by which the world was ruled, and his heir and adopted son the colonel reigning as executive officer and prime minister from a top castle mount, except when he was engaged in ceremonial progresses such as this, and was either of them needed except as a symbol of majesty, this was a peaceful, sunny, playful world, so Valentine thought, though no doubt it had a dark side hidden somewhere, or else why would a king of dreams have arisen to challenge the authority of the Blessed Lady? These rulers, this constitutional pomp, this expense and tumult, no, Valentine thought, it had no meaning. It was a survival out of some distant era when perhaps it all had had necessity. What had meaning now? To live each day, to breathe sweet air, to eat and drink, to sleep soundly. The rest was foolishness. The colonel comes, someone cried. So the cry had arisen ten times in the past hour, and no colonel had come. But now, just about noon, it seemed that in fact he was drawing near. The sound of cheering preceded him, a distant roar, like the crashing of the sea, that spread as a propagating wave along the line of march. As it grew louder, heralds on sprightly mounts appeared in the roadway, moving almost at a gallop, managing occasional trumpet blasts through lips that must be sore and weary after all this time. And then, mounted on a floater that carried them briskly along, 
several hundred of the colonel's personal bodyguard in the green and gold starburst uniform, a carefully selected group, both men and women, humans and others, the cream of Majipur, standing at attention aboard their vehicle, looking, Valentine thought, very dignified and a trifle silly. And now the colonel's own chariot was in sight. It, too, was floater-mounted, hovering several feet above the pavement and moving quickly forward in a ghostly way. Lavishly bedecked with glittering fabric and thick white quartering sewn from what might well have been the fur of rare beasts, it had an appropriate look of majesty and costliness. On it rode half a dozen of the high officials of the city of Pidruid and the surrounding province, all of them clad in robes of state, mayors and dukes and such, and among them, mounted on a raised platform of some silken scarlet wood, extending his arms benevolently to the onlookers on either side of the road, was Lord Valentine the Coronel, second most luminous of the powers of Majipur. And, since his adoptive imperial father the Pontifex was aloof and never to be seen by ordinary mortals, perhaps the truest embodiment of authority that could be beheld in this world. Valentine, the cry arose. Valentine! Lord Valentine! Valentine studied his royal namesake as intently as earlier he had examined the inscriptions on the ancient black arch of dreams. This coronal was an imposing figure. A man of more than middle height, powerful looking, with strong shoulders and long sturdy arms. His skin was of a rich olive hue. His hair was black and cut to fall just below his ears. His dark beard was a short, stiff fringe at his chin. As the tumult of cheers descended on him, Lord Valentine turned graciously to one side and another, acknowledging, inclining his body slightly, offering his outstretched hands to the air. The floater drifted swiftly past the place where Valentine and the jugglers stood, and in that interval of proximity the colonel turned toward them, so that for an electric moment Valentine and Lord Valentine had their eyes locked on one another. It seemed that a contact passed between them. A spark leaped the gap. The coronel's smile was brilliant. His bright, dark eyes held a dazzling gleam. His robes of state themselves seemed to have life and power and purpose. And Valentine stood transfixed, caught by the sorcery of imperial might. For an instant he comprehended Shanamir's awe the awe of all these people at the presence among them of their prince. Lord Valentine was only a man, true. He needed to void his bladder and fill his gut. He slept at night and rose yawning in the morning like ordinary mortals. He had dirtied his diapers when a babe, and would drool and doze when he was old. And yet, and yet he moved in sacred circles. He dwelled on Castle Mount. He was the living son of the Lady of the Isle of Sleep and had been taken as son by the Pontifex Tieverus, as had his brother, dead Voriax, before him. He had lived most of his life close to the founts of power. He had had given into his charge the government of all this colossal world and its teeming multitudes. And, thought Valentine, such an existence changes one. It sets one apart. It gives one an aura and a strangeness. And as the chariot of the coronel floated by, Valentine perceived that aura and was humbled by it. Then the chariot was passed, and the moment was gone, and there was Lord Valentine retreating in the distance, still smiling, still extending his arms, still nodding graciously, still flashing his brilliant gaze at this citizen and that. But Valentine no longer felt himself in the presence of grace and might. Instead, he felt vaguely soiled and cheated, and did not know why. Come quickly, Zalzenkabel grunted. We must get ourselves to the stadium now. That much was simple. Everyone in Pidruid, except the bedridden and the imprisoned, stood stationed along the line of parade. The auxiliary streets were empty. In fifteen minutes, the jugglers were at the waterfront. In ten more they approached the huge Bayside Stadium. Here a crowd had already begun to form. 
Thousands jammed the wharfs just beyond the stadium to have a second glimpse of the coronal as he arrived. The Skandars formed themselves into a wedge and cut brutally through this mob, Valentine and Sleet and Carabella and Shanamir following in their wake. Performers were instructed to report to the staging area at the stadium's rear, a great open space fronting the water, and a kind of madness already prevailed there, with hundreds of costumed artists jostling for position. Here were giant gladiators of quill who made even the Skandars look frail, and teams of acrobats clamoring impatiently over each other's shoulders, and an entire nude corps de ballet, and three orchestras of strange outworldly instruments tuning up in bizarre discord, and animal trainers tugging strings that controlled floater-born beasts of improbable size and ferocity, and freaks of every description. A man who weighed a thousand pounds, a woman eleven feet high and slender as a black bamboo rod, a vroon with two heads, Lee men who were triplets and joined by a rope of ghastly blue-gray flesh from waist to waist to waist, someone whose face was like a hatchet and whose lower body was like a wheel, and so much more that Valentine was dizzied by the sights and sounds and smells of this congregation of the bewildering. Frantic clerks wearing municipal sashes were trying to arrange these performers into an orderly procession. Some sort of order of march actually existed. Zalzan Kabul barked an identification at a clerk and received in return a number that marked his troop's place in line. But then it was their task to find their neighbors in the line, and that was not so easy, for everyone in the staging area was in constant motion, and finding numbers was like trying to attach name tags to waves in the sea. Eventually the jugglers found their place, well back in the crowd, jammed in between a group of acrobats and one of the orchestras. After that there was no moving about, and once more they stood in place for hours. The performers were offered refreshments as they waited. Servitors moved among them bearing bits of skewered meat and globlets of green or gold wine, for which no fee was asked. But the air was warm and heavy, and the reek of so many close-packed bodies of so many races and metabolisms made Valentine feel faint. In an hour he thought I will be juggling before the coronal. How odd that sounds. He was aware of Carabella close beside him, jaunty, buoyant, always smiling, unfailingly energetic. May the divine spare us from having to do this ever again, she whispered. At last there was some sense of movement far away near the gate to the stadium, as if some stopcock had been pulled and eddy currents were drawing the first performers out of the staging area. Valentine stood on tiptoe, but had no clear idea of what was happening. The better part of an hour went by before any sort of motion was apparent at their end of the assemblage. Then the line began to go steadily forward. From within the stadium came sounds, music, screeching beasts, laughter, applause. The orchestra that preceded Zalzenkabel's troop now was ready to enter. Twenty players, of three non-human races, Bearing fanciful instruments unknown to Valentine, swirls of shining brass pipe and strange lopsided drums and small five-bodied fifes and the like, everything oddly delicate. But the sound they made was not delicate at all when they struck up and began their march. The last of the musicians disappeared through the great double gates of the stadium, and an officious major domo strutted forward to bar the access of the jugglers. Zalzan Kavl and his troop the major-domo announced. We are here, said Zalzenkavl. You will wait for the signal. Then you enter and follow those musicians in procession from left to right around the stadium. Do not begin to perform until you pass the large green flag that bears the coronal's emblem. When you reach the pavilion of the coronal, pause and make obeisance, and hold your place for sixty seconds, performing your act before moving onward. When you reach the far gate, depart from the area at once. You will be paid your fee as you leave. Is everything clear? Quite, said Zalzenkavl. The Skandar turned to his troop. He had until this moment been nothing other than brusque and rough. 
but suddenly he displayed another side, for he reached three of his arms toward his brothers and clasped hands with them, and something that seemed almost like a loving smile appeared on his harsh face. Then the Skandar embraced Sleet, and then Carabella, and then he drew Valentine toward him and said, as gently as a Skandar could, You have learned quickly, and you show signs of mastery. You were only a convenience for us, but I am pleased now that you are among us. Thank you, said Valentine solemnly. Jugglers, the Major Domo barked. Zalzan Kavl said, It's not every day that we juggle for a power of Majipur. Let this be our finest performance. He gestured, and the troop moved through the mighty double gates. Sleet and Carabella led the way juggling five knives that they exchanged with one another in staccato patterns constantly varying. Then, after a space, Valentine walked alone, juggling his three clubs with a taut intensity likely to conceal the simplicity of his routine. And behind him, the six Skandar brothers, making utmost use of their twenty-four arms to fill the air with a preposterous miscellany of flying objects. Shanamir, as a kind of esquire, concluded the march, making no performance, merely serving as a human punctuation mark. Carabella was exuberant, irrepressible. She did high springs, clicking her heels, clapping her hands, and yet never missing a beat, while beside her, sleet, whiplash quick, compact, dynamic, made himself a veritable well of energy as he snatched knives from the air and returned them to his partner. Even somber, economical sleet allowed himself a quick, implausible somersault, while the soft air of Majipur under the light pull of gravity held the knives aloft for the necessary fraction of a second. Around the stadium they marched, taking their rhythm from the strident squeaks and tootles and thumps of the orchestra before them. The vast throng, jaded already with novelty after novelty, hardly reacted. But no matter. The juggler's allegiance was to their art, not to the sweaty faces barely visible in the distant seats. Valentine had devised yesterday, and privately practiced, a fancy flourish for his routine. The others knew nothing of it, for there were risks in such things for a novice, and a royal performance was perhaps not the right place for a risk. Although he thought, more truthfully, a royal performance was the most proper place for extending oneself to the fullest so he grasped two of his clubs in his right hand and hurled them high, and as he did so he heard the grunting hoy of surprise from Zalzan Kavl. But there was no time to think on that, for the two clubs were descending, and Valentine sent the one in his left hand up between them in a soaring double flip. Deftly he caught one falling club in each hand, sent the one in his right hand aloft, caught the double flipped one as it dropped and went serenely and with great relief into his familiar cascade of clubs, looking neither to the right nor to the left, as he trailed Carabella and Sleet around the perimeter of the gigantic stadium. Orchestras, acrobats, dancers, animal trainers, jugglers, before him and aft, thousands of blank faces in the seats, ribbon-bedecked arcades of grandees. Valentine saw none of it, except in the most subliminal way. Throw, throw, throw and catch, throw and catch, throw and catch, on and on, until in the corner of his eye he saw the brilliant green and gold draperies flanking the royal pavilion. He turned to face the coronal. This was a difficult moment, for now he had to divide his attention. Keeping the clubs flying, he sought for Lord Valentine himself and found him halfway up the sloping pavilion. Valentine prayed for another jolt of interchanged energy, another quick flash of contact with the coronal's searing eyes. He threw automatically, precisely, each club rising its allotted distance and arcing over to land between his thumb and fingers, and as he did so, he searched the coronal's face. But no, no jolt of energy this time, for the prince was distracted. He did not see the juggler at all. He stared in boredom across the whole width of the stadium, towards some other act, perhaps some fang and claw animal number, perhaps the bare-rumped ballet dancers, perhaps at nothing at all. Valentine persevered, 
counting out the full sixty seconds of his homage, and toward the end of his minute it seemed to him the colonel did indeed glance his way a fraction of an instant, but no more than that. Then Valentine moved on. Carabella and Sleet were already approaching the exit. Valentine turned in a half-circle where he stood, and grinned high-heartedly at the Scandars, who marched forward under a dancing canopy of axes and fiery torches and sickles and hammers and pieces of fruit, adding object after object to the multitude of things they whirled aloft. Valentine juggled at them a moment before continuing his solitary orbit of the stadium. And onward and outward through the far gate and caught his clubs and held them as he passed into the outer world. Again, as he left the presence of the coronal, he felt a letdown, a weariness, an emptiness, as though Lord Valentine did not truly radiate energy, but merely drained it from others, giving the illusion of a bright, outflashing aura, and when moved beyond him one experienced only a sense of loss. Besides, the performance was over. Valentine's moment of glory had come and gone, and no one apparently had noticed. Except Zalzan Kavl, who looked dour and irritable. Who taught you that two-club throw, he demanded, the moment he came through the gate. No one, said Valentine. I invented it myself. And if you had dropped your clubs out there? Did I drop them? That was no place for fancy tricks, the Skandar muttered. Then he softened a bit. But I do admit you carried yourself well. From a second major domo he received a purse of coins, and dumped them into his two outer hands, counting quickly through them. Most he pocketed, but he tossed one to each of his brothers, and one apiece to Sleet and Carabella, and then, after some thought, smaller coins to Valentine and Shanamir. Valentine saw that he and Shonamir had each received half a crown, and the others a crown apiece. Not important. Money was of no real account so long as a few crowns jingled in his pouch. The bonus, however small, was unexpected. He would squander it gleefully tonight on strong wine and spicy fish. The long afternoon was nearly over. Fog rising off the sea was bringing an early darkness to Pidruid. In the stadium, the sounds of circus still resounded. The poor colonel, Valentine thought, would be sitting there far into the night. Carabella tugged at his wrist. Come now, she whispered urgently. Our work is done. Now we make festival. Nine. She sprinted off into the crowd, and Valentine, after a moment's confusion, followed her. His three clubs, fastened by a cord to his waist, clumped awkwardly into his thighs as he ran. He thought he had lost her, but no, she was in sight now, taking high, bouncy strides, turning and grinning saucily back at him, waving him on. Valentine caught up with her on the great flat steps that led down to the bay. Barges had been towed into the near harbor, with pyres of slender logs piled on them in intricate patterns. And already, though it was hardly night yet, a few of them had been torched and were burning with a cool green glow, sending up scarcely any smoke. The entire city had been converted, during the day, into a playground. Carnival booths had sprung up like toadstools after summer rain. Revelers in strange costumes swaggered along the quays. There was music on all sides, laughter, a feverish excitement. As the darkness deepened, new fires blazed, and the bay became a sea of colored light. And out of the east erupted some kind of pyrotechnic display, a skyrocket of piercing brilliance that soared to a point high overhead and burst, sending dazzling streamers downward to the tips of Pidruid's highest buildings. A frenzy was on Carabella and a frenzy crept into Valentine, too. Hand in hand they raced recklessly through the city, from booth to booth, scattering coins like pebbles as they played. Many of the booths were games of skill, knocking down dolls with balls or upsetting some carefully balanced construct. Carabella, with her juggler's eye and juggler's hand, won nearly everything she tried, and Valentine, though less skilled, took his share of prizes, too. 
At some booths, the winnings were mugs of wine or morsels of meat. At others, they were silly stuffed animals or banners bearing the colonel's emblem. And these things they abandoned. But they ate the meat, they gulped the wine, and they grew flushed and wild as the night moved on. Here, Carabella cried, and they joined a dance of runes and gay rugs and drunken shorts, a capering circle dance that seemed to have no rules. For long minutes they pranced with the aliens. When a leathery-faced short embraced Carabella, she hugged it back, clasping it so tightly that her small, strong fingers sank deep into its puffy hide. And when a female gay rug, all snaky locks and myriad swaying breasts, pressed herself against Valentine, he accepted her kiss and returned it with more enthusiasm than he would have expected himself to muster. And then it was onward again, into an open-walled theater where angular puppets were enacting a drama in jerky stylized movements, and on into an arena where at a cost of a few weights they watched sea dragons swim in menacing circles round and round in a glistening tank, and onward from there to a garden of animate plants from Alhanroel's southern shore, ropey tentacular things, and tall, trembling, rubbery columns with surprising eyes near their summits. Feeding time in half an hour, the keeper called, but Carabella would not stay, and with Valentine in tow, she plunged off through the gathering darkness. Fireworks exploded again, now infinitely more effective against the backdrop of night. There was a triple starburst that gave way to the image of Lord Valentine filling half the sky and then a dazzle of green and red and blue that took the form of the labyrinth, and yielded to the gloomy visage of old Pontifex Tieverus. And after a moment, when the colors had cleared, a new explosion threw a sheet of fire across the heavens, out of which coalesced the beloved features of the great royal mother, the lady of the Isle of Sleep, smiling down on Pidruid with all of love. The sight of her so deeply moved Valentine, that he would have fallen to his knees and wept, a mysterious and startling response. But there was no room in the crowd for any of that. He stood trembling an instant. The lady faded into the darkness. Valentine slipped his hand against Carabella's and held it tightly. I need more wine, he whispered. Wait, there's one more to come. Indeed. Another skyrocket, another burst of color, this one jagged and uncouth to the eye, yellows and reds, and out of it another face, heavy-jawed and somber-eyed, that of the fourth of the powers of Majipur, that darkest and most ambiguous figure of the hierarchy, the king of dreams, Simonin Bajazid. A hush fell over the crowd, for the king of dreams was no one's friend, though all acknowledged his power lest he bring bad fortune and dread punishment. Now they went for wine. Valentine's hand shook and he downed two mugs quickly, while Carabella looked at him in some concern. Her fingers played with the strong bones of his wrist, but she asked no questions. Her own wine she left barely touched. The next door that opened before them in the festival was that of a wax museum, in the shape of a miniature labyrinth so that when they stumbled inside, there was no turning back, and they gave the waxen keeper their three weight pieces and went forward. Out of the darkness emerged heroes of the realm done in cunning simulation, moving, even speaking in archaic dialects. This tall warrior announced himself to be Lord Stiamat, conqueror of the Metamorphs, and this was the fabled Lady Thin, his mother, the warrior lady who in person led the defense of the Isle of Sleep when it was besieged by Aborigines. To them came one claiming to be Dvorn, the first Pontifex, a figure almost as remote in time from the era of Stiamat as Stiamat was from the present. And near him was Dinatak Bajazid, the first king of dreams, a personage far less ancient. Deeper into the maze went Carabell and Valentine, encountering a host of dead powers, a cleverly chosen assortment of pontifexes and ladies and coronals, the great rulers Confalum and Prestimian and Decorate, and the pontifex Ariac of curious fame. And last of all, presiding over the exit, the image of a ruddy-faced man in tight black garments, perhaps forty years of age, 
black-haired and dark-eyed and smiling. And he needed to offer no introductions, for this was Voriax, the late coronel, brother to Lord Valentine, cut down in the prime of his reign two years past, dead in some absurd hunting accident after holding power only eight years. The image bowed and reached forth its hands, and exclaimed, Weep for me, brothers and sisters, for I was supreme and perished before my time, and my fall was all the greater since I fell from so lofty a height. I was Lord Voriax, and think long on my fate. Carabella shuddered. A gloomy place, and a gloomy finish to it, away from here. Once more she led him breathlessly through the festival grounds, through gaming halls and arcades and brilliantly lit pavilions, past dining tables and pleasure houses, never halting, floating bird-like from place to place, until finally they turned a corner and were in darkness, beyond the zone of revelry altogether. From behind them came the raucous sounds of fading merriment and the dwindling glow of garish light. As they moved forward, they encountered the fragrance of heavy blossoms, the silence of trees. They were in a garden, a park. Come, Carabella murmured, taking him by the hand. They entered a moonlit glade where the trees had been pleached overhead to form a tightly woven bower. Valentine's arm slipped easily around her taut, narrow waist. The soft warmth of the day lay trapped under these close, tangled trees and from the moist soil rose the creamy sweet aroma of huge fleshy flowers, bigger across than a skandar's head. The festival and all its chaotic excitement seemed ten thousand miles away. This is where we'll stay, Carabella announced. With exaggerated chivalry he spread his cloak, and she drew him to the ground and slid easily and swiftly into his arms. They lay secluded between two high, dense bushes of grey-green stick-like branches. A stream ran not far from them, and only the most slender gleams of brightness entered overhead. Fastened to Carabella's hip was a tiny pocket harp of intricate workmanship. She drew it forth now, strummed a brief melodious prelude, and began to sing in a cool, pure voice. My love is fair as is the spring, as gentle as the night. My love is sweet as stolen fruit, my love is clear and bright. Not all the richness of the land, nor all the gems of sea, nor all the wealth of Castlemount is worth my love to me. How lovely that is, Valentine murmured. And your voice, your voice is so beautiful. Do you sing, she asked. Why, yes, I suppose so. She handed him the harp. Sing for me now, one of your favorites. He turned the little instrument over in his hand, puzzled, and said after a moment, I don't know any songs. No songs? No songs? Come, you must know a few. All gone from my mind, so it seems. Carabella smiled and took back her harp. I'll teach you a few then, she said, but not now, I think. No, not now. He touched his lips to hers. She purred and chuckled, and her embrace grew tighter. As his eyes became accustomed to the darkness, he could see her more clearly. Small pointed face, bright sly eyes, glossy tumbling black hair. Her nostrils flared with expectation. He drew back momentarily from what was to occur, obscurely fearing that some sort of contract was about to be sealed. But then he put those fears behind him. It was festival night, and he wanted her, and she him. Valentine's hand slipped down her back, came forward, felt the cage of her ribs lying just below the skin. He remembered her as she had looked standing naked under the cleanser. Muscle and bone, bone and muscle. Not much meat on her except at thighs and buttocks. A compact bundle of energy. In a moment she was naked again, and so was he. He saw that she was trembling, but not from chill, 
not on this balmy, humid night in this secret bower. A strange, almost frightening intensity seemed to grip her. He stroked her arms, her face, her muscular shoulders, the small, hard-tipped spheres of her breasts. His hand found the sleek skin along the inside of her thighs, and she let out her breath sharply and pulled him to her. Their bodies moved in easy rhythms, as though they had been lovers for months and were well practiced with one another. Her slender, powerful legs clasped his waist, and they rolled over and over, until they came almost to the edge of the stream and could feel its chilly spray on their sweaty skins. They paused there, laughing, and rolled back the other way. This time they came to rest against one of the gray-green bushes, Carabella pulling him downward, taking the thrust of his weight without difficulty. Now, she cried, and he heard her hiss and moan, and then her fingers dug deep into his flesh and a furious spasm racked her body, and in that same instant he gave himself up fully to the forces that were sweeping through him. Afterward he lay gasping and half-dazed in her embrace, listening to the booming of his own heart. We'll sleep here, she whispered. No one will trouble us on this night. She stroked his forehead, pushing his soft yellow hair back from his eyes, smoothing it into place. Lightly she kissed the tip of his nose. She was casual, playful, kittenish. That dark, erotic intensity was gone from her, burned away in the fires of passion. But he felt shaken. Stunned, confused. For him there had been sudden, sharp ecstasy, yes. But in that moment of ecstasy, he had found himself peering through gates of dazzling light into a mysterious realm without color or form or substance. And he had teetered precariously on the brink of that unknown before tumbling back into the world of this reality. He could not speak. Nothing he might say seemed appropriate. He had not expected such disorientation to come out of the act of love. Carabella evidently sensed the disquiet in him, for she said nothing, only held him, rocked him gently, drew his head against her breast, sang softly to him. In the warmth of the night, he drifted gradually into sleep. When the dream images came, they were harsh and terrifying. He was carried back yet again to that bleak, familiar purple plain. The same mocking faces leered at him from the purple sky, but this time he was not alone. Looming up against him was a figure of dark visage and heavy, oppressive physical presence, whom Valentine understood to be his brother, although in the fierce, crackling glow of the amber sun he could not clearly see the other man's features and the dream enacted itself against a background of somber music, the low, keening note of mind music that denoted the peril dream, the threat dream, the death dream. The two men were locked in a bitter duel, and only one would come forth from the duel alive. Brother! Valentine cried in shock and horror. No! He stirred and twisted and came swimming up to the surface of sleep, and hovered there for an instant. But his training lay too deep for that. One did not flee dreams. One did not reject them, no matter how appalling. One entered fully into them and accepted their guidance. One came to grips with the unthinkable in dreams. And to avoid it, then, meant the inevitability of confronting it, and being defeated by it in waking life. Deliberately, Valentine drove himself downward again, through the borderland between wakefulness and sleep, and felt stealing about him once more the malign presence of his enemy, his brother. They were armed with swords, but the contest was unequal, for Valentine's weapon was a flimsy rapier, the brother's a massive saber. Through skill and agility, Valentine tried desperately to slip his sword past his brother's guard. Impossible! With slow, weighty strokes, the other parried steadily, sweeping Valentine's frail blade aside and driving him inexorably backward over the rough, gullied terrain. 
Vultures circled overhead. Out of the sky came a hissing death song. There would be blood spilling soon, and a life returning to the source. Step by step Valentine yielded, knowing that a ravine lay just behind him, and further retreat soon would be forestalled. His arm was aching, his eyes pounded with fatigue. There was the gritty taste of sand in his mouth, his last strength ebbing. Backward, backward. Brother, he cried in anguish, in the name of the divine. His plea drew harsh laughter and a sharp obscenity. The saber descended in a mighty swing. Valentine thrust out his blade and was shaken by a terrible body-numbing shiver as metal rang against metal and his light sword was snapped to a stump. In the same moment he tripped over a dry, sand-scoured snag of wood and tumbled heavily to the ground, landing in a tangle of thorny, creeping stems. The huge man with the saber reared above him, blotting out the sun, filling the sky. The death song took on a murderous, screeching intensity of timbre. The vultures fluttered and swooped. The sleeping Valentine moaned and trembled. He turned again, huddled close against Carabella, took warmth from her as the dread cold of the death dream enveloped him. It would be so easy to awaken now, to escape the horror and violence of these images, to swim to safety on the shores of consciousness. But no. With fierce discipline he thrust himself again into the nightmare. The giant figure laughed, the saber rose high, the world lurched and crumbled beneath his fallen body. He commended his soul to the lady and waited for the blow to descend. And the blow of the saber was awkward and lame, and with a foolish thud his brother's sword buried itself deep in the sand, and the texture and thrust of the dream were altered, for no longer did Valentine hear the wailing hiss of death songs, and now he found everything reversed, found currents of new and unexpected energy pouring into him. He leaped to his feet. His brother tugged at the saber, cursed, struggled to pull it from the ground, and Valentine snapped it with a contemptuous kick. He seized the other man barehanded. Now it was Valentine who commanded the duel, and his cowering brother who retreated before a shower of blows, sagging now to his knees as Valentine battered him, growling like a wounded bear, shaking his bloody head from side to side, taking the beating and offering no defense, murmuring only, Brother, brother as Valentine pounded him to the sand. He lay still, and Valentine stood victor over him. Let it be dawn, Valentine prayed, and released himself from sleep. It was still dark. He blinked and clasped his arms to his sides and shivered. Violent, frenzied images, fragmented but potent, swam in his troubled mind. Carabella studied him thoughtfully. Are you all right? she asked. I dreamed. You cried out three times. I thought you would wake. A strong dream? Yes. And now? I'm puzzled, troubled. Tell me your dream? It was an intimate request. And yet were they not lovers? Had they not gone down into the world of sleep together, partners in the night's quest? I dreamed that I fought with my brother, he said hoarsely, that we dueled with swords in a hot barren desert, that he came close to killing me, that at the last moment I rose from the ground and found new strength and... and... and I beat him to death with my fists... Her eyes glittered like an animal's in the darkness. She watched him like some wary, beady-eyed droll. Do you always have such ferocious dreams? she asked after a time. I don't think so, but yes. Not only the violence. Carabella, I have no brother. She laughed. Do you expect dreams to correspond exactly to reality? Valentine, Valentine, where were you taught? Dreams have a truth deeper than the reality we know. 
the brother of your dream could be any one or no one. Zalzan Carvel, Sleet, your father, Lord Valentine, the Pontifex Tieverus, Shanamir, even me. You know that unless they be specific sendings, dreams transform all things. I know, yes, but what does it mean, Carabella? To duel with a brother? To be killed almost by him? To slay him instead? You want me to speak your dream for you, she said, surprised. It speaks nothing to me except fear and mystery. You were badly frightened, yes. You were soaked with sweat and you cried out again and again. But painful dreams are the most revealing ones, Valentine. Speak it for yourself. My brother, I have no brother. I told you it doesn't matter. Did I make war against myself then? I don't understand. I have no enemies, Carabella. Your father, she suggested. He considered that. His father? He searched for a face that he could give to the shadowy man with the saber. But he found only more darkness. I don't remember him, Valentine said. Did he die when you were a boy? I think so. Valentine shook his head, which was beginning to throb. I don't remember. I see a big man. His beard is dark. His eyes are dark. What was his name? When did he die? Valentine shook his head again. Carabella leaned close. She took his hands in hers and said softly, Valentine, where were you born? In the east. Yes, you said that. Where? What city? What province? Nimoya, he said vaguely. Are you asking me or telling me? Nimoya, he repeated. A big house, a garden, near the bend of the river. Yes, I see myself there, swimming in the river, hunting in the Duke's forest. Am I dreaming that? Are you? It feels like something I've read, like a story I've been told. Your mother's name? He began to reply, but when he opened his mouth, no name came. She died young, too? Caliara, Valentine said without conviction. That was it. Caliara, a lovely name. Tell me what she looked like. She, she had, he faltered. Golden hair like mine, sweet, smooth skin. Her eyes, her voice sounded like, It's so hard, Carabella. You're shaking. Yes. Come, here. Once again she drew him close. She was much smaller than he, and yet she seemed very much stronger now. And he took comfort from her closeness. Gently, she said, You don't remember anything, do you, Valentine? No, not really. Not where you were born or where you came from or what your parents looked like, or even where you were last star day. Isn't that so? Your dreams can't guide you because you have nothing to speak against them. Her hands roamed his head. Her fingers probed delicately but firmly into his scalp. What are you doing, he asked, looking to see if you've been hurt. A blow on the head can take the memory away, you know. Is there anything there? No, no, nothing. No marks, no bumps. But that doesn't mean anything. It could have happened a month or two ago. I'll look again when the sun has risen. I like the feel of your hands touching me, Carabella. I like touching you, she said. He lay quietly against her. The words that had passed between them just now troubled him intensely. Other people, he realized, had rich memories of their childhood and adolescence, and knew the names of their parents and were sure of the place where they had been born. 
and he had nothing but his overlay of hazy notions, this mist of thin, untrustworthy memories covering a well of blankness, yes, and he had known that the blankness was there, but had chosen not to peer into it. Now Carabella had forced that upon him. Why, he wondered, was he unlike others? Why were his memories without substance? Had he taken some blow on the head, as she suggested? Or was it just that his mind was dim, that he lacked the capacity to retain the imprints of experience, that he had wandered for years across the face of Majipur, erasing each yesterday as each new day dawned? Neither of them slept again that night. Toward morning, quite suddenly, they began to make love again, in silence, in a kind of driven, purposeful way quite different from the earlier playful union. And then they rose, still saying nothing, and bathed in the chilly little brook, and dressed and made their way through town to the inn. There were still some bleary-eyed revelers staggering in the streets as the bright eye of the sun rose high over Pidruid. 10. At Carabella's prompting, Valentine took Sleet into his confidence, and told him of his dream and of the conversation that followed it. The little white-haired juggler listened thoughtfully, never interrupting, looking increasingly solemn. He said when Valentine had done, You should seek guidance from a dream speaker. This is too strong ascending to be ignored. Do you think it is ascending, then? Possibly it is, said Sleet. From the king? Sleet spread his hands and contemplated his fingertips. It could be. You will have to wait and pay close heed. The king never sends simple messages. It could be from the lady just as well, Carabella offered. The violence of it shouldn't deceive us. The lady sends violent dreams when the need exists. And some dreams, said Sleet with a smile, come neither from the lady nor from the king, but up out of the depths of our own foggy minds. Who can tell unaided? Valentine? See a dream speaker. Would a dream speaker help me find my memories, then? A dream speaker or a sorcerer, yes. If dreams are no guidance to your past, nothing will be. Besides, said Carabella, a dream so strong should not go unexamined. There is your responsibility to be considered. If a dream commands an action, and you choose not to pursue that action... She shrugged. Your soul will answer for it, and swiftly. Find us, Speaker Valentine. I had hoped, Valentine said to Sleet, that you would have some wisdom in these things. I am a juggler. Find a speaker. Can you recommend one in Pidruid? We will be leaving Pidruid shortly. Wait until we are a few days' journey from the city. You will have richer dreams to give the speaker by then. I wonder if this is ascending, said Valentine. And from the king, what business would the king of dreams have with a wanderer like me? I hardly think it possible. With twenty billion souls on Majipur, how could the king find time to deal with any but the most important? In Suvrail, said Sleet, at the palace of the king of dreams are great machines that scan this entire world and send messages into the minds of millions of people every night. Who knows how those millions are chosen? One thing they tell us when we are children, and I know it has truth. At least once before we leave this world, we will feel the touch of the King of Dreams against our spirit, each and all of us. I know that I have. You, more than once. Sleet touched his lank, coarse white hair. Do you think I was born white-haired? One night I lay in a hammock in the jungles outside Narabal. No juggler then. And the king came to me as I slept and placed commands upon my soul. And when I awakened, my hair was like this. I was twenty-three years old. Commands, Valentine blurted. What commands? Commands that turn a man's hair from black to white between darkness and dawn, Sleet said. Obviously he wished to say no more. He got to his feet and glanced at the morning sky as though checking the elevation of the sun. I think we've had enough talk for now, friend. 
There's still our crowns to earn at the festival. Would you learn a few new tricks before Zalzan Kavl sends us out to work? Valentine nodded. Sleet fetched balls and clubs. They went out into the courtyard. Watch, said Sleet, and he stood close behind Carabella. She held two balls in her right hand, he one in his left, and they put their other arms around one another. This is half-juggling, Sleet said, a simple thing even for beginners, but it looks extremely challenging. Carabella threw, Sleet threw and caught. At once they were in the rhythm of interchange, easily passing the balls back and forth. One entity with four legs and two minds and two juggling arms. Indeed it did look taxing, Valentine thought. Sleet called out, Feed the clubs to us now. As Valentine delivered each club with a quick, sharp toss to Carabella's right hand, she worked it into the sequence. One, two, three until balls and clubs flew from her to sleet, from sleet to her, in a dizzying cascade. Valentine knew from his own private trials how difficult it was to deal with that many objects. Five balls would be in his compass in another few weeks, he hoped. Four clubs might be feasible soon, too. But to handle three of each at the same time and coordinate this half-juggling as well was a feat that amazed him with admiration. And some jealousy, too, he realized oddly, for here was Sleet with his body tied up against Carabella's, forming a single organism with her, and only a few hours ago she had lain with him by the side of that brook in the Pidruid Park. Try it, Sleet said. He stepped aside and Carabella put herself in front of Valentine, arm and arm. They worked with three balls only. At first Valentine had problems judging the height and force of his throws, and sometimes sent the ball popping beyond Carabella's reach. But in ten minutes he had the knack of it, and in fifteen they were working together as smoothly as if they had been doing the act for years. Sleet encouraged him with lively applause. One of the Skandars appeared, not Zalzan Kavl, but his brother Erfon, who, even as Skandars went, was dour and chill. Are you ready? he asked gruffly. The troupe performed that afternoon in the private park of one of the powerful merchants of Pidruid, who was giving an entertainment for a provincial duke. Carabella and Valentine performed their new half-juggling routine. The Skandars did something flamboyant with dishes and crystal goblets and cooking pans, and as a climax, Sleet was led forth to juggle blindfolded. Is this possible? Valentine asked, awed. Watch, said Carabella. Valentine watched, but few others did, for this was Sunday after the great Star Day frenzy, and the lordlings who had ordered this performance were a weary, jaded bunch, half asleep, bored with the skills of the musicians and acrobats and jugglers they had hired. Sleet stepped forward carrying three clubs and planted himself in a firm, confident way standing a moment with his head cocked as though listening to the wind that blows between the worlds. And then, catching his breath sharply, he began to throw. Zalzan Kavl boomed, Twenty years of practice, lords and ladies of Pidruid. The keenest sense of hearing is necessary for this. He detects the rustle of the clubs against the atmosphere as they fly from hand to hand. Valentine wondered how even the keenest sense of hearing could detect anything against the hum of conversation and the clink of dishes and the loud, ostentatious pronouncements of Zalz and Kavl. But Sleet made no errors. That the juggling was difficult even for him was obvious. Normally he was smooth as a machine, tireless as a loom. But now his hands were moving in sudden, sharp skips and lunges, grasping hastily at a club that was spinning up almost out of reach, snatching with desperate quickness at one that had fallen nearly too far. Still it was miraculous juggling. It was as if Sleet had some chart in his mind of the location of each of the moving clubs, and put his hand where he expected a club to fall, and found it there, or close enough. He did ten, fifteen, twenty exchanges of the clubs, and then gathered all three to his chest, flipped the blindfold aside, took a deep bow. There was a pattering of applause. Sleet stood rigid. 
Carabella came to him and embraced him. Valentine clapped him lustily on the shoulder, and the troop left the stage. In the dressing room, Sleet was quivering from strain and beads of sweat glistened on his forehead. He gulped fire shower wine without restraint, as though it were nothing. Did they pay attention, he asked Carabella. Did they even notice? Some did, she said gently. Sleet spat. Pigs. Blaves. They have not enough skill to walk from one side of a room to the other, and they sit there chattering when... when an artist... when... Valentine had never seen Sleet show temper before. This blind juggling, he decided, was not good for the nerves. He seized the livid Sleet by both shoulders and leaned close. What matters, he said earnestly, is the display of skill, not the manners of the audience. You were perfect. Not quite, Sleet said sullenly. The timing. Perfect, Valentine insisted. You were in complete command. You were majestic. How could you care what drunken merchants might say or do? Is it for their souls or yours that you mastered the art? Sleep managed a weak grin. The blind juggling cuts deep into the soul. I would not see you in such pain, my friend. It passes. I feel a little better now. Your pain was self-inflicted, Valentine said. It was unwise to allow yourself such outrage. I say again, you were perfect, and nothing else is important. He turned to Shanamir. Go to the kitchen and see if we might have some meat and bread. Sleet has worked too hard. He needs new fuel. And fire shower wine isn't enough. Sleet looked merely tired now, instead of tense and furious. He reached forth a hand. Your soul is warm and kind, Valentine. Your spirit is a gentle and sunny one. Your pain pained me. I'll guard my wrath better, Sleet said. And you're right, Valentine. We juggle for ourselves. They are incidental. I should not have forgotten that. Twice more in Pidruid, Valentine saw the blind juggling done. Twice more he saw Sleet stalk from a stage, rigid and drained. The attention of the onlookers, Valentine realized, had nothing to do with Sleet's fatigue. It was a demonic, hard thing to do, was all, and the price the small man paid for his skill was a high one. When Sleet suffered, Valentine did what he could to beam comfort and strength to him. There was great pleasure for Valentine in serving the other man in that way. Twice more, too, Valentine had dark dreams. One night the apparition of the Pontifex came to him and summoned him into the labyrinth, and inward he went, down its many passageways and incomprehensible avenues, and the image of gaunt old Tieverus floated like a will-o'-the-wisp before him, leading him onward to the core, until at last he attained some inner realm of the great maze, and suddenly the Pontifex vanished and Valentine stood alone in a void of cold green light, all footing gone, falling endlessly toward the center of Majipur. And another night it was the coronel, riding in his chariot across Pidruid, who beckoned him and invited him to a game of counters. And they threw the dice and moved the markers, and what they played with was a packet of bleached knuckle bones. And when Valentine asked whose bones they were, Lord Valentine laughed and tugged at his stiff black fringe of a beard, and fastened his dazzling harsh eyes on him, and said, Look at your hands. And Valentine looked, and his hands were without fingers, mere pink globes at his wrists. These dreams Valentine shared once more with Carabella and with Sleet, but they offered him no dream-speaking only repeated their advice that he go to some priestess of the slumber world once they had left Pidruid. Departure now was imminent. The festival was breaking up. The coronel's ships no longer stood in the harbor. The roads were crowded with the outflow as the people of the province made their way homeward from the capital. Zalzan Kaval instructed his troop to finish whatever business remained to be done in Pidruid that morning, for on sea day afternoon they would take to the highway. The announcement left Shanamir strangely quiet and dejected. Valentine noticed the boy's moodiness. I thought you'd be eager to move along, finding the city too exciting to leave. Shanamir shook his head. 
I could go any time. Then what is it? Last night a dream came to me of my father and brothers. Valentine smiled. Homesickness already? And you haven't even left the province. Not homesickness, Shanamir said bleakly. They were tired and lying in the road, and I was driving a team of mounts, and they cried out to me for help, and I drove right on over their helpless bodies. One doesn't have to go to a dream speaker for understanding of a dream like that. So is it guilt at abandoning your duties at home? Guilt? Yes. The money, Shanamir said. There was an edge on his voice, as though he were a man trying to explain something to a dull child. He tapped his waist. The money, Valentine. I carry in here some hundred sixty royals from the sale of my animals. Have you forgotten? A fortune. Enough to pay my family's way all this year and part of next. They depend on my coming back safely to Falkenkip with it. And you are planning not to give it to them? I am hired by Zalzan Kavl. What if his route lies another way? If I bring the money home, I might never find you all again as you wander over Zimruel. If I go off with the jugglers, I steal my father's money, that he's expecting, that he needs. You see? Simply enough solved, Valentine said. Falcon Kip is how far from here? Two days fast, three days ordinary. Quite close. Zalzan Kabul's route, I'm sure, has not yet been fixed. I'll speak to him right now. One town's as good as the next to him. I'll cajole him into taking the Falcon Kip road out of here. When we're close to your father's ranch, you'll slip away by night, give the money quietly to one of your brothers, slip back to us before dawn. And then no guilt will attach, and you'll be free to proceed on your way. Shanamir's eyes widened. You think you can win a favor from that Skandar? How? I can try. He'll strike you to the ground in anger if you ask for anything. He wants no interference with his plans, any more than you'd allow a flock of blaves to vote on how you should run your affairs. Let me talk to him, said Valentine, and we'll see. I have reason to think Zalzan Kavl's not as rough within as he'd like us to believe. Where is he? Seeing after his wagon, readying it for the journey. Do you know where that is? Toward the waterfront, Valentine said. Yes, I know. The jugglers traveled between cities in a fine wagon that was parked in a lot several blocks from the inn, for it was too broad of beam to bring down these narrow streets. It was an imposing and costly vehicle, noble and majestic, made with the finest workmanship by artisans of one of the inland provinces. The wagon's main frame was of long, pale spars of light, springy wingwood, cunningly laminated into wide, arching strips with a colorless, fragrant glue, and bound with resilient withes found in the southern marshes. Over this elegant armature, sheets of tan stick skin had been stretched and stitched into place with thick yellow fibers drawn from the stick creature's own gristly bodies. Approaching it now, Valentine found Erfan Kavl, and another of the Skandars, Gibor Hearn, diligently oiling the wagon's traces, while from within came deep, booming shouts of rage, so loud and violent that the wagon seemed to sway from side to side. Where is your brother? Valentine asked. Gibor Hearn nodded sourly toward the wagon. This would not be a wise moment to intrude. I have business with him. He has business, said Erfan Kavl. With the thieving little sorcerer we pay to guide us through the provinces, and who would resign our service in Pidwood just as we are making ready to leave. Go in, if you will, but you will regret it. The angry cries from the wagon grew more vociferous. Suddenly the door of the wagon burst open, and a tiny figure sprang forth. A wizened old rune no bigger than a toy, a doll, a little featherlight creature with ropey tentacular limbs and skin of a faded greenish tint, and huge golden eyes now bright with fear. A smear of something that might be pale yellow blood covered the rune's angular cheek close beside its beak of a mouth. Zalzan Kaval appeared an instant later, 
a terrifying figure in the doorway, his fur puffed with wrath, his vast, basket-like hands impotently churning the air. To his brothers he cried, Catch him! Don't let him get away! Erfin Kavl and Gibor Hearn rose ponderously and formed a shaggy wall blocking the Vroon's escape. The little being, trapped, panicky, halted and whirled and threw himself against Valentine's knees. Lord, the Vroon murmured, clinging hard, protect me. He is insane and would kill me in his anger. Zalzan Kavl said, Hold him there, Valentine. The Skandar came forward. Valentine pushed the cowering Vroon out of sight behind him and faced Zalzan Kavl squarely. Control your temper if you will. Murder this Vroon and we'll all be stuck in Pidgewood forever. I mean no murder, Zalzan Kavl rumbled. I have no appetite for years of loathsome sendings. The Vroon said tremulously, he means no murder, only to throw me against a wall with all his strength. Valentine said, What is the quarrel? Perhaps I can mediate. Zalzan Kavl scowled. This dispute does not concern you. Get out of the way, Valentine. Better that I don't until your fury has subsided. Zalzan Kavl's eyes blazed. He advanced until he was no more than a few feet from Valentine, until Valentine could smell the anger-sharpened scent of the rough-thatched skandar. Zalzan Kavl still seethed. It may be, Valentine thought, that he will throw both of us against the wall. Erfan Kavl and Gibor Hearn stared from the side. Possibly they had never seen their brother defied before. There was silence a long moment. Zalzan Kavl's hands twitched convulsively, but he remained where he was. At length he said, This Vroon is the wizard Otifan Deliamber, whom I hire to show me the inland roads and to guard me against the deceits of the shapeshifters. All this week he has enjoyed a holiday at my expense in Pidruid. Now it is time to leave, and he tells me to find another guide, that he has lost interest in traveling from village to village. Is this your sense of how contracts are kept, wizard? The Vroon answered, I am old and weary, and my sorceries grow stale, and sometimes I think I start to forget the road. But if you still wish it, I'll accompany you as before, Zalzan Kavl. The Skandar looked astounded. What? I have changed my mind, said Otifan Deliamber blandly letting go his fearful clutch of Valentine's legs, and stepping out into view. The Vroon coiled and opened his many rubbery boneless arms as if a dread tension were being discharged from them, and peered boldly up at the enormous Skandar. I will keep to my contract, he declared. Bewilderedly, Zalzan Kavl said, for an hour and a half you've been swearing you'll remain here in Pidruid, ignoring all my entreaties and even ignoring my threats, driving me into such rage that I was ready to smash you to pulp, to my own grievous harm as well as yours. For dead sorcerers give poor service, and the king of dreams would rack me fearfully for such a thing. And still you were stubborn, still you denied the contract and told me to make shift elsewhere for a guide. And now at a moment's notice you retract all that. I do. Will you have the grace to tell me why? No reason, said the Vroon, except perhaps that this young man pleases me, that I admire his courage and his kindness and the warmth of his soul. And because he goes with you, I will go with you again, for his sake and no other reason. Does that gratify your curiosity, Zalzan Kavl? The Skandar growled and sputtered in exasperation, and gestured fiercely with his outer pair of hands, as though trying to pull them free of a tangle of bird-net vines. For an instant it seemed he might burst out in some new uprising of uncontrollable anger, that he was controlling himself only by supreme effort. He said at last, Out of my sight, wizard, before I hurl you against a wall anyway, and may the divine guard your life if you aren't here to depart with us this afternoon. At the second hour after midday, Otifan Deliamber said courteously, I will be punctual, Zausen Kavl. To Valentine he added, I thank you for protecting me. I am indebted to you, 
and will make repayment sooner than you think. The Vroon slipped quickly away. Zalzan Carvel said after a moment, It was a foolishness of you to come between us, Valentine. There could have been violence. I know. And if I had injured you both? I felt you would have held your anger. I was right, yes? Zalzan Carvel offered his sunless Skandar equivalent of a smile. I held my anger, true, but only because I was so amazed at your insolence that my own surprise halted me. Another moment, I had Deli Amber continue to thwart me. But he agreed to honor the contract, Valentine pointed out. He did indeed, and I suppose I too am indebted to you then. Hiring a new guide might have delayed us for days. I thank you, Valentine, said Zazen Carvel with clumsy grace. Is there truly a debt between us? The Skandar suddenly was taut with suspicion. How do you mean? I need a small favor of you. If I have done you service, may I now ask my return? Go on. Zalzan Kaffel's voice was frosty. Valentine took a deep breath. The boy Shanamir is from Falkenkip. Before he takes to the road with us, he has an urgent errand to perform there, a matter of family honor. Let him go to Falkenkip, then and rejoin us wherever we may be. He fears he won't be able to find us if he parts from us. What are you asking, Valentine? That you arrange our route so that we pass within a few hours' journey of the boy's home. Zalzan Carvel stared balefully at Valentine. Bleakly, he said, I am told by my guide that my contract is worthless, and then I am halted from action by an apprentice juggler and then I am asked to plan my journey for the sake of a groom's family honor. This is becoming a taxing day, Valentine. If you have no urgent engagements elsewhere, said Valentine, hopefully, Falcon Kip is only two or three days' journey to the northeast, and the boy... Enough! cried Zalzan Carvel. The Falcon Kip road it is, and then no more favors. Leave me now. Erfan, Hearn, is the wagon ready for the road? Eleven. The wagon of Zalz and Carvel's troop was as splendid within as without. The floor was of dark, shining planks of night-flower wood, buffed to a bright finish and pegged together with consummate artifice. To the rear, in the passenger compartment, graceful strings of dried seeds and tassels dangled from the vaulted ceiling, and the walls were covered with swirl-patterned fur hangings, intricate carved inlays, banners of gossamer sheer fabrics. There was room for five or six people of Skandar bulk to ride back there, though not in any spacious way. Mid-cabin was a place for the storage of belongings, trunks and parcels and juggling gear, all the paraphernalia of the troop, and up front, on a raised platform open to the sky, was a driver's seat wide enough for two Skandars or three humans. Huge and princely though the wagon was, a vehicle fit for a duke or even a coronal, it was altogether airy and light, light enough to float on a vertical column of warm air generated by magnetic rotors whirling in its belly. So long as Majipur spun on its axis, so would the rotors, and when the rotors were spinning the wagon would drift a foot or so above the ground, and could readily be drawn along by a harness team of mounts. In late morning they finished loading their goods aboard and went to the inn for lunch. Valentine was startled to see the short with the orange-daubed whiskers, Vinorcus, appear at this point and take a seat beside Zalzan Carvel. The Skandar hammered on the table for attention and bellowed, Meet our new road manager. This is Vinorcus, who will assist me in making bookings, look after our properties, and handle all manner of chores that now fall to me. Oh, no, Carabella muttered under her breath. He's hired a short? That weird one who's been staring at us all week? Vinorcus smiled a ghastly short smile, showing triple bands of rubbery chewing cartilage, and peered about in a goggle-eyed way. Valentine said, So you were serious about joining us? I thought that was a joke, about your juggling figures. 
It is well known that Hjorts never make jokes, said Vinorcus gravely, and broke into vociferous laughter. But what becomes of your trade in Hagus hides? Sold my stock entirely at market, the Hjort replied. And I thought of you, not knowing where you'd be tomorrow, and not caring. I admired that. I envied that. I asked myself, are you going to peddle hay goose hides all your days, Vinorcus, or will you try something new? A traveling life, perhaps. So I offered my services to Zalzan Kavl when I happened to overhear he was in need of an assistant. And here I am. Here you are, said Carabella sourly. Welcome. After a hearty meal, they began their departure. Shalomir led Zalzan Kavl's quartet of mounts from the stable, talking softly and soothingly to the animals as the Skandars tied them into the traces. Zalzan Kavl took the reins. His brother Hytrog sat beside him, with Otifon Deliamber squeezed in alongside. Shalomir, on his own mount, rode alongside. Valentine clambered into the snug, luxurious passenger compartment along with Carabella, Vinorcus, Sleet, and the other four Skandars. There was much rearranging of arms and legs to fit everyone in comfortably. Hoy, Zalzan Kavl cried sharply, and it was off and out, through Falk and Kipgate and eastward down the grand highway on which Valentine had entered Pidwood just a week ago Moonday. Summer's warmth lay heavily on the coastal plain, and the air was thick and moist. Already the spectacular blossoms of the fire-shower palms were beginning to fade and decay, and the road was littered with fallen petals, like a crimson snowfall. The wagon had several windows, thin, tough sheets of stick-skin, the best quality, carefully matched, perfectly transparent. And in an odd, solemn silence, Valentine watched Pidruid dwindle and disappear, that great city of eleven million souls where he had juggled before the coronal, and tasted strange wines and spicy foods, and spent a festival night in the arms of the dark-haired Carabella. And now the road lay open before him, and who knew what travels awaited, what adventures would befall? He was without plan, and open to all plans. He itched to juggle again, to master new skills, to cease being an apprentice, and to join with Sleet and Carabella in the most intricate of maneuvers and perhaps even to juggle with the Skandars themselves. Sleet had warned him about that, that only a master could risk juggling with them, for their double sets of arms gave them an advantage no human could hope to match. But Valentine had seen Sleet and Carabella throwing with the Skandars, and maybe in time he would do so as well. A high ambition, he thought. What more could he ask than to become a master worthy of juggling with Zalz and Kavl and his brothers? Carabella said, You look so happy all of a sudden, Valentine. Do I? Like the sun, radiant, light streams from you. Yellow hair, he said amiably. It gives that illusion. No, no, a sudden smile. He pressed his hand against hers. I was thinking of the road ahead, a free and hearty life, wandering zigzag across Zimruel and stopping to perform and learning new routines. I want to become the best human juggler on Majipur. You stand a good chance, Sleet said. Your natural skills are enormous. You need only the training. For that I count on you and Carabella. Carabella said quietly, And while you were thinking of juggling, Valentine, I was thinking about you. And I about you, he whispered, abashed but I was ashamed to say it aloud. The wagon now had reached the switchbacked ridge road that led upward to the great inland plateau. It climbed slowly. In places the angles of the road were so sharp that the wagon could barely execute the turns. But Zalzan Kavl was as cunning a driver as he was a juggler and brought the vehicle safely around each tight corner. Soon they were at the top of the ridge. Distant Pidruid now looked like a map of itself, flattened and foreshortened, hugging the coast. The air up here was drier but hardly cooler, and in late afternoon the sun unleashed ghastly blasts, a mummifying heat from which there could be no escape before sundown. 
That night they halted in a dusty plateau village along the Falkenkip Road. A disturbing dream came to Valentine again as he lay on a scratchy mattress stuffed with straw. Once more he moved among the powers of Majipur. In a vast, echoing, stone-floored hall the pontifex sat enthroned at one end and the coronal at the other, and set in the ceiling was a terrifying eye of light, like a small sun, that cast a merciless white glare. Valentine bore some message from the Lady of the Isle, but he was unsure whether to deliver it to Pontifex or Coronel, and whichever power he approached receded to infinity as Valentine neared. All night long he trudged back and forth over that cold, slippery floor, reaching hands in supplication toward one power or the other, and always they floated away. He dreamed again of Pontifex and Coronel the next night, in a town on the outskirts of Falkenkip. This was a hazy dream, and Valentine remembered nothing of it except impressions of fearsome royal personages, enormous pompous assemblies, and failures of communication. He awoke with a feeling of deep and aching discontent. Plainly he was receiving dreams of high consequence, but he was helpless to interpret them. The powers obsess you and will not let you rest, Carabella said in the morning. You seem tied to them by unbreakable cords. It isn't natural to dream so frequently of such mighty figures. I think surely these are sendings. Valentine nodded. In the heat of the day I imagine I feel the hands of the king of dreams pressing coldly on my temples, and when I close my eyes his fingers enter my soul. Alarm flashed in Carabella's eyes. Can you be sure they are his sendings? Not sure, no. But I think, perhaps the lady. The lady sends kinder, softer dreams, so I believe, said Valentine. These are sendings of the king, I much fear. But what does he want of me? What crime have I done? She frowned. In Falkenkip, Valentine, take yourself to a speaker as you promised. I'll look for one, yes. Ortefan Deliamber, joining the conversation unexpectedly, said, May I make a recommendation? Valentine had not seen the wizened little rune approach. He looked down, surprised. Pardon, the sorcerer said offhandedly. I happen to overhear. You are troubled by sendings, you think? They could be nothing else. Can you be certain? I'm certain of nothing. Not even of my name, or yours, or the day of the week. Sendings are rarely ambiguous. When the king speaks, or the lady, we know without doubt, Deli Amber said. Valentine shook his head. My mind is clouded these days. I hold nothing sure. But these dreams vex me, and I need answers, though I hardly know how to frame my questions. The Vroon reached up to take Valentine's hand with one of his delicate, intricately branched tentacles. Trust me, your mind may be clouded, but mine is not, and I see you clearly. My name is Deli Amber, and yours is Valentine, and this is five day of the ninth week of summer, and in Falcon Kip is the dream speaker Tisana, who is my friend and ally, and who will help you find your proper path. Go to her and say that I give her greetings and love. Time has come for you to begin to recover from the harm that has befallen you, Valentine. Harm? Harm? What harm is that? Go to Tisana, Deli Amber said firmly. Valentine sought Zalzan Kavl, who was speaking with some person of the village. Eventually the scandal was done, and turned to Valentine, who said, I ask leave to spend star day night apart from the troop, in Falkenkip. Also a matter of family honor, asked Zalzan Kavl sardonically. A matter of private business. May I? The Skandar shrugged an elaborate four-shouldered shrug. There is something strange about you, something troublesome to me. But do as you wish. We perform in Falkenkip anyway, tomorrow. At the market fair. Sleep where you like, but be ready to leave early Sunday morning, eh? Twelve. 
Falkenkip was nothing in the way of being a city to compare with huge, sprawling Pidgewid, but all the same was far from insignificant, a county seat that served as metropolis for a ranching district of great size. Perhaps three-quarters of a million people lived in and about Falkenkip, and five times as many in the outlying countryside. But its pace was different from Pidruid's, Valentine observed. Possibly its location on this dry, hot plateau rather than along the mild and humid coast had something to do with that. But people moved deliberately here, with stolid, unhurried manners. The boy Shanamir made himself scarce on Star Day. He had indeed slipped off secretly the night before to his father's farm some hours north of the city, where, so he told Valentine the next morning, he had left the money he had earned in Pidruid, and a note declaring that he was going off to seek adventure and wisdom, and had managed to get away again without being noticed. But he did not expect his father to take lightly the loss of so skilled and useful a hand, and fearing that municipal proctors would be out in search of him, Shonamir proposed to spend the rest of his stay in Falkenkip, hidden in the wagon. Valentine explained this to Zalzan Kavl, who agreed with his usual acrid grace. That afternoon, at the fair, the jugglers came marching boldly out, Carabella and Sleet leading the way, he banging a drum, she tapping a tambourine and singing a lilting jingle. Spare a royal, spare a crown, gentlefolk, come sit ye down. Astonishment and levity, come and see our jugglery. Spare an inch and spare a mile, gentlefolk, we'll make you smile. Cup and saucer, ball and chair, dancing lightly in the air. Spare a moment, spare a day, and we'll spin your cares away. A moment's time, a coin well spent, will bring you joy and wonderment. But levity and wonderment were far from Valentine's spirit that day, and he juggled poorly. He was tense and uneasy from too many nights of troubled sleep and also was inflamed with ambitions that went beyond his present skills, which led him to overreach himself. Twice he dropped clubs, but Sleet had shown him ways of pretending that that was part of the routine, and the crowd seemed forgiving. Forgiving himself was a harder matter. He crept off sullenly to a wine-stand while the Skandars took the center of the stage. From a distance he watched them working, the six huge, shaggy beings weaving their twenty-four arms in precise and flawless patterns. Each juggled seven knives while constantly throwing and receiving others, and the effect was spectacular, the tension extreme, as the silent interchange of sharp weapons went on and on. The placid burghers of Falkenkip were spellbound. Watching the Skandars, Valentine regretted all the more his own faulty performance. Since Pidruid, he had yearned to go before an audience again. His hands had twitched for the feel of clubs and balls, and he had finally had his moment, and had been clumsy. No matter. There would be other marketplaces, other fairs. All across Zimrowell the troop would wander, year after year, and he would shine. He would dazzle audiences. They would cry out for Valentine the Juggler. They would demand encore after encore until Zalzan Kavl himself looked black with jealousy. A king of jugglers, yes, a monarch, a colonel of performers. Why not? He had the gift. Valentine smiled. His dour mood was lifting. Was it the wine, or his natural good spirits reasserting themselves? He had been at the yard only a week after all, and look what he had achieved already. Who could say what wonders of eye and hand he would perform when he had had a year or two of practice? Orifon Deliamber was at his side. Tisan is to be found in the street of Watermongers, the diminutive sorcerer said. She expects you shortly. Have you spoken to her of me, then? No, said Deliamber. But she expects me. Ha! Huh. Is it by sorcery? Something of that the Vroon said, giving a Vroonish wriggle of the limbs that amounted to a shrug. Go to her soon. Valentine nodded. He looked across. The Skandars were done, and Sleet and Carabella were demonstrating one-arm juggling. How elegantly they moved together, he thought. How calm, how confident they were. How crisp of motion. 
and how beautiful she is. Valentine and Carabella had not been lovers since the night of the festival, though sometimes they had slept side by side. It was a week now, and he had felt aloof and apart from her, though nothing but warmth and support had come from her to him. These dreams were the problem, draining and distracting him. To Tisana, then, for a speaking, and then perhaps tomorrow to embrace Carabella again. The street of watermongers, he said to Deli Amber. Very well. Will there be a sign marking her dwelling? Ask, Deli Amber said. As Valentine set out, the Hjort Vinorkis stepped from behind the wagon and said, Off for a night on the town, are you? An errand, Valentine said. Want some company? The Hjort laughed his coarse, noisy laugh. We could hit a few taverns together, hoy. I wouldn't mind getting away from all this jugglery for a few hours. Uneasily, Valentine said, It's the sort of thing one must do by oneself. Vinorkis studied him a moment. Not too friendly, are you? Please, it's exactly as I said. I must do this alone. I'm not going tavern crawling tonight, believe me. The short shrugged. All right, be like that. See if I care. I just wanted to help you have fun, show you the town, take you to a couple of my favorite places. Another time, said Valentine quickly. He strode off toward Falkenkip. The street of watermongers was easy enough to find. This was an orderly town, no medieval maze like Pidruid, and there were neat and comprehensible city maps posted at every major intersection. But finding the home of the dream speaker Tisana was a slower business, for the street was long and those he asked for directions merely pointed over their shoulders toward the north. He followed along steadfastly, and by early evening reached a small, gray, rough-shingled house in a residential quarter far from the marketplace. It bore on its weather-worn front door two symbols of the powers, the crossed lightning bolts that stood for the King of Dreams, and the triangle within triangle that was the emblem of the Lady of the Isle of Sleep. Tisana was a sturdy woman of more than middle years, heavy-bodied and of unusual height, with a broad, strong face and cool, searching eyes. Her hair, thick and unbound, black streaked with swaths of white, hung far down her shoulders. Her arms, emerging bare from the gray cotton smock that she wore, were solid and powerful, although swinging dewlaps of flesh hung from them. She seemed a person of great strength and wisdom. She greeted Valentine by name and bade him be comfortable in her house. I bring you... As you must already know, the greetings and love of Autophon Deliamber, he said. The dream speaker nodded gravely. He has sent advance word, yes. That rascal. But his love is worth receiving for all his tricks. Convey the same from me to him. She moved around the small dark room, closing draperies, lighting three thick red candles, igniting some incense. There was little furniture, only a high-piled woven rug in tones of gray and black, a venerable wooden table on which the candle stood, and a tall clothes cabinet in antique style. She said as she made her preparations, I've known Deli Amber nearly forty years. Would you believe it? It was in the early days of the reign of Tieverus that we met, at a festival in Pillaplock. When the new coronal came to town, Lord Malibur that drowned on the sea dragon hunt, the little rune was tricky even then. We stood there cheering Lord Malibur in the streets, and Deli Amber said, He'll die before the Pontifex, you know. The way someone might predict rain when the south wind blows. It was a terrible thing to say, and I told him so. Deli Amber didn't care. A strange business when the coronal dies first when the Pontifex lives on and on. How old ye think Tieveras is by now? A hundred? A hundred twenty? I have no idea, said Valentine. Old, very old. He was coronal a long while before he entered the labyrinth, and he's been in there for three coronal reigns. 
Can you imagine? I wonder if he'll outlive Lord Valentine, too. Her eyes came to rest on Valentine's. I suppose Delhi Amber knows that, too. Will you have wine with me now? Yes, Valentine said, uncomfortable with her blunt, outgoing manner, and with the sense she gave him of knowing far more about him than he knew himself. Tisana produced a carven stone decanter and poured two generous drinks, not the spicy fire shower wine of Pidruid, but some darker, thicker vintage, sweet with undertastes of peppermint and ginger and other more mysterious things. He took a quick sip, and then another, and after the second she said casually, It contains the drug, you know. Drug? For the speaking. Oh, of course, yes. His ignorance embarrassed him. Valentine frowned and stared into his goblet. The wine was dark red, almost purple, and its surface gave back his own distorted reflection by candlelight. What was the procedure, he wondered? Was he supposed now to tell his recent dreams to her? Wait and see, wait and see. He drained the drink in quick, uneasy gulps, and immediately the old woman refilled, topping off her own glass, which she had barely touched. She said, A long time since your last speaking. Very long, I'm afraid. Evidently. This is the moment when you give me my fee, you know. You'll find the price somewhat higher than you remember. Valentine reached for his purse. It's been so long that you don't remember. I ask ten crowns now. There are new taxes and other bothers. In Lord Voriax's time it was five. And when I first took up speaking, in the reign of Lord Malabar, I got two or two and a half. Is ten a burden for you? It was a week's pay for him from Zalzan Kavl, above his room and board, but he had arrived in Pidruid with plenty of money in his purse. He knew not how or why, close on sixty royals, and much of that remained. He gave the dream speaker a royal, and she dropped the coin negligently into a green porcelain bowl on the table. He yawned. She was watching him closely. He drank again. She did also and refilled. His mind was growing cloudy. Though it was still early at night, he would soon be sleepy. Come now to the dream rug, she said, blowing out two of the three candles. She pulled off her smock and was naked before him. That was unexpected. Did dream speaking involve some sort of sexual contact with this old woman? Not that she seemed so old now. Her body looked a good twenty years younger than her face. Not a girl's body by any means, but still firm-fleshed, plump but unwrinkled, with heavy breasts and strong, smooth thighs. Perhaps these speakers were some sort of holy prostitutes, Valentine thought. She beckoned to him to undress, and he cast his clothes aside. They lay down together on the thick woolen rug in the half-darkness, and she drew him into her arms. But there was nothing at all erotic about the embrace. More maternal, if anything. An all-enfolding engulfment. He relaxed. His head was against her soft, warm bosom, and it was hard for him to stay awake. The scent of her was strong in his nostrils. A sharp, pleasant aroma like that of the gnarled and ageless needle trees that grew on the high peaks of the north just below the snow line an odor that was crisp and pungent and clean. She said softly, In the kingdom of dreams, the only language spoken is that of truth. Be without fear as we embark together. Valentine closed his eyes. High peaks, yes, just below the snow line. A brisk wind blew across the crags, but he was not at all cold, though his feet were bare against the dry stony soil. A trail lay before him, a steeply sloping path in which broad grey flagstones had been laid to form a gigantic staircase, leading into a mist-wrapped valley, 
and without hesitation Valentine started the descent. He understood that these images were not yet those of his dream, only of the prelude, that he had only begun his night's journey and was still merely on the threshold of sleep. But as he went downward he passed others, making the ascent, figures familiar to him from recent nights, the Pontifex Tieverus with parchment skin and withered face, laboring up the steps in feeble, quavering manner, and Lord Valentine the Coronal, clamoring with bold assertive strides, and dead Lord Voriax, floating serenely just above the steps, and the great warrior coronal Lord Stiamat, out of eight thousand years past, brandishing some mighty staff around the tip of which furious storms swirled. And was this not the Pontifex Ariac, who had resigned the labyrinth six thousand years before to proclaim himself a woman, and become Lady of the Isle of Sleep instead? And this the great ruler Lord Confalum, and the equally great Lord Prestimian who had succeeded him, under whose two long reigns Majipur had attained its peak of wealth and power. And then came Zalzan Kaval with the wizard Deliamber on his back, and Carabella, naked and nut-brown, sprinting with unfailing vigor, and Venorcus, goggling and gaping, and Sleet, juggling balls of fire as he climbed, and Shonamir, and Aliman selling sizzling sausages, and the gentle sweet-eyed lady of the isle, and the old pontifex again, and the coronal, and a platoon of musicians, and twenty hjorts bearing the king of dreams, terrible old Simon and Bajazid, in a golden litter. The mists were thicker down here, the air more dank, and Valentine found his breath coming in short, painful bursts, as though instead of descending from the heights, he had been climbing all the time, working his way by awful struggle above the line of needle-trees, into the bare granite shields of the high mountains, barefoot on burning strands of snow, swaddled in grey blankets of cloud that concealed all of Majipur from him. There was noble, austere music in the heavens now, awesome choirs of brass playing solemn and sombre melodies suitable for the robing ceremony of a coronal. And indeed they were robing him, a dozen crouching servants placing on him the cloak of office and the starburst crown. But he shook his head lightly and brushed them away, and with his own hands he removed the crown and handed it to his brother of the menacing sabre, and shrugged off his fine robes and distributed them in strips to the poor, who used them to make bindings for their feet. And word went out to all the provinces of Majipur that he had resigned his high office and given up all power, and once more he found himself on the flagstone steps, descending the mountain trail, seeking that valley of mists that lay in the unattainable beyond. But why do you go downward? asked Carabella, blocking his path. And he had no answer to that, so that when little Deliamber pointed upward, he shrugged meekly and began a new ascent, through fields of brilliant red and blue flowers, through a place of golden grass and lofty green cedars. He perceived that this was no ordinary peak he had been climbing and descending and climbing anew, but rather Castle Mount itself, that jutted thirty miles into the heavens, and his goal was that bewildering, all-encompassing, ever-expanding structure at its summit, the place where the coronal dwelled, the castle that was called Lord Valentine's Castle, but that had, not long before, been Lord Voriac's castle, and before that Lord Malibor's castle, and other names before that, names of all those mighty princes who had ruled from Castle Mount, each putting his imprint on the growing castle and giving his name to it while he lived there, all the way back to Lord Stiamat, the conqueror of the Metamorphs, he who was the first to dwell on Castle Mount, and built the modest keep out of which all the rest had sprouted. I will regain the castle, Valentine told himself, and I will take up residence. But what was this? Workmen by the thousands, dismantling the enormous edifice. The work of demolition was well under way, and all the outer wings were taken apart, the place of buttresses and arches that Lord Voriax had built, and the grand trophy room of Lord Malabar, and the great library that Tieverus had added in his days as coronal, and much else. All those rooms now mere piles of bricks laid in neat mounds on the slopes of the mount, and they were working inward toward more ancient wings, 
to the garden house of Lord Confalum, and the armory of Lord Decorate, and the archive vault of Lord Prestimian, removing those places brick by brick by brick, like locusts sweeping over the fields at harvest time. Wait, Valentine cried. No need to do this. I am back. I will take up my robes and crown once again. But the work of destruction continued, and it was as if the castle were made of sand and the tides were sweeping in, and a gentle voice said, Too late, too late, much too late. And the watchtower of Lord Ariac was gone, and the parapets of Lord Thimmon were gone, and the observatory of Lord Kinnikin was gone, with all its star-watching apparatus. And Castle Mount itself was shuddering and swaying as the removal of the castle disrupted its equilibrium. And workmen now were running frantically with bricks in their hands, seeking flat places on which to stack them. And a dread eternal night had come, and baleful stars swelled and writhed in the sky. And the machineries that held back the chill of space atop Castle Mount were failing, so that the warm, mild air was flowing moonward. And there was sobbing in the depths of the planet, and Valentine stood amid the scenes of disruption and gathering chaos, holding forth outstretched fingers to the darkness. The next thing he knew, morning light was in his eyes, and he blinked and sat up, confused, wondering what in this was and what he had been doing the night before, for he lay naked on a thick woolly rug in a warm, strange room, and there was an old woman moving about, brewing tea. Perhaps? Yes, the dream speaker Tisana. And this was Falkenkip, in the street of Watermongers. His nakedness discomforted him. He rose and dressed quickly. Tisana said, Drink this. I'll put some breakfast up, now that you're finally awake. He looked dubiously at the mug she handed him. Tea, she said. Nothing but tea. The time for dreaming is long past. Valentine sipped at it while she bustled around the small kitchen. There was a numbness in his spirit, as though he had caroused himself into insensibility and now had a reckoning to pay. And he knew there had been strange dreams, a whole night of them. But yet he felt none of the malaise of the soul that he had known upon awakening these past few mornings, only that numbness. A curious, centered calmness, almost an emptiness. Was that the purpose of visiting a dream speaker? He understood so little. He was like a child loose in this vast and complex world. They ate in silence. Tisana seemed to be studying Valentine intently across the table. Last night she had chattered much before the drug had had its effect. But now she seemed subdued, reflective, almost withdrawn, as if she needed to be apart from him while preparing to speak his dream. At length she cleared the dishes and said, How do you feel? Quiet within? Good, good, that's important. To go away from a dream speaker in turmoil is a waste of money. I had no doubts, though. Your spirit is strong. Is it? Stronger than you know. Reverses that would crush an ordinary person leave you untouched. You shrug off disaster and whistle in the face of danger. You speak very generally, Valentine said. I am an oracle, and oracles are never terribly specific, she replied lightly. Are my dream sendings? Will you tell me that at least? She was thoughtful a moment. I am uncertain. But you share them. Aren't you able to know at once if a dream comes from the lady or the king? Peace, peace, this is not so simple, she said, waving a palm at him. Your dreams are not sendings of the lady, this I know. Then if they are sendings, they are of the king. Here is the uncertainty. They have an aura of the king about them in some way, yes, but not the aura of sendings. I know you find that hard to fathom. So do I. I do believe the king of dreams watches your doings and is concerned with you. But it doesn't seem to me that he's been entering your sleep. It confounds me. Has anything like this been known to you before? 
The dream speaker shook her head. Not at all. Is this my speaking, then? Only more mysteries and unanswered questions? You haven't had the speaking yet, Tisana answered. Forgive my impatience. No forgiveness is needed. Come, give me your hands, and I'll make a speaking for you. She reached for him across the table, and grasped and held him, and after a long while said, You have fallen from a high place, and now you must begin to climb back to it. He grinned. A high place? The highest. The highest place on Majapur, he said lightly, is the summit of Castlemount. Is that where you would have me climb? There. Yes. A very steep ascent you lay upon me. I could spend my entire life reaching and climbing that place. Nevertheless, Lord Valentine, that ascent awaits you, and it is not I who lays it on you. He gasped at her use of the royal title to him, and then burst out laughing at the grossness of it, the tastelessness of her joke. Lord Valentine! Lord Valentine! No, you do me far too much honor, Madame Tisana. Not Lord Valentine, only Valentine. Valentine the juggler is all, the newest of the troop of Zals and Kavl the Skandar. Her gaze rested steadily on him. Quietly, she said, I beg your pardon. I meant no offense. How could it offend me? But put no royal titles on me, please. A juggler's life is royal enough for me, even if my dreams may sometimes be high-flown ones. Her eyes did not waver. Will you have more tea, she asked. I promised the Skandar I'd be ready for departure early in the morning, and so I must leave soon. What else does the speaking hold for me? The speaking is over, said Tisana. Valentine had not expected that. He was awaiting interpretations, analysis, exegesis, counsel, and all he had had from her. I have fallen, and I must climb back on high. That's all you tell me for a royal? Fees for everything grow larger nowadays, she said without rancor. Do you feel cheated? Not at all. This has been valuable for me in its fashion. Politely said, but false. Nevertheless, you have received value here. Time will make that clear to you. She got to her feet and Valentine rose with her. There was about her an aura of confidence and strength. I wish you a good journey, she said, and a safe ascent. Thirteen Ottofan Deliamber was the first to greet him when he returned from the dream-speaking. In the quiet of dawn the little Vroon was practicing a sort of juggling near the wagon with shards of some glittering, icy-bright crystalline substance. But this was wizard juggling, for Deli Amber only pretended to throw and catch, and appeared actually to be moving the shards by power of mind alone. He stood beneath the brilliant cascade, and the shimmering slivers coursed through the air in a circle above him like a wreath of bright light, remaining aloft although Deli Amber never touched them. As Valentine approached, the Vroon gave a twitch of his tentacle tips, and the glassy shards fell instantly inward to form a close-packed bundle that Deliamber snatched deftly from the air. He held them forth to Valentine. Pieces of a temple building from the gay rug city of Dulon, that lies a few days' journey east of here. A place of magical beauty it is. Have you been there? The enigmas of the dream-speaking night still lay heavy on Valentine and he had no taste for Deli Amber's flamboyant spirit this early in the morning. Shrugging, he said, I don't remember. You'd remember if you had. A city of light, a city of frozen and poetry. The Vroon's beak clacked, a Vroonish sort of smile. Or perhaps you wouldn't remember. I suppose not. So much is lost to you. But you'll be there again soon enough. Again? I never was there. 
If you were there once, you'll be there again when we get there. If not, not. However it may be for you, Dulon is our next stop, so says our beloved Skandar. Deli Amber's mischievous eyes probed Valentine's. I see you learned a great deal at Tisana's. Let me be, Deli Amber. She's a marvel, isn't she? Valentine attempted to go past. I learned nothing there, he said tightly. I wasted an evening. Oh, no, no, no. Time is never wasted. Give me your hand, Valentine. The rune's dry, rubbery tentacles slipped around Valentine's reluctant fingers. Solemnly, Deli Amber said, Know this, and know it well. Time is never wasted. Wherever we go, whatever we do, everything is an aspect of education, even when we don't immediately grasp the lesson. Tisana told me approximately the same thing as I was leaving, Valentine murmured sullenly. I think you two are in conspiracy. But what did I learn? I dreamed again of coronals and pontifexes. I climbed up and down mountain trails. The dream speaker made a silly, tiresome joke on my name. I rid myself of a royal better spent on wine and feasting. No, I achieved nothing. He attempted to withdraw his hand from Deli Amber's grip, but the vroon held him with unexpected strength. Valentine felt an odd sensation, as of a chord of somber music rolling through his mind. And somewhere beneath the surface of his consciousness, an image glimmered and flashed, like some sea dragon stirring and sounding in the depths. But he was unable to perceive it clearly. The core of the meaning eluded him. Just as well, he feared to know what was stirring down there. An obscure and incomprehensible anguish flooded his soul. For an instant it seemed to him that the dragon in the depths of his being was rising was swimming upward through the murk of his clouded memory toward the levels of awareness. That frightened him. Knowledge, terrifying and menacing knowledge, was hidden within him, and now was threatening to break loose. He resisted. He fought. He saw little Deli Amber staring at him with terrible intensity, as if trying to lend him the strength he needed to accept that dark knowledge. But Valentine would not have it. He pulled his hand free with sudden violent force and went lurching and stumbling toward the Skandar wagon. His heart was pounding fiercely. His temples throbbed. He felt weak and dizzy. After a few uncertain steps, he turned and said angrily, What did you do to me? I merely touched my hand to yours and gave me great pain. I may have given you access to your own pain, said Deli Amber quietly. Nothing more than that. The pain is carried within you. You have been unable to feel it, but it's struggling to awaken within you, Valentine. There's no preventing it. I mean to prevent it. You have no choice but to heed the voices from within. The struggle has already begun. Valentine shook his aching head. I want no pain and no struggles. I've been a happy man this last week. Are you happy when you dream? These dreams will pass from me soon. They must be sendings intended for someone else. Do you believe that, Valentine? Valentine was silent. After a moment, he said, I want only to be allowed to be what I want to be. And that is? A wandering juggler, a free man. Why do you torment me this way, Deli Amber? I would gladly have you be a juggler, the Vroon said gently. I mean you no sorrow. But what one wants often has little connection with what may be marked out for one on the great scroll. I will be a master juggler, said Valentine, and nothing more than that, and nothing less. I wish you well, Deli Amber said courteously, and walked away. Slowly Valentine let his breath escape. His entire body was tense and stiff, and he squatted and put his head down, stretching out first his arms and then his legs, trying to rid himself of these strange knots that had begun to invade him. Gradually he relaxed a little. 
but some residue of uneasiness remained, and the tension would not leave him. These tortured dreams, these squirming dragons in his soul, these portents and omens. Carabella emerged from the wagon and stood above him as he stretched and twisted. Let me help, she said, crouching down beside him. She pushed him forward until he lay sprawled flat, and her powerful fingers dug into the taut muscles of his neck and back. Under her ministrations he grew somewhat less tense, yet his mood remained dark and troubled. The speaking didn't help you, she asked softly. No. Can you talk about it? I'd rather not, he said. Whatever you prefer. But she waited expectantly, her eyes alert, shining with warmth and compassion. He said, I barely understood the things the woman was telling me, and what I understood I can't accept, but I don't want to talk about it. Whenever you do, Valentine, I'm here. Whenever you feel the need to tell someone. Not right now. Perhaps never. He sensed her reaching toward him, eager to heal the pain in his soul as she had grappled with the tensions in his body. He could feel the love flooding from her to him. Valentine hesitated. He did battle within himself. Haltingly, he said, The things the speaker told me. Yes. No. To talk of these things was to give them reality. And they had no reality. They were absurdities. They were fantasies. They were foolish vapors. Well, nonsense, Valentine said. What she said isn't worth discussing. Carabella's eyes reproached him. He looked away from her. Can you accept that, he asked roughly. She was a crazy old woman and she told me a lot of nonsense. And I don't want to discuss it, not with you, not with anyone. It was my speaking. I don't have to share it. I... He saw the shock on her face. In another moment he would be babbling. He said in an entirely different tone of voice, Get the juggling balls, Carabella. Now? Right now. But I want you to teach me the exchange between jugglers, the passing of the balls. Please. We are due to leave in half an hour. Please, he said urgently. She nodded and sprinted up the steps of the wagon, returning a moment later with the balls. They moved apart, to an open place where they would have room, and Carabella flipped three of the balls to him. She was frowning. What's wrong, he asked. Learning new techniques when the mind is troubled is never a good idea. It might calm me, he said. Let's try. As you wish. She began to juggle the three balls she held, by way of warming up. Valentine imitated her, but his hands were cold, his fingers unresponsive, and he had trouble doing this simplest of all routines, dropping the balls several times. Carabella said nothing. She continued to juggle while he launched one abortive cascade after another. His temper grew edgy. She would not tell him again that this was the wrong moment for attempting such things. But her silence, her look, even her stance, all said it more forcefully than words. Valentine desperately sought to strike a rhythm. You have fallen from a high place, he heard the dream speaker saying, and now you must begin to climb back to it. He bit his lip. How could he concentrate with such things intruding? Hand and eye, he thought, hand and eye, forget all else. Hand and I. Nevertheless, Lord Valentine, that ascent awaits you, and it is not I who lays it on you. No, 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 no. His hands shook. His fingers were rods of ice. He made a false move and the balls went scattering. Please, Valentine, Carabella said mildly. Get the clubs. It'll be even worse with them. Do you want to break a finger? The clubs, he said. Shrugging, she gathered up the balls and went into the wagon. Sleet emerged, yawned, nodded a casual greeting to Valentine. 
The morning was beginning. One of the Skandars appeared and crawled under the wagon to adjust something. Carabella came out bearing six clubs. Behind her was Shanamir, who gave Valentine a quick salute and went to feed the mounts. Valentine took the clubs. Conscious of Sleet's cool eyes on him, he put himself into the juggling position, threw one club high, and botched the catch. No one spoke. Valentine tried again. He managed to get the three clubs into sequence, but for no more than thirty seconds, then they spilled, one landing unpleasantly on his toe. Valentine caught sight of Ottofon Deliamber watching the scene from a distance. He picked up the clubs again. Carabella facing him, patiently juggled her three, studiously ignoring him. Valentine threw the clubs, got them started, dropped one, started again, dropped two, started yet again, made a faulty grab and bent his left thumb badly out of place. He tried to pretend that nothing had gone wrong. Once more he picked up the clubs, but this time Sleet came over and took Valentine lightly by both wrists. Not now, he said. Give me the clubs. I want to practice. Juggling isn't therapy. You're upset about something and it's ruining your timing. If you keep this up, you can do damage to your rhythms that will take you weeks to undo. Valentine tried to pull free, but Sleet held him with surprising strength. Carabella, impassive, went on juggling a few feet away. After an instant, Valentine yielded. With a shrug, he surrendered the clubs to Sleet, who scooped them up and took them back into the wagon. A moment later, Zalzenkavl stepped outside, elaborately scratched his pelt fore and aft with several of his hands as though searching in it for fleas, and boomed, Everybody in! Let's move it along! Fourteen the road to the gay rog city of Dulorne took them eastward through lush, placid farming country, green and fertile under the eye of the summer sun. Like much of Majipur, this was densely populated terrain, but intelligent planning had created wide agricultural zones bordered by busy strip cities, and so the day went through an hour's worth of farms, an hour's worth of town, an hour of farms, an hour of town. Here in the Dulorne Rift, the broad, sloping lowland east of Falkenkip, the climate was particularly suited for farming, for the rift was open at its northern end to the polar rainstorms that constantly drenched Majipur's temperate arctic, and the subtropical heat was made moderate by gentle, predictable precipitation. The growing season lasted year-round. This was the time for harvesting the sweet yellow stagia tubers, from which a bread was made, and for planting such fruits as nyik and glein. The beauty of the landscape lightened Valentine's bleak outlook. By easy stages he ceased to think about things that did not bear thinking about, and allowed himself to enjoy the unending procession of wonders that was the planet of Majipur. The black slender trunks of Nyik trees planted in rigid and complex geometrical patterns danced against the horizon. Teams of short and human farmers in rural costumes moved like invading armies across the Stadja fields, plucking the heavy tubers. Now the wagon glided quietly through a district of lakes and streams, and now through one where curious blocks of white granite jutted tooth-fashion from the smooth grassy plains. At midday they entered a place of particularly strange beauty, one of the many public forest preserves. At the gateway a sign glowing with green luminosity proclaimed, Bladder Tree Preserve. Located here is an outstanding virgin tract of Dulorne bladder tree. These trees manufacture lighter-than-air gases, which keep their upper branches buoyant. As they approach maturity, their trunks and root systems atrophy, and they become epiphytic in nature, dependent almost entirely on the atmosphere for nourishment. Occasionally, in extreme old age, a tree will sever its contact with the ground entirely and drift off to found a new colony far away. Bladder trees are found both in Zimrowell and in Alhamrowell, but have become rare in recent times. This grove set aside for the people of Majipur by official decree 
Twelfth Pontifex Confolum, Coronal Lord Prestimian. The jugglers followed the forest trail silently on foot for some minutes without seeing anything unusual. Then Carabella, who led the way, passed through a thicket of dense blue-black bushes and cried out suddenly in surprise. Valentine ran to her side. She was standing in wonder in the midst of marvels. Bladder trees were everywhere, in all stages of their growth. The young ones, no higher than Deliamber or Carabella, were curious, ungainly-looking shrublets with thick, swollen branches of a peculiar silvery hue that emerged at awkward angles from squat, fleshy trunks. But in trees fifteen or twenty feet tall, the trunks had begun to attenuate and the limbs to inflate, so that now the bulging boughs appeared top-heavy and precarious. And in even older trees, the trunks had shriveled to become nothing more than rough, scaly guy ropes by which the tree's buoyant crowns were fastened to the ground. High overhead they floated and bobbed in the gentlest breeze, leafless, turgid, the branches puffed up like balloons. The silvery color of the young branches became, in maturity, a brilliant translucent gleam, so that the trees seemed like glass models of themselves, shining brightly in the shafts of sunlight through which they danced and weaved. Even Zalz and Carvel seemed moved by the strangeness and beauty of the trees. The Skandar approached one of the tallest, its gleaming swollen crown floating far overhead, and carefully, almost reverently, encircled its top narrow stem with his fingers. Valentine thought Zalz and Carvel might be minded to snap the stem and send the bladder tree floating away like a glittering kite. But no, the Skandar seemed merely to be marking the slenderness of the stem, and after a moment he stepped back, muttering to himself. For a long while they wandered among the bladder trees, studying the little ones, observing the stages of growth, the gradual narrowing of the trunks and bloating of the limbs. The trees were leafless and no flowers were apparent. It was difficult to believe that they were vegetable creations at all. So vitreous did they seem. It was a place of magic. The darkness of his earlier mood now seemed a mystery to Valentine. On a planet where such beauty abounded, how could one have any need for brooding or fretting? Here, Carabella called. Catch! She had gauged the change in his spirits, and had gone to the wagon for the juggling balls. Now she threw three of them to him, and he went easily into the basic cascade and she the same, in a clearing surrounded by glistening bladder trees. Carabella stood facing him, just a few feet away. They juggled independently for three or four minutes, until a symmetry of phase encompassed them and they were throwing in identical rhythms. Now they juggled together, mirroring one another, Valentine feeling a deeper calmness settling over him with each cycle of throws. He was balanced, centered, tuned. The bladder trees, stirring lightly in the wind, showered him with dazzles of refracted light. The world was silent and serene. When I tell you, Carabella said quietly, throw the ball from your right hand to my left, at precisely the height you'd throw it if you were giving it to yourself. One, two, three, four, five, pass! And on pass, he threw to her on a firm straight arc, and she to him. He managed, just barely, to catch the incoming ball and work it into the rhythm, continuing his own cascade, and counting off until it was time to pass again. Back, forth, back, forth, pass. It was hard at first, the hardest juggling he had ever done, but yet he could do it. He was doing it without blundering, and after the first few passes, he was doing it without awkwardness, smoothly exchanging throws with Carabella as though he had practiced this routine with her for months. He knew that this was extraordinary, that no one was supposed to master intricate patterns like this on the first try. But as before, he moved swiftly toward the core of the experience, placed himself in a region where nothing existed but hand and eye and the moving balls, and failure became not merely impossible, but inconceivable. 
Hoy, Sleet cried, over here now. He too was juggling. Momentarily, Valentine was baffled by this multiplication of the task, but he forced himself to remain in automatic mode, to throw when it seemed appropriate, to catch what came to him, and constantly to keep the balls that remained to him moving between his hands. So when Sleet and Carabella began to exchange balls, he was able to stay in the pattern and catch from Sleet instead of Carabella. One, two, one, two, Sleet called, taking up a position between Valentine and Carabella, and making himself the leader of the group, feeding the balls first to one, then to the other, in a rhythm that remained rock-steady for a long while, and then accelerated comically to a pace far beyond Valentine's abilities. Suddenly there were dozens of balls in the air, or so it seemed, and Valentine grasped wildly at all of them, and lost them all and collapsed, laughing, onto the warm, springy turf. "'So there are some limits to your skill, eh?' Sleet said gaily. "'Good, good. I was beginning to wonder whether you were mortal.' Valentine chuckled. "'Mortal enough, I fear.' "'Lunch,' Deli Amber called. He presided over a pot of stew hanging from a tripod above a glow-globe. The Skandars, who had been doing some practice of their own in another part of the grove, appeared as if conjured from the soil, and helped themselves with ungracious eagerness. Vinorcus, too, was quick to fill his plate. Valentine and Carabella were the last to be served, but he hardly cared. He was sweating the good sweat of exertion well exerted, and his blood was pounding and his skin was tingling, and his long night of unsettling dreams seemed far behind him, something he had left in Falcon Kip. All that afternoon the wagon sped eastward. This was definitely gay rug country now, inhabited almost exclusively by that glossy-skinned reptilian-looking race. When nightfall came, the troop was still half a day's journey from the provincial seat at Dulorne where Zalz and Kabul had arranged some sort of theatrical booking. Deli Amber announced that a country inn lay not far ahead, and they went on until they came to it. Share my bed, Carabella said to Valentine. In the corridor going to their chamber they passed Deli Amber, who paused a moment, touching their hands with tentacle tips and murmuring, Dream well. Dream well, Carabella repeated automatically. But Valentine did not offer the customary response with her, for the touch of the Vroon sorcerer's flesh to his had set the dragon stirring within his soul again, and he was disquieted and grave, as he had been before the miracle of the bladder tree grove. It was as though Deli Amber had appointed himself the enemy of Valentine's tranquillity, arousing in him inarticulate fears and apprehensions against which he had no defense. Come. Valentine muttered hoarsely to Carabella. In a hurry, are you? She laughed a light, tinkling laugh, but it died away quickly when she saw his expression. Valentine, what is it? What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing? May I be allowed moods as other human beings sometimes have? When your face changes like that, it's like a shadow passing over the sun, and so suddenly... Something about Deli Amber, Valentine said, disturbs and alarms me. When he touched me, Deli Amber's harmless, mischievous like all wizards, especially vrunish ones, especially small ones. There's dark mischief in very small people. But you have nothing to fear from Deli Amber. Truly so? He closed the door, and she was in his arms. Truly, she said. You have nothing to fear from anyone, Valentine. Everyone who sees you loves you. There's no one who would injure you in this world. How good to believe that, he said, as she drew him down on the bed. They embraced, and his lips touched hers gently, and then with more force, and soon their bodies were entwined. He had not made love with her for over a week and he had looked forward to it with intense longing and delight. But the incident in the hallway had robbed him of desire, had left him numb and isolated, and that mystified and depressed him. 
Carabella must have sensed the coolness in him, but evidently she chose to ignore it, for her lithe, energetic body sought his with fervor and passion. He forced himself to respond, and then after a minute he was no longer forcing, was nearly as enthusiastic as she. But still he stood outside his own sensations, a mere spectator as they made love. It was over quickly, and the light was out, although moonlight entering their window cast a harsh, chilly glow over their faces. Dream well, Carabella murmured. Dream well, he replied. She was asleep almost at once. He held her, keeping her warm, slim body close against him, feeling no sleepiness himself. After a time he rolled away and drew himself into his favorite sleep position, on his back, arms folded across his chest. But no sleep came, only fitful, dreamless dozing. He diverted himself by counting blades, by imagining himself juggling in patterns of surpassing intricacy with Sleet and Carabella, by trying to relax his entire body one muscle at a time. Nothing worked. Wide awake, he propped himself on one arm and lay looking down at Carabella, lovely in the moonlight. She was dreaming. A muscle flickered in her cheek. Her eyes moved beneath their lids. Her breasts rose and fell in jagged rhythms. She put her knuckles to her lips, murmured something in a thick, unintelligible voice, drew her knees tightly to her chest. Her lean, bare form looked so beautiful that Valentine wanted to reach out to her, to stroke her cool thighs, to touch his lips lightly to her small, rigid nipples. But no, it was uncouth to interrupt a dreamer. It was an unforgivable breach of civility. So he was content to watch her, and to love her from afar, and to savor the reawakened desire that he felt. Carabella cried out in terror. Her eyes opened, but she saw nothing, the sign of ascending. A shudder went rippling the length of her body. She trembled and turned to him, still asleep, still dreaming, and he held her while she whimpered and moaned, giving her dream service, dream comfort, protecting her against the darkness of the spirit by the strength of his arms. And at last the fury of her dream ran its course and she relaxed, limp, sweat-soaked against his chest. She lay still for some moments, until Valentine thought she had fallen peacefully asleep. No, she was awake, but motionless, as if contemplating her dream, confronting it, trying to carry it upward into the realm of wakefulness. Suddenly she sat upright and gasped and covered her mouth with her hand. Her eyes were wild and glassy. My Lord! she whispered. She backed away from him, scuttling across the bed in a strange crab-like crawl, holding one arm folded above her breasts and the other as a kind of shield across her face. Her lips were quivering. Valentine reached for her, but she pulled away in horror and threw herself to the rough wooden floor where she crouched in an eerie huddle, folded inward on herself as if trying to conceal her nakedness. Carabella, he said, bewildered. She looked up at him. Lord, Lord, please, let me be, Lord, and bowed again, and made the starburst with her fingers, the two-handed gesture of obeisance that one makes only when one comes before the coronal. Fifteen. Wondering whether it might be he and not she that had been dreaming, and the dream still going on, Valentine rose found a robe for Carabella to wear, put on one of his own garments. Still she crouched apart from him, stunned and shattered. When he tried to comfort her, she pulled away, huddling still deeper into herself. What is it, he asked? What happened, Carabella? I dreamed... I dreamed that you were... She faltered. So real, so terrible... Tell me. I'll speak your dream for you if I can. It needs no speaking. It speaks of itself. She made the starburst sign at him again. In a cold, low, inflectionless voice, she said, 
I had dreamed that you were the true coronal Lord Valentine, that had been robbed of your power and all your memory, and set into another's body, and turned loose near Pidruid to roam and live an idle life, while someone else ruled in your stead. Valentine felt himself at the edge of a great abyss, and the ground crumbling beneath his feet. Was this ascending, he asked? It was ascending. I know not from whom, lady or king, but it was no dream of mine. It was something that was placed in my mind from outside. I saw you, Lord. Stop calling me that. Atop Castle Mount, and your face was the face of the other Lord Valentine, the dark-haired one we juggled for. And then you came down from the mount to travel on the grand processional in all the lands. And while you were in the south, in my own city of Tillamon it was, they gave you a drug and seized you in your sleep, and changed you into this body and cast you out. And no one was the wiser that you had been magicked out of your royal powers. And I have touched you, Lord, and shared your bed, and been familiar with you in a thousand ways. And how will I be forgiven, Lord? Carabella? She cowered and trembled. Look up, Carabella, look at me. She shook her head. He knelt before her and touched his hand to her chin. She shuddered as though he had marked her with acid. Her muscles were rigid. He touched her again. Raise your head, he said gently. Look at me. She looked up, slowly, timidly, the way one might look into the face of the sun, fearing the brightness. He said, I am Valentine the juggler and nothing more. No, Lord. The coronal is a dark-haired man, and my hair is golden. I beg you, Lord, let me be. You frighten me. A wandering juggler frightens you. It is not who you are that frightens me. The person you are is a friend I have come to love. It is who you have been, Lord. You have stood beside the Pontifex and tasted the royal wine. You have walked in the highest rooms of Castlemount. You have known the fullest power of the world. It was a true dream, Lord. It was as clear and real as anything I have ever seen, ascending beyond doubt, not to be questioned. And you are rightful carnal, and I have touched your body, and you have touched mine, and it is sacrilege a thousand times over for an ordinary woman like me to approach a carnal so closely, and I will die for it. Valentine smiled. If I was ever coronal, love, it was in another body, and there's nothing holy about the one you embrace tonight. But I was never coronal. Her gaze rested squarely on him. Her tone was less quavering as she said, You remember nothing of your life before Pidruid. You were unable to tell me your father's name. And you told me of your childhood in Nimoya, and didn't believe it yourself. And you guessed at a name for your mother. Is this not true? Valentine nodded. And Shanamir has told me you had much money in your purse, but had no idea what any of it was worth, and tried to pay a sausage man with a fifty royal piece. True. He nodded again. As though you had lived all your life at court, perhaps, and never handled money. You know so little, Valentine. You have to be taught like a child. Something has happened to my memory, yes. But does that make me coronal? The way you juggle so naturally, as though all skills are yours if you want them. The way you move, the way you hold yourself, the radiance that comes from you, the sense you give everyone that you were born to hold power. Do I give that? We have talked of little else since you came among us. That you must be a fallen prince, some exiled duke, perhaps. But then my dream, it leaves no doubt, Lord. Her face was white with strain. For a moment she had overcome her awe, but only for a moment. And now she trembled again. And the awe was contagious, it seemed, for Valentine himself began to feel fear, a coldness of the skin. Was there truth in any of this? 
Was he an anointed coronal that had touched hands with Tieverus in the heart of the labyrinth and at the summit of Castle Mount? He heard the voice of the dream speaker Tisana. You have fallen from a high place, and now you must begin to climb back to it, she had said. Impossible! Unthinkable! Nevertheless, Lord Valentine, that ascent awaits you, and it is not I who lays it on you. Unreal! Impossible! And yet his dreams, that brother who would have slain him, and whom he had slain instead, and those coronals and pontifexes moving through the chambers of his soul, and all the rest, could it be? Impossible! Impossible! He said, You mustn't fear me, Carabella. She shivered. He reached for her, and she shied away, crying, No! Don't touch me, my lord! Tenderly, he said, Even if I was once coronal, and how strange and foolish that sounds to me, even if, Carabella, I am coronal no longer, I am not in any anointed body, and what has taken place between us is no sacrilege. I am Valentine the juggler now, whoever I may have been in a former life. You don't understand, Lord. I understand that a coronal is a man like any other, only he bears more responsibilities than others. But there is nothing magical about him and nothing to fear except his power, and I have none of that, if ever I had. No, she said, a coronal is touched by the highest grace, and it never goes from him. Any one can be coronal, given the right training and the right cast of mind. One isn't bred for it. Coronals have come from every district of Majipur, every level of society. Lord, you don't understand. To have been coronal is to be touched by grace. You have ruled. You have walked on Castle Mount. You have been adopted into the line of Lord Stiermat and Lord Decorate and Lord Prestimian. You are brother to Lord Voriax. You are the son of the Lady of the Isle. And I am to think of you as an ordinary man? I am to have no fear of you? He stared at her in shock. He remembered what had gone through his own mind when he stood in the streets and beheld Lord Valentine the Colonel in the procession, and had felt himself in the presence of grace and might, and had realized that to be coronal was to become a being set apart, a personage of aura and strangeness, one who holds power over twenty billions, who carries in himself the energies of thousands of years of famed princes who was destined to go on to the labyrinth one day and wear the authority of the pontifex. Incomprehensible as all this was to him, it was sinking in, and he was dumbfounded and overwhelmed by it. But it was absurd. To fear himself? To sink down in awe at his own imaginary majesty? He was Valentine the juggler and nothing more. Carabella was sobbing. In another moment she would be hysterical. The Vroon surely would have some sleeping potion that would give her ease. Wait, Valentine said. I'll be back in a moment. I'll ask Deli Amber for something to calm you. He darted from the room down the hall, wondering which room was the sorcerer's. All doors were closed. He debated knocking at random, hoping not to blunder in on Zalzan Kavl when a dry voice said out of the darkness from a point somewhere below his elbow, Do you have trouble sleeping? Deli Amber? Here, close by you. Valentine peered, narrowing his eyes, and made out the Vroon sitting cross-tentacled in the hallway in some kind of posture of meditation. Deli Amber rose. I thought you might come in search of me soon, he said. Carabella has had ascending. She needs a drug to quiet her spirit. Do you have anything useful? No drugs, no. A touch, though. It can be done. Come. The little rune glided along the corridor and into the room that Valentine shared with Carabella. She had not moved, still huddled pitifully beside the bed with her robe wrapped carelessly about her. Deli Amber went to her at once. 
His ropey tendrils delicately enfolded her shoulders, and she loosened her tautly held muscles and slumped as though rendered boneless. The sound of her heavy breathing was loud in the room. After a moment she looked up, calmer now, but still with a dazed, frozen look in her eyes. She gestured toward Valentine and said, I dreamed that he was, that he had been. She hesitated. I know, said Deli Amber. It is not true, Valentine said thickly. I am only a juggler. Mildly, Deli Amber said, You are only a juggler now. You believe this nonsense too? It was obvious from the first. When you stepped between the Skandar and me, this is the act of a king, I told myself, and I read your soul. What? A professional trick. I read your soul and saw what had been done to you. But such a thing is impossible, Valentine protested. To take a man's mind from his body and put it in another's, and put another's mind in his. Impossible? No, Deli Amber said. I think not. There have been tales coming out of Suvrail that studies into this art are being done at the court of the King of Dreams. For several years now the rumors of strange experiments have trickled forth. Valentine stared sullenly at his fingertips. It could not be done. So I thought too when first I heard it. But then I considered. There are many wizardries nearly as great whose secrets I myself know, and I am only a minor wizard. The seeds of such an art have long existed. Maybe some Suvrailu sorcerer has found a way to germinate those seeds at last. Valentine, if I were you, I would not reject the possibility. A change of bodies, Valentine said, bewildered. This is not my true body. Whose would it be, then? Who knows? Some unlucky man struck down by accident, drowned, perhaps, or choked on a piece of meat, or the victim of some evil toadstool unwisely eaten, dead anyway in some manner that left his body reasonably whole, and taken within the hour of death to some secret place, there to have the coronal soul transplanted into the empty shell, and then another man giving up his own body forever quickly taking possession of the coronal's vacated skull, possibly retaining much of the coronal's own memory and mind in union with his own, so that he can carry on the masquerade of ruling as though he were the true monarch. I accept none of this as remotely real, said Valentine stubbornly. Nevertheless, Teleamber said, when I looked into your soul I saw everything even as I describe it to you now, and felt more than a little fear. In my trade one doesn't often meet coronals, or stumble on such evidence of gross treason. And I took a moment to compose myself, and asked myself if I would not be wiser to forget what then I knew that I could not, that I would be whipped with monstrous dreams until the end of my days if I ignored what I knew. I told myself that there is much in the world that is in need of repair. Valentine said, There is nothing to it. For the sake of argument, say that there is, Deli Amber urged. Pretend that they came upon you, what would you do then? Nothing at all. No, nothing, said Valentine forcefully. Let him be coronal who wants to be coronal. I think power is there now, and nothing in my being impels me to go back there. I'm a juggler and a good one getting better, and a happy man. Is the coronal happy? Is the pontifex very destined? Destined? Valentine laughed. Just as fair to say that I was destined to be coronal a little while, and then to be displaced by so fitting. One must be crazy to be a ruler, Deli Amber, and I'm sane. The government is a burden and a chore. I would not accept it. You will, Deli Amber said. You've been tampered with, and you are not yourself. But once a coronal, forever a coronal. You will be healed and come into your own again. Angrily shook the suggestion away. He looked toward Carabella. She was asleep on the floor, head against the bed. 
Carefully he lifted her and put her under the coverlet. To Deli Amber he said, It grows late and there's been much foolishness tonight. My head hurts from all this heavy talk. Do to me what you did to her, wizard, and grant me sleep, and say no more to me of responsibilities that have never been mine and are never going to be mine. We must perform tomorrow, and I want to be rested for it. Very well. Get into bed. Valentine settled in beside Carabella. The rune touched him lightly. Then with more force, and Valentine felt his mind growing cloudy. Sleep came upon him easily, like a thick white mist sweeping up out of the ocean at twilight. Good. Good. Willingly he relinquished consciousness. And in the night he dreamed, and there was about the dream a bright, fierce glow that had the unmistakable aspect of ascending, for it was a dream vivid beyond imagining. He saw himself crossing the harsh and terrible purple plain that he had visited so often in recent slumber. This time he knew without question where the plain was. No realm of fantasy, but the distant continent of Suvrael, that lay beneath the unshielded glare of the naked sun. And these fissures in the ground were scars of summer, where what little moisture the soil contained had been sucked forth. Ugly, twisted plants with swollen, grayish leaves lay limp against the ground, and things with thorns and weird, angular joints grew tall. Valentine walked swiftly, in the heat and the merciless biting wind and the skin-cracking dryness. He was late, overdue at the palace of the King of Dreams, where he had been hired to perform. The palace now loomed before him, sinister, black-shadowed, all spidery turrets and jagged porticos, a building as spiky and forbidding as the plants of the desert. More a jail than a palace, it seemed, at least in its outer aspect. But inside everything was different, cool and luxurious, with fountains in the courtyards, and soft, plush draperies, and a scent of flowers in the air. Servants bowed and beckoned to him, leading him to inner chambers, stripping away his sand-crusted clothes, bathing him, drying him in feathery towels, giving him fresh clothes, elegant jeweled robes, offering him chilled sherbets, icy wine of a silvery hue, morsels of unknown delicate meats, and at last bringing him to the great high vaulted throne room where the King of Dreams sat in state. At a vast distance, Valentine saw him enthroned, Simon and Bargesid, the malign and unpredictable power who from this windswept desert territory sent his messages of terrible import all through Majipur. He was a heavy-bodied man, his face beardless, fleshy-jowled, eyes deep-set and ringed with dark circles, and around his close-cropped stubbly head he wore the golden diadem of his power, the thought-amplifying apparatus that a Bargesid had devised a thousand years ago. To Simonin's left sat his son, Christoph, fleshy like his father, and at his right hand was his son Minax, the heir, a man of lean and forbidding aspect, dark-skinned and sharp-faced, as if honed by the desert winds. The King of Dreams, with a casual wave of his hand, ordered Valentine to begin. It was knives he juggled, ten, fifteen of them, Thin, shining stilettos that would pierce right through his arm if they dropped wrongly. But he handled them with ease, juggling as only sleep might do, or perhaps Zalzenkavl, a virtuoso display of skill. Valentine stood still, making only the tiniest flicking motions of his hands and wrists, and the knives soared aloft and flashed with keen brilliance, coursing high through the air and falling perfectly back to his waiting fingers. And as they rose and fell, rose and fell, the arc that they described took on an alteration of form, no longer a mere cascade, but becoming the starburst emblem of the coronal, blades pointing outward as they flew through the air. And abruptly, as Valentine approached the climax of his performance, the knives froze in midair, 
and hovered there just above his questing fingers, and would not descend to them. And from behind the throne came a scowling, fierce-eyed man who was Dominin Barjazid, the third of the sons of the King of Dreams. And he strode toward Valentine, and with an easy, contemptuous gesture, swept the starburst of knives from the air, thrusting them into the sash of his robe. The King of Dreams smiled mockingly. You are an excellent juggler, Lord Valentine. At last you find a proper occupation. I am Colonel of Majipur, Valentine replied. Were, 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 you are a wanderer now, and fit to be nothing more. Lazy, said Minax Bajazid. Cowardly, said Christoph Bajazid. Idle. A shirker of duty, Dominin Bajazid declared. Your rank is forfeit, said the King of Dreams. Your office is vacated. Go, go and juggle, Valentine the Juggler. Go, idler, go, wanderer. I am Colonel of Majipur, Valentine repeated firmly. No longer, said the King of Dreams. He touched his hands to the diadem at his forehead, and Valentine rocked and shook as if the ground had opened at his feet, and he stumbled and fell. And when he looked up again, he saw that Dominin Bargesid now was clad in the green doublet and ermine robe of a coronal, and had altered in appearance so that his face was the face of Lord Valentine, and his body was the body of Lord Valentine. And out of the juggling knives that he had taken from Valentine, he had fashioned the starburst crown of a coronal, which his father Simonin Bargesid now placed upon his brow. See, the king of dreams cried, power passes to the worthy. Go, juggler, go. And Valentine fled into the purple desert, and saw the angry swirls of a sandstorm racing toward him out of the south, and tried to escape. But the storm came at him from all directions. He roared, I am Lord Valentine the Colonel. But his voice was lost in the wind, and he felt sand in his teeth. He shouted, This is treason to usurp the power, and his shout was blown away. He looked toward the palace of the King of Dreams, but it was no longer to be seen, and a great and shattering sense of eternal loss overwhelmed him. He woke. Carabella lay peacefully beside him. The first pale light of dawn was entering the room. All the monstrous dream... Ascending of the most portentous sort, he felt utterly calm. For days now he had tried to deny the truth, but there was no rejecting it now, however bizarre, however fantastic it seemed. In another body he had once been Colonel of Majipur, and body and identity had been stolen somehow from him. Could it be? A dream of such urgency could scarcely be dismissed or ignored. He sorted through the deepest places of his mind, trying to uncover memories of power, ceremonies on the mount, glimpses of royal pomp, the taste of responsibility. Nothing. Nothing whatever. He was a juggler and nothing more than a juggler, and he could remember no shred of his life before Pidruid. It was as if he had been born on that hillside, moments before Shanamir the herdsman had encountered him. Born there with money in his purse and a flask of good red wine at his hip, and a scattering of false memories in his mind. And if it was true, if he was coronal, why then he must go forth, for the sake of the commonwealth of Majipur, to overthrow the tyrant and reclaim his rightful position. There would be that obligation upon him. But the notion was absurd. It created a dryness in his throat and a pounding in his chest, close to panic. To overthrow that dark-haired man of power who had ridden in pomp through Pidruid, how could that possibly be done? How even come near a colonel, let alone push him from his perch? That it had been done once, maybe, was no argument that it could be done again, and by a wandering juggler, an easy-natured young man who felt no compelling urge to tackle the impossible. Besides, Valentine saw in himself so little aptitude for governing. If he had in fact been colonel, he must have had years of training on Castlemount, 
a lengthy apprenticeship in the ways and uses of power. But not a trace of that was left to him now. How could he pretend to be a monarch, with none of a monarch's skills in his head? And yet, and yet... He glanced down at Carabella. She was awake. Her eyes were open. She was watching him in silence. The awe was still upon her, but no longer the terror. She said, What will you do, Lord? Call me Valentine now and ever. If you so command me. I do so command you, he said. And tell me, Valentine, what will you do? Travel with the Scandars, he replied. Continue to juggle. Master the art more thoroughly. Keep close watch on my dreams. Bide my time. Seek to comprehend. What else can I do, Carabella? He put his hand lightly to hers, and momentarily she shrank from his touch, and then did not, but pressed her other hand above his. He smiled. What else can I do, Carabella? Book Two The Book of the Metamorphs The gay rog city of Dulorn was an architectural marvel, a city of frosty brilliance that extended for two hundred miles up and down the heart of the great Dulorn Rift. Though it covered so huge an area, the city's predominant thrust was vertical. Great shining towers, fanciful of design but severely restrained in material, that rose like tapered fangs from the soft, gypsum-rich ground. The only approved building material in Dulorn was the native stone of the region, a light, airy calcite of high refractive index, that glittered like fine crystal, or perhaps like diamond. Out of this the Dulornese had fashioned their sharp-tipped high-rise structures, and embellished them with parapets and balconies, with enormous flamboyant flying buttresses, with soaring cantilevered ribs, with stalactites and stalagmites of sparkling facets, with lacy bridges far above the streets, with colonnades and domes and pendentives and pagodas. The juggling troop of Zalzan Kavl, approaching the city from the west, came upon it almost exactly at noon, when the sun stood straight overhead and streaks of white flame seemed to dance along the flanks of the titanic towers. Valentine caught his breath in wonder. Such a vast place! Such a wondrous show of light and form! Fourteen million people dwelled in Dulorn, making it one of the largest cities of Majapur, although by no means the largest. On the continent of Alhanroel, so Valentine had heard, a city of this size would be nothing remarkable. And even here on the more pastoral continent of Zimroel, there were many that matched or surpassed it. But surely no place could equal its beauty, he thought. Dulorn was cold and fiery, both at once. Its gleaming spires insistently claimed one's attention, like chill, irresistible music, like the piercing tones of some mighty organ rolling out across the darkness of space. No country inns for us here, Carabella cried happily. We'll have a hotel, with fine sheets and soft cushions. Will Zalzan Kavl be so generous, Valentine asked. Generous, Carabella laughed. He has no choice. Dulorn offers only luxury accommodations. If we sleep here, we sleep in the street or we sleep like dukes. There's nothing between. Like dukes, Valentine said. To sleep like dukes, why not? He had sworn her that morning before leaving the inn to say nothing to anyone about last night's events, not to Sleet, not to any of the Scandars, not even, should she feel the need to seek one, to a dream speaker. He had demanded the oath of silence from her in the name of the lady, the Pontifex, and the Coronal. Furthermore, he had compelled her to continue to behave toward him as though he had always been, and for the rest of his life would remain, Merely Valentine, the wandering juggler. In extracting the oath from her, Valentine had spoken with force and dignity worthy of a coronal, so that poor Carabella, kneeling and trembling, was as frightened of him all over again as if he were wearing the starburst crown. 
He felt more than a little fraudulent about that, for he was far from convinced that the strange dreams of the previous night were to be taken at face value. But still, those dreams could not lightly be dismissed, and so precautions must be taken. Secrecy. Guile. They came strangely to him, such maneuvers. He swore Otifan Deliamber also to the oath, wondering as he did so how much he could trust a rune and a sorcerer. But there seemed to be sincerity in Deliamber's voice as he vowed to keep his confidence. Deliamber said, And who else knows of these matters? Only Carabella, and I have her bound by the same pledge. You've said nothing to the Hjort. Vinorcus? Not a word. Why do you ask? The rune replied, He watches you too carefully. He asks too many questions. I have little liking for him. Valentine shrugged. It's not hard to dislike Hjort's, but what do you fear? He guards his mind too well. His aura is a dark one. Keep your distance from him, Valentine, or he'll bring you trouble. The jugglers entered the city and made their way down broad, dazzling avenues to their hotel, guided by Deliamber, who seemed to have a map of every corner of Majipur engraved in his mind. The wagon halted in front of a tower of splendid height and awesome fantasy of architecture, a place of minarets and arched vaults and shining octagonal windows. Descending from the wagon, Valentine stood blinking and gaping in awe. "'You look as though you've been clubbed on the head, Zalzan Cobble said gruffly. "'Never seen Dulorn before?' Valentine made an evasive gesture. His porous memory said nothing to him of Dulorn. But who, once having seen this city, could forget it? Some comment seemed called for. He said simply, Is there anything more glorious on all of Majipur? Yes, the gigantic Skandar replied. A tureen of hot soup, a mug of strong wine, a sizzling roast over an open fire. You can't eat beautiful architecture. Castle Mount itself isn't worth a stale turd to a starving man. Zalzenkavl snorted in high self-approbation, and hefting his luggage, strode into the hotel. Valentine called bemusedly after him. But I was speaking only of the beauty of cities. Felkar, usually the most taciturn of the Skandars, said, Zalzan Kavl admires Dulorn more than you would believe, but he'd never admit it. He admits admiration only for Pilloplock, where we were born, Gibor Hearn put in. He feels it's disloyal to say a good word for any place else. Shh! cried Erfan Kavl. He comes. Their senior brother had reappeared at the hotel door. Well, Zalzan Kavl boomed. Why are you standing about? Rehearsal in thirty minutes. His yellow eyes blazed like those of some beast of the woods. He growled, clenched his four fists menacingly, and vanished again. An odd master, Valentine thought. Somewhere far beneath that shaggy hide, he suspected, lay a person of civility and even, who could tell, of kindness. But Zalzan Kavl worked hard at his bearishness. The jugglers were booked to perform at the Perpetual Circus of Dulorn, a municipal festivity that was in progress during every hour of the day and on every day of the year. The Gayrogs, who dominated this city and its surrounding province, slept not nightly but seasonally, for two or three months at a time, mainly in winter, and when they were awake were insatiable in their demand for entertainment. According to Delhi Amber, they paid well, and there were never enough itinerant performers in this part of Majipur to satisfy their needs. When the troop gathered for the afternoon practice session, Zalzan Kavl announced that tonight's engagement was due to take place between the fourth and sixth hours after midnight. Valentine was unhappy about that. This night in particular he was eager for the guidance that dreams might bring, after last night's weighty revelations. But what chance could there be for useful dreams if he spent the most fertile hours of the night on stage? We can sleep earlier, Carabella observed. Dreams come at any hour, 
or do you have an appointment for ascending? It was a sly, teasing remark, for one who had trembled in awe of him not so much earlier. He smiled to show he had taken no offense. He could see self-doubt lurking just beneath her mockery of him, and said, I might not sleep at all, knowing that I must rise so early. Have Delhi Amber touch you as he did last night, she suggested. I prefer to find my own path into sleep, he said. Which he did, after a stiff afternoon of practice and a satisfying dinner of wind-dried beef and cold blue wine at the hotel. He had taken a room by himself here, and before he entered the bed, cool, smooth sheets, as Carabella had said, fit for a duke, he commended his spirit to the Lady of the Isle, and prayed for ascending from her, which was permissible and frequently done, though not often effective. It was the Lady now whose aid he most dearly needed. If he was in truth a fallen carnal, then she was his fleshly mother as well as his spiritual one and might confirm him in his identity and direct him along his quest. As he moved into sleep, he tried to visualize the lady and her isle, to reach out across the thousands of miles to her and create a bridge, some spark of consciousness over that immense gap by which she could make contact with him. He was hampered by the empty places in his memory. Presumably any adult Majipura knew the features of the lady and the geography of the isle, as well as he did the face of his own mother in the outskirts of his city. But Valentine's crippled mind gave him mainly blanks, which had to be filled by imagination and chance. How had she looked that night in the fireworks over Pidruid? A round, smiling face, long, thick hair. Very well. And the rest? Suppose the hair is black and glossy, black like that of her son's Lord Valentine and dead Lord Voriax. The eyes are brown, warm, alert, the lips full, the cheeks lightly dimpled, a fine network of wrinkles at the corners of the eyes. A stately, robust woman, yes, and she strolls through a garden of lush, floriferous bushes, yellow tanagales and camellias and elderons and purple thwales. Everything rich with tropical life. She pauses to pluck a blossom and fasten it in her hair, and moves on, along white marble flagstones that wind sinuously between the shrubs, until she emerges on a broad stone patio set into the side of the hill on which she dwells, looking down on the terraces upon terraces descending in wide sweeping curves toward the sea. And she looks westward to far off Zimroel. She closes her eyes. She thinks of her lost, wandering, outcast son in the city of the Gayrogs. She gathers her force and broadcasts sweet messages of hope and courage to Valentine, exiled in Dulorn. Valentine slipped into deep sleep, and indeed the lady came to him as he dreamed. He encountered her not on the hillside below her garden, but in some empty city in a wasteland, a ruined place of weather-beaten sandstone pillars and shattered altars. They approached one another from opposite sides of a tumble-down forum under ghostly moonlight. But her face was veiled, and she kept it averted from him. He recognized her by the heavy coils of her dark hair, and by the fragrance of the creamy-petaled Elderon flower beside her ear, and knew that he was in the presence of the Lady of the Isle. But he wanted her smile to warm his soul in this bleak place. He wanted the comfort of her gentle eyes. And he saw only the veil, the shoulders, the side of her head. Mother? he asked uncertainly. Mother, it's Valentine. Don't you know me? Look at me, mother. Wraith like, she drifted past him, and disappeared between two broken columns inscribed with scenes of the deeds of the great coronals, and was gone. Mother, he called. The dream was over. Valentine struggled to make her return, but could not. He awakened and lay peering into the darkness, seeing that veiled figure once more and searching for meaning. She hadn't recognized him. Was he so effectively transformed that not even his own mother could perceive who lay hidden in this body? 
or had he never been her son, so that there was no reason for her to know him? He lacked answers. If the soul of dark-haired Lord Valentine was embedded in the body of fair-haired Valentine, the lady of the isle in his dream had given no sign of it, and he was as far from understanding as he had been when he closed his eyes. What follies I pursue, he thought. What implausible speculations. What madnesses. He eased himself back into sleep. And almost at once, so it seemed, a hand touched his shoulder, and someone rocked him until he came reluctantly into wakefulness. Carabella. Two hours after midnight, she told him. Zalzan Kavl wants us down by the wagon in half an hour. Did you dream? Inconclusively. And you? I remained awake, she answered. It seemed safest. Some nights one prefers not to dream. She said timidly as he began to dress, Will I share your room again, Valentine? Would you like to? I have given oath to act with you as I acted before. Before I knew... Oh, Valentine, I was so frightened. But yes, yes, let's be companions again. And even lovers. Tomorrow night. What if I am coronal? Please, don't ask such questions. What if I am? You've ordered me to call you Valentine and to regard you as Valentine. This I'll do, if you'll let me. Do you believe I'm coronal? Yes, she whispered. It no longer frightens you? A little, just a little. You still seem human to me. Good. I've had a day to get used to things, and I'm under an oath. I must think of you as Valentine. I swore by the powers to that. She grinned impishly. I swore an oath to the coronal that I would pretend you are not coronal, and so I must be true to my pledge, and treat you casually, and call you Valentine, and show no fear of you, and behave as though nothing has changed. And so I can share your bed tomorrow night? Yes. I love you, Valentine. He pulled her lightly to him. I thank you for overcoming your fear. I love you, Carabella. Zalzan Kavl will be angry if we're late, she said. Two. The perpetual circus was housed in a structure altogether opposite from those most typical of Dulorn. A giant, flat, unadorned drum of a building, perfectly circular and no more than ninety feet high, that stood by itself on a huge tract of open land on the eastern perimeter of the city. Within, a great central space provided an awesome setting for the stage, and around it ran the seating ring, tier upon tier in concentric circles rising to the roof. The place could hold thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. Valentine was startled to see how nearly full it was, here at what was for him the middle of the night. Looking outward into the audience was difficult, for the stage lights were in his eyes, but he was able to perceive enormous numbers of people sitting or sprawling in their seats. Nearly all were gay rogs, though he caught sight of the occasional hjort or vroon or human making a late night of it. There were no places on Majipur entirely populated by one race. Ancient decrees of the government, going back to the earliest days of heavy non-human settlement, forbade such concentrations except on the Metamorph Reservation. But the gay rogs were a particularly clannish lot, and tended to cluster together in and around Delorne up to the legal maximum. Though warm-blooded and mammalian, they had certain reptilian traits that made them unlovable to most other races. Quick, flicking, forked red tongues, grayish, scaly skin of a thick, polished consistency, cold, green, unblinking eyes. Their hair had a medusoid quality, black, succulent strands that coiled and writhed unsettlingly. And their odor, both sweet and acrid at once, was not charming to non-gay rog nostrils. Valentine's mood was subdued as he moved out with the troop onto the stage. The hour was all wrong. His body cycles were at low ebb, and though he had had enough sleep, he had no enthusiasm for being awake just now. Once again he carried the burden of a difficult dream. That rejection by the lady, 
that inability to make contact with her, what did it signify? When he was only Valentine the juggler, significance was insignificant to him. Each day had a path of its own, and he had no worries about larger patterns, only to increase the skill of hand and eye from one day to the next. But now that these ambiguous and disturbing revelations had been visited upon him, he was forced to consider dreary, long-range matters of purpose and destiny, and the route on which he was bound. He had no liking for that. Already he tasted a keen, nostalgic sorrow for the good old times of the week before last, when he had wandered busy Pidruid in happy aimlessness. The demands of his art quickly lifted him out of this brooding. There was no time under the glare of the spotlights to think of anything except the work of performing. The stage was colossal, and many things were happening on it at once. Vroon magicians were doing a routine involving floating colored lights and bursts of green and red smoke. An animal trainer just beyond had a dozen fat serpents standing on their tails. A dazzling group of dancers with grotesquely attenuated bodies sprayed in many-faceted silver glow stuff did austere leaps and carries. Several small orchestras in widely separated regions played the tinny and tootling woodwind music beloved of the gay rogs. There was a one-finger acrobat, a high-wire woman, a levitator, a trio of glass blowers engaged in fashioning a cage for themselves, an eel-eater, and a platoon of berserk clowns, along with much more beyond Valentine's range of vision. The audience, slouching and lounging out there in the half-darkness, had an easy time watching all this, for, Valentine realized, the giant stage was in gentle motion, turning slowly on hidden bearings, and in the course of an hour or two would make a complete circuit, presenting each group of performers in turn to every part of the auditorium. It all floats on a pool of quicksilver, Sleet whispered. You could buy three provinces with the value of the metal. With so much competition for the eyes of the onlookers, the jugglers had brought forth some of their finest effects, which meant that the novice Valentine was largely excluded, left to toss clubs to himself and occasionally to feed knives or torches to the others. Carabella was dancing atop a silver globe two feet in diameter that rolled in irregular circles as she moved. She juggled five spheres that glowed with brilliant green light. Sleet had mounted stilts and rose even taller than the Scandars, a tiny figure far above everyone, coolly flipping from hand to hand three huge red and black speckled eggs of the Malika hen that he had bought at market that evening. If he dropped an egg from so great a height, the splash would be conspicuous and the humiliation enormous. But never since Valentine had known him had sleep dropped anything, and he dropped no eggs tonight. As for the six Skandars, they had arranged themselves in a rigid star pattern, standing with their backs to one another, and were juggling flaming torches. At carefully coordinated moments, each would hurl a torch backward over his outer shoulder to his brother at the opposite side of the star. The interchanges were made with wondrous precision. The trajectories of the flying torches were flawlessly timed to create splendid crisscrossing patterns of light. And not a hair on any Skandar's hide was scorched as they casually snatched from the air the firebrands that came hurtling past them from their unseen partners. Round and round the stage they went, performing in stints of half an hour at a stretch, with five minutes to relax in the central well just below the stage, where hundreds of other off-duty artists gathered. Valentine longed to be doing something more challenging than his own little elementary juggle. But Zalzan Kavl had forbidden it. He was not yet ready, the Skandar said, though he was doing excellently well for a novice. Morning came before the troop was allowed to leave the stage. Payment here was by the hour, and hiring was governed by silent response meters beneath the seats of the audience, monitored by cold-eyed gay rogs in a booth in the well. Some performers lasted only a few minutes before universal boredom or disdain banished them. But Zalzan Kavl and his company, who had been guaranteed two hours of work, remained on stage for four. They would have been kept for a fifth if Zalzan Kavl had not been dissuaded by his brothers, who gathered around him for a brief and intense argument. His greed, Carabella said quietly, will lead him to embarrass himself yet. 
How long does he think people can throw those torches around before someone slips up? Even Skandars get tired eventually. Not Zalzan Carvel, from the looks of it, Valentine said. He may be a juggling machine, yes, but his brother's immortal. Rovon's timing is starting to get ragged. I'm glad they had the courage to make a stand. She smiled. And I was getting pretty tired, too. So successfully were the jugglers received in Dulorne that they were hired for four additional days. Zalzan Carvel was elated. The gay rogs gave their entertainers high wages and declared a five-crown bonus for everyone. All well and good, Valentine thought, but he had no wish to settle in indefinitely among the gay rogs. After the second day, restlessness began to make him chafe. You wish to be moving on? Deli Amber said. A statement, not a question. Valentine nodded. I begin to glimpse the shape of the road ahead of me. To the aisle? Why do you bother speaking with people, Valentine said lightly, if you see everything within their minds? I did no mind peeking this time. Your next move is obvious enough. Go to the lady, yes. Who else can truly tell me who I am? You still have doubts, Deli Amber said. I have no evidence other than dreams. Which speak powerful truths. Yes, Valentine said, but dreams can be parables. Dreams can be metaphors. Dreams can be fantasies. It's folly to speak them literally without confirmation. And the lady can give confirmation. Or so I hope. How far is it to the Isle, wizard? Deli Amber briefly closed his large golden eyes. Thousands of miles, he said. We are now perhaps a fifth of the way across Zimrawel. You must make your way eastward through Kintor of Velethis, and around the territory of the Metamorphs, and then perhaps by riverboat via Nimoya to Pileplok, where the pilgrim ships leave for the Isle. How long will that take? To reach Pileplok? At our present pace, about fifty years. Wandering with these jugglers, stopping here and there for a week at a time. What if I left the troop and went on my own? Six months, possibly. The river journey is swift. The overland section takes much longer. If we had airships as they do on other worlds, it would be a matter of a day or two to Pilliplock. But, of course, we do without many devices on Majipur that other people enjoy. Six months! Valentine frowned. And the cost... If I hired a vehicle and a guide? Perhaps twenty royals. You'll juggle a long time to earn that much. When I get to Pilliplock, Valentine said, what then? You book passage to the Isle. The voyage is a matter of weeks. When you reach the Isle, you take lodging on the lowest terrace and begin the ascent. The ascent? A course of prayer, purification, and initiation. You move upward from terrace to terrace until you reach the Terrace of Adoration, which is the threshold to Inner Temple. You know nothing of any of this? My mind, Ellie Amber, has been meddled with. Of course. At Inner Temple, then, you are now an initiate. You serve the lady as an acolyte, and if you seek an audience with her, you undergo special rites and await the summoning dream. Uneasily, Valentine said, How long does this entire process take? The terraces, the initiation, the service's acolyte, the summoning dream. It varies. Five years sometimes. Ten. Forever, conceivably. The lady has no time for each and every pilgrim. And there's no more direct way of gaining audience? Deli Amber uttered the thick coughing sound that was his laugh. What? Knock on the temple door. Cry out that you are her changeling son. Demand entry. Why not? Because, the Vroon said, the outer terraces of the isle are designed as filters to keep such things from happening. There are no easy channels of communication to the lady, and deliberately so. It would take you years. I'd find a way. 
Valentine stared levelly at the little wizard. I could reach her mind if I were on the aisle. I could cry out to her. I could persuade her to summon me. Perhaps. Perhaps. With your assistance it could be done. I feared that was coming, said Deli Amber dryly. You have some skill at making sendings. We could reach, if not the lady herself, then those close to her, step by step, drawing ourselves closer to her, cutting short the interminable process on the terraces. It could be done, possibly, Deli Amber said. Do you believe I'm minded to make the pilgrimage with you, though? Valentine regarded the rune in silence for a long time. I'm certain of it, he said finally. You play at reluctance, but you've engineered my every motive to impel me toward the aisle. With you at my side, am I right, eh, Deli Amber? You're more eager to have me get there than I am myself. Ah, the sorcerer said. It comes out now. Am I right? If you resolve to go to the Isle, Valentine, I will be at your side. But are you resolved? Sometimes. Intermittent resolutions lack potency, said Deli Amber. Thousands of miles, years of waiting, toil and intrigue. Why do I want to do this, Deli Amber? Because you are a coronal, and must be again. The first may be true, though I have mighty doubts of it. The second is open to question. Deli Amber's look was crafty. You prefer to live under the rule of a usurper? What's the coronal and his rule to me? He's half a world away on Castlemount, and I'm a wandering juggler. Valentine extended his fingers and stared at them as though he had never seen his hands before. I could spare myself much effort if I remained with Zalzan Kabul and let the other, whoever he may be, keep the throne. Suppose he's a wise and just usurper. Where's the benefit for Majipur if I do all this work merely to put myself back in his place? Oh, Deli Amber, Deli Amber, do I sound like a king at all when I say these things? Where's my lust for power? How can I ever have been a ruler when I so obviously don't care about what's happened? We've spoken of this before. You have been tampered with, my lord. Your spirit as well as your face has been changed. Even so, my royal nature, if ever I had one, is altogether gone from me. That lust for power, twice you've used the phrase, Deli Amber said. Lust has nothing to do with it. A true king doesn't lust for power. Responsibility lusts for him, and takes him, and possesses him. This coronal is new. He has done little yet but make the grand processional, and already the people grumble at his early decrees. And you ask if he will be wise and just. How can any usurper be just? He is a criminal, Valentine, and he rules already with the criminal's guilty fears eating at his dreams. And as time goes on, those fears will poison him, and he will be a tyrant. Can you doubt that? He will remove anyone who threatens him, will kill even if need be. The poison that courses in his veins will enter the life of the planet itself, will affect every citizen. And you, sitting here looking at your fingers, do you see no responsibility? How can you talk of sparing yourself much effort? As if it hardly matters who is the king. It matters very much who is the king, my lord, and you were chosen and trained for it, and not by lottery. Or do you believe anyone can become coronal? I do, by random stroke of fate. Deli Amber laughed harshly. Possibly that was true nine thousand years ago. There is a dynasty, my lord. An adoptive dynasty? Precisely. Since the time of Lord Ariak, and maybe even earlier, Colonels have been chosen from among a small group of families, no more than a hundred clans, all of them dwellers on Castle Mount, and close participants in the government. The next Colonel is already in training, though only he and a few advisers know who he is, and two or three replacements for him must also have been chosen. 
but now the line is broken. Now an intruder has pushed his way in. Nothing but evil can come of that. What if the usurper is simply the heir in waiting, who grew tired of waiting? No, said Dele Amber. Inconceivable. No one deemed qualified to be coronal would overthrow a lawfully consecrated prince. Besides, why the mummery of pretending to be Lord Valentine, if he is another? I grant you that. Grant me also this, that the person atop Castle Mount now has neither right nor qualification for being there, and must be cast down, and you are the only one who can do it. Valentine sighed. You ask a great deal. History asks a great deal, said Dele Amber. History has demanded, on a thousand worlds across many thousands of years, that intelligent beings choose between order and anarchy, between creation and destruction, between reason and unreason. And the forces of order and creation and reason have been focused always in a single leader, a king, if you will, or a president, a chairman, a grand minister, a generalissimo. Use whatever word you wish. A monarch by some name or other. Here it is the coronal. Or more accurately, the coronal ruling as the voice of the pontifex, who was once coronal. And it matters, my lord, it matters very much who is to be coronal and who is not to be coronal. Yes, Valentine said, perhaps. You'll go on wavering from yes to perhaps a long while, said Dele Amber. But yes will govern in the end. And you will make the pilgrimage to the isle, and with the lady's blessing you will march on Castle Mount and take your rightful place. The things you say fill me with terror. If ever I had the ability to rule, if ever I was given the training for it, these things have been burned from my mind. The terror will fade. Your mind will be made whole in the passing of time. And time passes, and here we sit in Dulorn to amuse the gay rogs. Dele Amber said, Not much longer. We'll find our way eastward, my lord. Have faith in that. There was something contagious about Dele Amber's assurance. Valentine's hesitations and uncertainties were gone, for the moment. But when Dele Amber had departed, Valentine gave way to uncomfortable contemplation of certain hard realities. Could he simply hire a couple of mounts and set off for Pilliplock with Dele Amber tomorrow? What about Carabella, who had suddenly become very important to him? Abandon her here in Dulorn? And Shanamir? The boy was attached to Valentine, not to the Skandars. He neither could nor would be left. There was the cost, then, of a journey for four across nearly all of vast Zimruel. Food, lodging, transportation. Then the pilgrim ship to the isle. And what, then, of expenses on the isle while he schemed to gain access to the lady? Audifon Dele Amber had guessed it might cost twenty royals for him to travel alone to Pillaplock. The cost for the four of them, or for the five if sleet were added, though Valentine had no idea if Sleet would care to come, might run a hundred royals or more, a hundred fifty perhaps to the lowest terrace of the isle. He sorted through his purse. Of the money he had had upon him when he found himself outside Pidruid, he had more than sixty royals left, plus a royal or two that he had earned with the troop. Not enough, not nearly enough. Carabella, he knew, was almost without money, Shanamir had dutifully returned to his family the hundred sixty royals from the sale of his mounts. And Dele Amber, if he had any wealth, would not in old age be hauling himself through the countryside under contract to a crowd of ruffian skandars. So then, nothing to do but wait, and plan, and hope that Zalzan Kavl intended a generally eastward route, and save his crowns and bide his time until the moment was ripe for going to the lady. 3. A few days after their departure from Dulorn, purses bulging with the generous gay rog pay, Valentine drew Zalzan Kavl aside to ask him about the direction of travel. It was a gentle late summer day, and here, 
where they were camped for lunch along the eastern slope of the rift. A purple mist enfolded everything, a low, thick, clammy cloud that took its delicate lavender color from pigments in the air. For there were deposits of scuba sand just north of here, and the winds were constantly stirring the stuff aloft. Zalzan Kavo looked uncomfortable and irritable in this weather. His gray fur, purpled now by droplets of mist, was clumped in comic bunches, and he rubbed at it, trying to restore it to its proper nap. Probably not the best moment for such a conference, Valentine realized, but it was too late. The issue had been broached. Zalzan Kavo said hollowly, Which of us is the leader of this troop, Valentine? You are beyond question. Then why do you try to govern me? I? In Pidruid, the Skandar said, you asked me to go next to Falkenkip for the convenience of your herdsman squire's family honor. And I remind you that you forced me to hire the herdsman boy in the first place, though he is no juggler and never will be. In these things I yielded, I know not why. There was also the matter of your interfering in my quarrel with the Vroon. My interference had benefit, Valentine pointed out, as you yourself admitted at the time. True, but interference of itself is unfamiliar to me. Do you understand that I am absolute master of this troop? Valentine shrugged lightly. No one disputes that. But do you understand it? My brothers do. They are aware that a body can have only one head. Unless it's a Susu Harris body, and we're not talking of those. And here I am the head. It is from my mind that plans and instructions flow, and mine alone. Zalzan Kavl flashed an austere smile. Is this tyranny? No. This is simple efficiency. Jugglers can never be Democrats, Valentine. One mind designs the patterns, one alone, or there is chaos. Now, what do you want with me? Only to know the shape of our route. With barely suppressed anger, Zalzan Kavl said, Why? You are in our employ. You go where we go. Your curiosity is misplaced. It doesn't seem that way to me. Some routes are more useful to me than others. Useful? To you? You have plans? You told me you had no plans. I do now. What do you plan, then? Valentine took a deep breath. Ultimately, to make the pilgrimage to the isle, and become a devotee of the lady. Since the pilgrim ships sail from Pillaplock, and all of Zimrowell lies between us and Pillaplock, it would be valuable to me to know whether you plan to go in some other direction— Let's say down to Velethis, or maybe back to Tillamon or Narabal, instead of... You are discharged from my service, Zalzan Kavl said icily. Valentine was astounded. What? Terminated. My brother Erfan will give you ten crowns as your settlement. I want you on your way within an hour. Valentine felt his cheeks growing hot. This is totally unexpected. I merely asked... You merely asked... And in Pidruid you merely asked, and in Falkenkip you merely asked, and next week in Mazadone you would merely ask. You annoy my tranquility, Valentine, and this cancels out your promise as a juggler. Besides, you are disloyal. Disloyal? To what? To whom? You hire on with us, but secretly mean to use us as the vehicle to get you to Pillaplock. Your commitment to us is insincere. I call that treachery. When I hired on with you, I had nothing else in mind but to travel with your troop wherever you went. But things have changed, and now I see reason to make the pilgrimage. Why did you allow things to change? Where's your sense of duty to your employers and teachers? Did I hire on with you for life, Valentine demanded? Is it treachery to discover that one has a goal more important than tomorrow's performance? That diversion of energy, said Zalzan Kavl, is what leads me to be rid of you. I want you thinking about juggling every hour of the day, and not about the departure date of pilgrim ships from Shkunabor Pier. There would be no diversion of energy. When I juggle, I juggle. And I'd resign from the troop when we approached Billaplock, 
But until then, enough, Zalzenkavl said. Pack. Go. Take yourself swiftly to Pillarplock and sail to the isle, and may you farewell. I have no further need of you. The Skandar seemed altogether serious, scowling in the purple mist, slapping at the soggy patches in his pelt. Zalz and Carvel swung heavily around and began to walk away. Valentine trembled in tension and dismay. The thought of leaving now, of traveling alone to Pillarplock, left him aghast. And beyond that he felt part of this troop, more so than he had ever been aware, a member of a close-knit team, and would not willingly be sundered. At least not now, not yet, while he could remain with Carabella and Sleet, and even the Skandars, whom he respected without liking, and continue to increase his skills of eye and hand, while moving eastward toward whatever strange destiny Deli Amber seemed to have in mind for him. Wait, Valentine called. What about the law? Zalzenkavl glared over his shoulder. Which law? The one requiring you to keep three human jugglers in your employ, said Valentine. I will hire the herdsman boy in your place, Zalzenkavl retorted, and teach him whatever skills he can learn. And he stalked off. Valentine stood stunned. His conversation with Zalzenkavl had taken place in a grove of small golden-leafed plants that evidently were psychosensitive for he noticed now the plants had folded their intricate compound leaflets in the course of the quarrel, and looked shriveled and blackened for ten feet on all sides of him. He touched one. It was crisp and lifeless, as though it had been torched. He felt abashed at being a party to such destruction. What happened? Shalomir asked, appearing suddenly and staring in wonder at the withered foliage. I heard yelling. The Skandar! "'Has fired me,' said Valentine vacantly, "'because I asked him which way we were going next, "'because I admitted to him that I intended eventually "'to journey on pilgrimage to the Isle "'and wondered if his route would suit my purpose.' "'Shanamir gaped. "'You are to make the pilgrimage? "'I never knew!' "'A recent decision. "'Why, then,' the boy cried, "'we'll make it together, won't we? "'Come, we'll pack our things.' We'll steal a couple of mounts from these Skandars. We'll leave at once. Do you mean that? Of course. It's thousands of miles to Pillarplock. You and I, and no one to guide us, and... Why not, Shanamir asked. Look, we ride to Kintor, and there we take a riverboat to Nimoya, and on from there down the Zimmer to the coast, and at Pillarplock we buy passage on the pilgrim ship, and... What's wrong, Valentine? I belong with these people. I'm learning an art from them. I... I... Valentine broke off in confusion. Was he a juggler in training, or a coronal in exile? Was it his purpose to plod along with shaggy skandars, yes, with Carabella and Sleet also? Or was it incumbent on him to move by the fastest means toward the isle, and then with the lady's help toward Castle Mount? He was confounded by these uncertainties. The cost, Shanamir said, is that what worries you? You had fifty royals and more in Pidruid. You must have some of that left. I have a few crowns myself. If we need more, you can work as a juggler on the riverboat. And I could curry mounts, I suppose, or... Where are you planning to go, said Carabella, coming abruptly upon them out of the forest. And what has happened to these sensitivos here? Is there trouble? Briefly, Valentine told her of his talk with Zalzenkavl. She listened in silence, with her hand to her lips. And when he was done, she darted off abruptly, without a word, in the direction Zalzenkavl had taken. Carabella, Valentine called, but already she was out of sight. Let's go, said Shanamir. We can be out of here in half an hour, and by nightfall we'll be miles away. Look, you pack our things. I'll take two of the mounts and lead them around through the woods, down the slope toward the little lake we passed when we came in, and you meet me down there by the grove of cabbage trees. Shanamir waved his hands impatiently. Hurry! I've got to get the mounts while the Skandars aren't around, and they might come back at any minute. 
Shanamir vanished into the forest. Valentine stood frozen. To leave now, so suddenly, with so little time to prepare himself for this upheaval? And what of Carabella? Not even a goodbye? Deli Amber? Sleet? He started toward the wagon to gather his few possessions, halted, plucked indecisively at the dead leaves of the poor sensitivo plants, as though by pruning the withered stalks he could instantly induce new growth. Gradually he compelled himself to see the brighter side. This was a disguised blessing. If he stayed with the jugglers, it would delay by months or even years the confrontation with reality that obviously lay in store for him. And Carabella, if any truth lay in the shape of things that began to emerge, could be no part of that reality anyway. So then it behooved him to shrug away his shock and distress, and take to the highway, bound for Pillarplock and the pilgrim ships. Come, he told himself, get moving, collect your things. Shanam is waiting by the cabbage trees with the mounts. But he could not move. And then Carabella came bounding toward him, face aglow. It's all fixed, she said. I got Deli Amber to work on him. You know, a little trick here and there. A bit of a touch with the tip of a tentacle. The usual wizardry. He's changed his mind. Oh, we've changed it for him. Valentine was startled by the intensity of his feeling of relief. I can stay? If you'll go to him and ask forgiveness. Forgiveness for what? Carabella grinned. That doesn't matter. He took offense. The divine only knows why. His fur was wet. His nose was cold. Who knows? He's a scandal, Valentine. He has his own weird sense of what's right and wrong. He's not required to think the way humans do. You got him angry and he discharged you. Ask him politely to take you back, and he will. Go on now. Go. But, but, but what? Are you going to stand on pride now? Do you want to be rehired or don't you? Of course I do. Then go, Carabella said. She seized him by the arm and gave a little tug, to budge him as he stood there faltering and fumbling. And as she did so, it must have occurred to her whose arm it was she was tugging, for she sucked in her breath and let go of him and moved away hovering as if on the verge of kneeling and making the starburst symbol. Please, she said softly, please go to him, Valentine, before he changes his mind again. If you leave the troop, I'll have to leave it too, and I don't want to. Go, please. Yes, said Valentine. She led him over the spongy, mist-moistened ground to the wagon. Zalzan Carvel sat sulkily on the steps, huddling in a cloak in the damp, close warmth of the purple mist. Valentine approached him and said straightforwardly, It was not my intent to anger you. I ask your pardon. Zalzan Carvel made a low, growling sound, almost below the threshold of audibility. You are a nuisance, the Skandar said. Why am I willing to forgive you? From now on you will not speak to me unless I have spoken to you first. Understood? Understood, yes. You will make no attempt to influence the route we travel. Understood, said Valentine. If you irritate me again, you will be terminated without severance pay, and you will have ten minutes to get out of my sight no matter where we are, even if we are camped in the midst of a metamorph reservation and nightfall is coming. Do you understand? I understand, Valentine said. He waited, wondering if he would be asked to bow, to kiss the Skandar's hairy fingers, to grovel in obeisance. Carabella, standing to one side, seemed to be holding her breath, as though expecting some explosion to come from the spectacle of a power of Majipur begging forgiveness from an itinerant Skandar juggler. Zalzan Kavl regarded Valentine disdainfully as he might have regarded a cold fish of uncertain vintage presented to him in a congealed sauce for dinner. Assiduously, he said, I am not required to provide my employees with information of no concern to them, 
but I will tell you anyway that Pillarplock is my native city, and I return there from time to time, and it is my purpose to arrive there eventually. How soon it will be depends on what engagements I can arrange between here and there. But be informed that our route lies generally eastward, although there may be some departures from that path, for we have a livelihood to earn. I hope this pleases you. When we reach Pillarplock, you may resign from the troop if you still have it in mind to undergo the pilgrimage. But if you induce any members of the troop other than the herdsman boy to accompany you on that voyage, I will ask an injunction against it in a coroner's court and prosecute you to the fullest. Understood? Understood, said Valentine, though he wondered whether he would deal honorably with the Skandar on this point. Lastly, said Zalzenkavo, I ask you to remember that you are paid a good many crowns a week, plus sixpences and bonuses, to perform in this troop. If I detect you filling your mind with thoughts of the pilgrimage, or of the lady and her servants, or of anything else but how to throw things into the air and catch them in a theatrically suitable manner, I'll revoke your employment. In these last few days you've already seemed unacceptably moody, Valentine. Change your ways. I need three humans for this troop, but not necessarily the ones I have now. Understood? Understood, Valentine said. Go, then. Carabella said as they walked away, Was that terribly unpleasant for you? It must have been terribly pleasant for Zalzenkavo. He's just a hairy animal. No, said Valentine gravely. He's a sentient being equal to ourselves in civil rank, and never speak of him as anything else. He only looks like an animal. Valentine laughed, and after a moment Carabella laughed with him, a trifle edgily. He said, in dealing with people who are enormously touchy on matters of honor and pride, I think it's wisest to be accommodating to their needs, especially if they're eight feet tall and provide you with your wages. At this point I need Zalzenkavo far more than he needs me. And the pilgrimage, she asked, are you really planning to undergo it? When did you decide that? In Dulorne, after conversation with Deliamber. There are questions about myself I must answer, and if anyone can help me with those answers, it's the Lady of the Isle. So I'll go to her, or try to. But all that's far in the future, and I've sworn to Zalzan Kabul not to think of such things. He took her hand in his. I thank you, Carabella, for repairing matters between Zalzan Kabul and me. I wasn't at all ready to be discharged from the troop or to lose you so soon after I had found you. Why do you think you would have lost me, she asked, if the Skandar had insisted on letting you go? He smiled. I thank you for that, too. And now I should go down to the cabbage tree grove and tell Shanamir to return the mounts that he's stolen for us. Four. In the next few days... The landscape began to grow surpassingly strange, and Valentine had more cause for gladness that he and Shanamir had not tried to proceed by themselves. The district between Dulorne and the next major city, Mazedon, was relatively thinly populated. Much of it, according to Deli Amber, was a royal forest preserve. That bothered Zalzenkavo, for jugglers would not find employment in forest preserves nor, for that matter, in low-lying swampy farmland occupied mainly by rice paddies and the savender seed plantations. But there was no choice but to follow the main forest highway, since nothing more promising lay to the north or south. On they went, in generally humid and drizzly weather, through a region of villages and farms and occasional thick stands of the fat-trunked comical cabbage trees, short and squat, with massive white fruit sprouting directly from their bark. But as Mazadone Forest Preserve drew closer, the cabbage trees gave way to dense thickets of singing ferns, yellow-fronded and glassy of texture, that emitted piercing discordant sounds whenever they were approached, shrill high-pitched bings and twangs and bleeps, nasty screeches and scrapes. That would not have been so bad, 
The unmelodious song of the ferns had a certain raucous charm, Valentine thought. But the fern thickets were inhabited by bothersome small creatures far more disagreeable than the plants. Little, toothy, winged rodents known as deems, that came flapping up out of hiding every time the proximity of the wagon touched off the fern song. The deems were about the length and breadth of a small finger, and were covered by fine golden fur. They arose in such numbers that they clouded the air, and swarmed about indignantly, sometimes nipping with their tiny but effective incisors. The thickly furred scandars up front in the driver's seat largely ignored them, merely swatting at them when they clustered too close. But the usually stolid mounts were bothered, and balked in the traces several times. Shanamir, sent out to placate the animals, suffered half a dozen painful bites, and as he scurried back into the wagon a good many diems entered with him. Sleep took a frightening nip on his cheek near his left eye, and Valentine, beset by dozens of infuriated creatures at once, was bitten on both arms. Carabella methodically destroyed the diems with a stiletto used in the juggling act, skewering them with single-minded determination and great skill. But it was an ugly half-hour before the last of them was dead. Beyond the territory of the deems and the singing ferns, the travelers entered into a region of curious appearance, a broad open area of meadows out of which rose hundreds of black granite needles just a few feet wide and perhaps eighty feet high, natural obelisks left behind by some unfathomable geological event. To Valentine it was a region of delicate beauty. To Zals and Kavl, it was merely one more place to pass quickly through en route to the next festival where jugglers might be hired. But to Audifon Deliamber, it seemed something else, a place giving sign of possible menace. The Vroon leaned forward, staring keenly for a long moment through the wagon's window at the obelisks. Wait, he called finally to Zalzenkavl. What is it? I want to check something. Let me out. Zalzenkavl grunted impatiently and tugged on the reins. Deli Amber scrambled from the wagon, moving in his supple, ropey-limbed, runish glide toward the odd rock formations, disappearing among them, coming occasionally into view as he zigzagged from one thin pinnacle to the next. When he returned, Deli Amber looked glum and apprehensive. See there, he said, pointing. Do you make out vines far up? "'stretched from that rock to that, and from that to that, and on over to there, "'and some small animals crawling about on the vines. "'Valentine could just barely discern a network of slender, glossy red lines "'high on the pinnacles, forty or fifty feet or more above the ground. "'And yes, half a dozen slim, ape-like beasts moving from obelisk to obelisk like acrobats, "'swinging freely by hands and feet. It looks like bird net vine, said Zalzan Kavl in a puzzled tone. It is, Deli Amber said. But why do they not stick to it? What are those animals anyway? Forest brethren, the rune answered. Do you know of them? Tell me. They are troublesome, a wild tribe native to central Zimruel, not usually found this far west. The metamorphs are known to hunt them for food or perhaps for sport. I'm not sure which. They have intelligence, though of a low order, something greater than dogs or drolls, less than civilized folk. Their gods are dwika trees. They have some sort of tribal structure. They know how to use poison darts and cause problems for wayfarers. Their sweat contains an enzyme that makes them immune to the stickiness of birdnet vine which they employ for many purposes. If they annoy us, Zalzenkavl declared, we will destroy them. Onward! Once past the region of the obelisks, they saw no further traces of forest brethren that day. But on the next, Deliamber once again spied ribbons of birdnet vine in the treetops. And a day after that, the travelers, now deep in the forest preserve, came upon a grove of trees of truly colossal mass which, the Vrunish wizard said, were Dwickers, sacred to the forest brethren. 
This explains their presence so far from Metamorph territory, said Deli Amber. These must be a migrating band. Come west to pay homage in this forest. The Dwickers were awesome. There were five of them, set far apart in otherwise empty fields. Their trunks, covered with bright red bark that grew in distinct plates with deep fissures between, were greater in diameter than the long axis of Zalz and Carvel's wagon. And though they were not particularly tall, no higher than a hundred feet or so, their mighty limbs, each as thick as the trunk of an ordinary tree, spread out to such a distance that whole legions might take shelter under the Dwicker's gigantic canopy. On stalks as thick as a Skandar's thigh sprouted the leaves, great leathery black things the size of a house, that drooped heavily, casting an impenetrable shade and from each branch hung suspended two or three elephantine yellowish fruits. Bumpy irregular globes a good twelve or fifteen feet in width. One of them had recently fallen, it appeared, from the nearest tree, perhaps on a rainy day when the ground was soft, for its weight had dug a shallow crater in which it lay, split apart, revealing large, glistening, many-angled black seeds in the mass of scarlet pulp. Valentine could understand why these trees were gods to the forest brethren. They were vegetable monarchs, imperious, commanding. He was quite willing to sink to his knees before them himself. Deli Amber said, The fruit is tasty, intoxicating, in fact, to the human metabolism and to some others. To Skandars? asked Zalzenkavl. To Skandars, yes. Zalz and Carvel laughed. We'll try it. Erfon, Felkar, gather pieces of the fruit for us. Nervously, Deli Amber said, The talismans of the forest brethren are embedded in the ground before each tree. They've been here recently, and might return. And if they find us desecrating the grove, they will attack, and their darts can kill. Sleet, Carabella, stand guard to the left. Valentine, Shanamir, Benorcus, over there. Cry out if you see even one of the little apes. Zalz and Carvel gestured at his brothers. Collect the fruit for us, he ordered. Hairn, you and I will defend the situation from here. Wizard, remain with us. Zalz and Carvel took two energy throwers from a rack and gave one to his brother Hairn. Deli Amber clucked and muttered in disapproval. They move like ghosts. They come out of nowhere. Enough, said Zalzenkavl. Valentine took up a lookout position fifty yards ahead of the wagon and peered warily beyond the last of the Dwicker trees into the dark, mysterious forest. He expected to have a fatal dart come winging toward him at any moment. It was an uncomfortable feeling. Erfon Carvel and Thelkar, carrying a big wicker basket between them, made their way toward the fallen fruit, pausing every few steps to look in all directions. When they reached it, they began cautiously to edge around to the far side of it. What if a bunch of forest brethren are sitting behind that thing right now, Shanamir asked, having a little feast? Suppose Thelkar stumbles over them and... A tremendous and terrifying whoop and a roar... Such as might come from an outraged bull Bidlack interrupted in its mating, erupted from the vicinity of the Dwicker fruit. Erfan Kavl, looking panic-stricken, came galloping back into view and rushed toward the wagon, followed a moment later by an equally daunted Thelkar. Beasts! cried a ferocious voice. Pigs and fathers of pigs! Rape a woman enjoying her lunch, will you? I'll teach you to rape! I'll fix you so you'll never rape again. Stand your ground, hairy animals. Stand, I say, stand. Out from behind the Dwicker fruit came the largest human woman Valentine had ever seen. A creature so vast she was a proper companion to these trees, and seemed perfectly in scale with them. She stood close to seven feet tall, perhaps more and her gigantic body was a mountain of flesh rising on legs as sturdy as pillars. A close-fitting shirt and grey leather trousers were her garments, 
and the shirt was open nearly to the waist, revealing huge, jouncing globes of breasts the size of a man's head. Her hair was a mop of wild orange curls. Her blazing eyes were pale, piercing blue. She carried a vibration sword of imposing length, which she swung about her with such force that Valentine, a hundred feet away, could feel the breeze it stirred. Her cheeks and breasts were smeared with the scarlet juice of the Dwicker fruit's meat. In weighty strides she thundered toward the wagon, crying rape and demanding vengeance. What is this? Zalzenkovel asked, looking as bemused as Valentine had ever seen him. He glared at his brothers. What did you do to her? We never touched her, said Erfenkovel. We were looking for forest brethren back there, and Thelkar came upon her unexpectedly, and stumbled and caught her arm to steady himself. You said you never touched her, Zalzenkovel snapped. Not that way. It was only an accident, a stumble. Do something, Zalzenkovel said hastily to Deli Amber, for the giant woman was almost upon them now. The Vroon, looking pale and cheerless, stepped in front of the wagon and lifted many tentacles toward the apparition that towered almost scander high above him. Peace. Deli Amber said mildly to the onrushing giantess. We mean you no harm. As he spoke, he gestured with manic purposefulness, casting some sort of pacifying spell that manifested itself as a faint bluish glow in the air before him. The huge woman appeared to respond to it, for she slowed her advance and managed to come to a halt a few feet from the wagon. There she stood, sullenly whipping the vibration sword back and forth at her side. After a moment she pulled her shirt together in front, fastening it inadequately. Glowering at the Skandars, she indicated Erfan and Thelkar, and said in a deep, booming voice, What were those two planning to do to me? Deli Amber replied, They had simply gone to collect pieces of the Dwicker fruit. See the basket they were carrying? We had no idea you were there, Thelkar murmured. We walked around behind the fruit to check for hidden forest brethren, is all. And fell upon me like the oaf you are, and would have violated me if I hadn't been armed, eh? I lost my footing, Thelkar insisted. There was no intention of molesting you. I was on guard for forest brethren, and when instead I encountered someone of your size, what... More insults! Thelkar took a deep breath. That is to say, it was unexpected when I... when you... Erfan Kavl said, we had no thought. Valentine, who had been observing all of this in gathering amusement, now came over and said, if they were minded for rape, would they have attempted it in front of so large an audience? We are of your kind here. We wouldn't have tolerated it. He indicated Carabella. That woman is as fierce in her way as you are in yours, my lady. Be assured that if these Skandars had tried to do you any injury, she alone would have prevented it. It was a simple misunderstanding, nothing more. Put down your weapon and feel no peril among us. The giantess looked somewhat soothed by the courtliness and charm of Valentine's speech. Slowly she lowered the vibration sword, allowing it to go inert, and fastened it at her hip. Who are you? she asked querulously. What is all this procession traveling here? My name is Valentine, and we are traveling jugglers, and this Skandar is Zalzenkavl, the master of our troop. And I am Lisaman Hulton, the giantess responded, who hires as bodyguard and warrior. Though there's been little of that lately. And we are wasting time, said Zalzenkavl, and should be on our way, if we are properly forgiven for having intruded on your repose. Lissaman Holton nodded brusquely. Yes, be on your way. But are you aware this is dangerous territory? Forest brethren, Valentine asked. All over the place. The woods are thick with them just ahead. And yet you feel no fear of them? Deli Amber remarked. I speak their language, Lissamon Halton said. I have negotiated a private treaty with them. 
Do you think I dare be munching on dwicker fruit otherwise? I may be fat, but not between the ears, little sorcerer. She stared at Zalzan Kavo. Where are you bound? Mazadone, replied the Skandar. Mazadon, is there work for you in Mazadon? We hope to learn that, Zazen Kavl said. There's nothing for you there. I come from Mazadon just now. The Duke is lately dead, and three weeks of mourning have been decreed in the entire province. Or do you jugglers perform at funerals? Zazen Kavl's face darkened. No work in Mazadon? No work in the whole province? We have expenses to meet. We have already gone unpaid since Dulon. What will we do? Bissaman Halton spat out a chunk of Dwicker fruit pulp. That's no sorrow of mine. Anyway, you can't get to Mazadon. What? Forest brethren, they've blocked the road a few miles ahead. Asking tribute of wayfarers, I think. Something absurd like that. They won't let you through. Lucky if they don't fill you with their darts. They'll let us through, Zauzen Kaval exclaimed. The warrior woman shrugged. Not without me, they won't. You? I told you I speak their language. I can buy you a way through with a little haggling. Are you interested? Five royals ought to do it. What use do forest brethren have for money, the Skandar asked. Oh, not for them, she said airily. Five for me. I'll offer other things to them. Deal? Absurd. Five royals is a fortune. I don't bargain, she said evenly. There is honor in my profession. Good luck on the road ahead. She favored Thelkar and Erfan Kavl with a frigid stare. If you wish, you may have some of the Dwicker fruit before you go. But better not be munching on it when you meet the brethren. She turned with massive dignity and walked to the great fruit beneath the tree. Drawing her sword, she hacked off three large chunks and shoved them disdainfully toward the two skandars, who somewhat uneasily nudged them into the wicker basket. Zalzan Kavl said, into the wagon, all of you. We have a long way to Mazadon. You won't travel far today, said Lisa Monhalton, and released a gale of derisive laughter. You'll be back here soon enough, if you survive. Five. The poison darts of the forest brethren preoccupied Valentine for the next few miles. Sudden horrible death held no appeal for him and the woods here were thick and mysterious, with vegetation of a primordial sort, fern trees with silvery spore sheaths and glassy textured horsetails a dozen feet high and thickets of bunch fungus, pale and pocked with brown craters. In a place of such strangeness anything might happen, and probably would. But the juice of the dwicker fruit eased tensions mightily, Venorcus sliced up one huge chunk and passed cubes of it around. It was piercingly sweet of flavor and granular in texture, dissolving quickly against the tongue, and whatever alkaloids it contained went swiftly through the blood to the brain, faster than the strongest wine. Valentine felt warm and cheerful. He slouched back in the passenger cabin, one arm around Carabella, the other around Shanamir. Up front... Zalzan Kavl evidently was more relaxed as well, for he stepped up the pace of the wagon, pushing it to a rollicking speed not much in keeping with his dour, cautious practices. The usually self-contained sleet, slicing up more dwicker fruit, began to sing a rowdy song. Lord Barhold came to Belka Strand with crown and chain and pail. He meant to force old Gornup's hand and make him eat his... The wagon pulled suddenly to a halt, so suddenly that Sleet lurched forward and came close to falling into Valentine's lap, and a slab of soft, wet dwicker fruit smacked into Valentine's face. Laughing and blinking, he wiped himself clean. When he could see again, 
he found that everyone was gathered at the front of the wagon, peering out between the scandars on the driver's seat. What is it? he asked. Birdnet vine, said Venorcus, sounding quite sober. Blocking the road. The giant has told the truth. Indeed, the sticky, tough red vine had been laced from fern tree to fern tree at a dozen angles, forming a sturdy and resilient chain both broad and thick. The forest flanking the road was altogether impenetrable here. The birdnet vine sealed the highway. There was no way the wagon could proceed. How hard is it to cut? Valentine asked. Zalzan Kavl said, We could do it in five minutes with energy throwers. But look there. Forest brethren, Carabella said softly. They were everywhere, swarming in the woods, hanging from every tree, although getting no closer to the wagon than a hundred yards or so. They seemed less like apes at close range, more like savages of an intelligent species. They were small, naked beings with smooth, blue-gray skin and thin limbs. Their hairless heads were narrow and long, with sloping, flat foreheads, and their elongated necks were flimsy and fragile. Their chests were shallow, their frames meatless and bony. All of them, both men and women, wore dart blowers of reeds strapped to their hips. They pointed at the wagon, chattered to one another, made little hissing, whistling sounds. What do we do? Zalzan Kavl asked Dilly Amber. Hire the warrior woman, I would think. Never! In that case, said the Vroon, let us prepare to camp in the wagon until the end of our days, or else go back toward Dulorn and find some other road to travel. We could parley with them, the Skandar said. Go out there, wizard. Speak to them in dream language, monkey language, rune language, any words that will work. Tell them we have urgent business in Mazedon, that we must perform at the funeral of the Duke, and they will be severely punished if they delay us. Deli Amber said calmly to Zalzan Kavl, You tell them. I? Whichever of us steps out of the wagon first is apt to be skewered by their darts. I prefer to yield the honor. Perhaps they will be intimidated by your great size and hail you as their king. Or perhaps not. Zalzan Kavl's eyes blazed. You refuse? A dead sorcerer, Deli Amber said, will not guide you very far on this planet. I know something of these creatures. They are unpredictable and very dangerous. Pick another messenger, Zalzan Kavl. Our contract doesn't require me to risk my life for you. Zalzan Kavl made his growling sound of displeasure, but he let the issue drop. Stymied, they sat tight for long minutes. The forest brethren began to descend from the trees, remaining at a considerable distance from the wagon. Some of them danced and cavorted now in the roadway, setting up a ragged, tuneless chanting, formless and atonal, like the droning of huge insects. Erfan Kavl said, A blast from the energy thrower would scatter them. It wouldn't take long for us to incinerate the birdnet vine, and then, and then they'd follow us through the forest, pumping darts at us whenever we showed our faces, said Zalzan Kavl. No, there may be thousands of them all around us. They see us. We can't see them. We can't hope to win by using force against them. Moodily, the big Skandar wolfed down the last of the Dwicker fruit. Again he sat in silence for a few moments, scowling, occasionally shaking fists at the tiny folk blocking the path. At length he said in a bitter rumble, Mazadon is still some day's journey away, and that woman said there was no work to be had there anyway. So we'll have to go on to Borgax, or maybe even Thagabar, eh, Deli Amber? Weeks more before we earn another crown. And here we sit, trapped in the forest by little apes with poisoned arts. Valentine? Startled, Valentine said, yes. 
I want you to slip out of the wagon the back way and return to that warrior woman. Offer her three royals to get us out of this. Are you serious, Valentine asked. Carabella, with a little gasp, said, No, I'll go instead. What's this, said Zalzan Kaval in irritation. Valentine is... He is... He gets lost easily. He becomes distracted. He... He might not be able to find... Foolishness, the Skandar said, waving his hands impatiently. The road is straight. Valentine is strong and quick. And this is dangerous work. You have skills too valuable to risk, Carabella. Valentine will have to go. Don't do it, Shanama whispered. Valentine hesitated. He had not much liking for the idea of leaving the relative safety of the wagon to travel on foot alone in a forest infested with deadly creatures. But someone had to do it, and not one of the slow, ponderous Skandars, nor the splay-footed Hjort. To Zars and Kavl, he was the most expendable member of the troop. Perhaps he was. Perhaps he was expendable even to himself. He said, The warrior woman told us her price was five royals. Offer her three. And if she refuses? She said it was against her honor to bargain. Three, Zalzan Kavl said. Five royals is an immense fortune. Three is an absurd enough price to pay. You want me to run miles through a dangerous forest to offer someone an inadequate price for a job that absolutely must be done? Are you refusing? Pointing out folly, said Valentine, if I'm to risk my life, there must be the hope of achievement. Give me five royals for her. Bring her back here, the Skandar said, and I'll negotiate with her. Bring her back yourself, said Valentine. Zars and Kavl considered that. Carabella, tense and pale, sat shaking her head. Sleet warned Valentine with his eyes to hold his position. Shanamir, red-faced, trembling, seemed about ready to burst forth with anger. Valentine wondered if this time he had pushed the Skandar's always volatile temper too far. Zalzenkavl's fur stirred as though spasms of rage were contorting his powerful muscles. He seemed to be holding himself in check by furious effort. Doubtless Valentine's latest show of independence had enraged him almost to the boiling point. But there was a glint of calculation in the Skandar's eyes, as though he were weighing the impact of Valentine's open defiance against the need he had for Valentine to do this service. Perhaps he was even asking himself whether his thrift might be foolishness here. After a long, tense pause, Zalzan Kavl let out his breath in an explosive hiss, and scowling, reached for his purse. Sourly he counted out the five gleaming one royal pieces. Here, he grunted, and hurry. I'll go as fast as I can. If running is too great a burden, said Zalzan Kavl, Go out the front way and ask the forest brethren if you may leave to unhitch one of our mounts and ride back to her in comfort. But do it quickly, whichever you choose. I'll run, Valentine replied, and began to unfasten the wagon's rear window. His shoulder blades itched in anticipation of the thwock of a dart between them the moment he emerged. But no thwocks came, and soon he was running lightly and easily down the road. The forest that had looked so sinister from the wagon looked much less so now. The vegetation unfamiliar but hardly ominous, not even the pockmarked bunch fungus. And the fern trees seemed nothing but elegant as their spore sheaths glistened in the afternoon sun. His long legs moved in steady rhythm, and his heart pumped uncomplainingly. The running was relaxing, almost hypnotic, as soothing to him as juggling. He ran a long while, paying no heed to time and distance, until it seemed he surely must have gone far enough. But how could he have run unknowingly past anything so conspicuous as five Dwicker trees? Had he carelessly taken some fork in the road and lost the path? It seemed unlikely. So he simply ran on, and on, and on, 
until eventually the monstrous trees, with the great fallen fruit beneath the closest of them, came into view. The giantess seemed nowhere around. He called out her name. He peered behind the dwicker fruit. He made a circuit of the entire grove. No one. In dismay he contemplated running onward, back halfway to Delorne, maybe, to find her. Now that he had stopped, he felt the effects of his jog. Muscles were protesting in his calves and thighs, and his heart was thumping in an unpleasant way. He had no appetite for more running just now. But then he caught sight of a mount tethered a few hundred yards back of the Dwicker Tree Grove. An oversized beast, broad-backed and thick-legged, suitable for carrying Lisamon Hulton's bulk. He went to it and looked beyond, and saw a roughly hacked trail leading toward running water. The ground sloped off sharply and gave way to a jagged cliff. Valentine peered over the edge. A stream emerged from the forest here and tumbled down the face of the cliff to land in a rock basin perhaps forty feet below. And alongside that pool, sunning herself after a bath, was Lisa Mon Hulton. She lay face down, her vibration sword close beside her. Valentine looked with awe at her wide muscular shoulders, her powerful arms, the massive columns of her legs, the vast dimpled globes of her buttocks. He called to her. She rolled over at once, sat up, looked about her. Up here, he said. She glanced in his direction, and discreetly he turned his head away. But she only laughed at his modesty. Rising, she reached for her clothing in a casual, unhurried way. You, she said, the gentle spoken one, Valentine. You can come down here. I'm not afraid of you. I know you dislike being disturbed at your repose, Valentine said mildly, picking his way down the steep, rocky path. By the time he had reached the bottom, she had her trousers on and was struggling to pull her shirt over her mighty breasts. He said, We came to the roadblock. Of course. We need to get on to Macedon. The Skandar has sent me to hire you. Valentine produced Salzen Kabul's five royals. Will you help us? She eyed the shining coins in his hand. The price is seven and a half. Valentine pursed his lips. You told us five before. That was before. The Skandar has given me only five royals to pay you. She shrugged and began to unfasten her shirt. In that case, I'll continue to sunbathe. You may stay or not, as you wish, but keep your distance. Quietly, Valentine said, When the Skandar tried to beat down your price, you refused to bargain, telling him that there is honor in your profession. My notion of honor would require me to abide by a price once I quoted it. She put her hands to her hips and laughed, a laugh so vociferous he thought it would blow him away. He felt like a plaything beside her. She outweighed him by more than a hundred pounds, and stood at least a head taller. She said, How brave you are, or how stupid. I could destroy you with a slap of my hand, and you stand here lecturing me about faults of honor. I think you wouldn't harm me. She studied him with new interest. Perhaps not. But you take risks, fellow. I offend easily, and I do more damage than I intend sometimes when I lose my temper. Be that as it may, we have to get to Macedon, and only you can call off the forest, brethren. The Skandar will pay five royals and no more. Valentine knelt and put the five brilliant coins in a row on the rock by the pool. However, I have a little money of my own. If it'll settle the issue, I'll add that to the fee. He fished in his purse until he found a royal piece, found another, laid a half-royal beside it, and looked up hopefully. Five will be enough, Lisa Mon Holton said. She scooped up Zalzan Kavl's coins, left Valentine's, and went scrambling up the path. Where's your mount? she asked, untethering her own. I came on foot. 
On foot, on foot. You ran all that way. She peered at him. What a loyal employee you are. Does he pay you well to give such service and take such risks? Not particularly. No, I suppose not. Well, climb on behind me. This beast would never even notice a little extra weight. She clambered onto the mount, which, though large for its kind, seemed dwarfed and frail once she was on it. Valentine, after some hesitation, got on behind her and clamped his hands around her waist. For all her bulk, there was nothing fat about her. Solid muscle girdled her hips. The mount cantered out of the Dwicka tree grove and down the road. The wagon, when they came to it, was still shut up tight, and forest brethren still danced and chattered in and around the trees behind the blockade. They dismounted. Lisa Mon Halton walked without sign of fear to the front of the wagon and called something to the forest brethren in a high, shrill voice. There was a reply of similar pitch from the trees. Again she called, again she was answered. Then a long, feverish colloquy ensued, with many brief expostulations and interjections. She turned to Valentine. They will open the gate for you, she said. For a fee. How much? Not money. Services. What services can we render for forest brethren? She said, I told them you are jugglers, and I explained what it is that jugglers do. They'll let you proceed if you perform for them, otherwise they intend to kill you and make toys of your bones. But not today, for today is a holy day among the forest brethren, and they kill no one on holy days. My advice to you is to perform for them, but do as you wish. She added, The poison that they use does not act particularly quickly. Six. Zalzan Kavl was indignant. Perform for monkeys. Perform without fee. But Deli Amber pointed out that the forest brethren were somewhat higher on the evolutionary scale than monkeys. And Sleet observed that they had not had their practice today, and the workout would do them some good. And Erfan Kavl clinched the matter by arguing that it would not really be a free performance, since it was being traded for passage through this part of the forest which these creatures effectively controlled. And in any case, they had no choice in the matter. So out they came, with clubs and balls and sickles, but not the torches, for Deli Amber suggested that the torches might frighten the forest brethren and cause them to do unpredictable things. In the clearest space they could find, they began to juggle. The forest brethren watched raptly, Hundreds upon hundreds of them trooped from the forest and squatted alongside the road, staring, nibbling their fingers and their slender prehensile tails, making soft, chittering comments to one another. The Skandars interchanged sickles and knives and clubs and hatchets. Valentine whirled clubs aloft. Sleet and Carabella performed with elegance and distinction. And an hour went by, and another, and the sun began to slink off in the direction of Pidruid. And still the forest brethren watched, and still the jugglers juggled, and nothing was done about unwinding the bird net vine from the trees. Do we play for them all night, Zalzenkavl demanded. Hush, said Deli Amber. Give no offense. Our lives are in their hands. They used the opportunity to rehearse new routines. The Skandars polished an interception number stealing throws from one another in a way that was comical in being so huge and fierce. Valentine worked with Sleet and Carabella on the interchange of clubs. Then Sleet and Valentine threw clubs rapidly at one another, while first Carabella and then Shanamir turned handsprings daringly between them. And so it went, on into a third hour. These forest brethren have had five royals worth of entertainment from us already, Zalzenkavl grumbled. When does this end? You juggle very capably, said Lisa Monhalton. They enjoy your show immensely. I enjoy it myself. How pleasant for you, Zalzenkabel, said sourly. Twilight was approaching. 
Apparently the coming of darkness signaled some shift in mood for the forest brethren, for without warning they lost interest in the performance. Five of them, of presence and authority, came forward and set about ripping down the barricade of birdnet vine. Their small, sharp-fingered hands dealt easily with the stuff that would have tangled anyone else hopelessly in snarls of sticky fiber. In a few minutes the way was clear, and the forest brethren, chattering, faded into the darkness of the woods. "'Have you wine?' Lisamon Halton asked, as the jugglers gathered their gear and prepared to move along. "'All this watching has given me a powerful thirst.' Zals and Kavl began to say something miserly about supplies running low. But too late, Carabella, with a sharp glare at her employer, produced a flask. The warrior woman tipped it back, draining it in one long, lusty gulp. She wiped her lips with the sleeve of her shirt and belched. Not bad, she said. Dulonese? Carabella nodded. Those gay rogs know how to drink, snakes that they are. You won't find anything like it in Mazadon. Zalzenkavl said, Three weeks of mourning, you say? No less. All public amusements forbidden. Yellow mourning stripes on every door. Of what did the duke die? Sleet asked. The giantess shrugged. Some say it was ascending from the king that frightened him to death, and others that he choked on a gobbet of half-cooked meat and still others that he indulged in an excess with three of his concubines. Does it matter? He's dead. That's not to be disputed. And the rest is trifles. And no work to be had, said Zalzenkavl gloomily. No, nothing as far as Thagabar and beyond. Weeks without earnings, the Skandar muttered. Lisa Manhulton said, It must be unfortunate for you. But I know where you could find good wages just beyond Thagabar. Yes, Zalzenkavl said, in Kintor, I suppose. Kintor? No, times are lean there, I hear. A poor harvest of clenet puffs this summer, and the merchants have tightened credit. And I think there's little money to be spent on entertainments. No, I speak of Illyrivoin. What? Sleet cried, as though he had been struck by a dart. Valentine sorted through his knowledge, came up with nothing, and whispered to Carabella, Where's that? Southeast of Kintor. But southeast of Kintor is the Metamorph territory. Exactly. Zalzenkavl's heavy features took on an animated cast for the first time since encountering the roadblock. He swung round and said, What work is there for us in Illyravoin? The shapeshifters hold festival there next month, Lisa Monhalton replied. There'll be harvest dancing and contests of many kinds and merrymaking. I've heard that sometimes troops from the imperial provinces enter the reservation and earn huge sums at festival time. The shapeshifters regard imperial money lightly and are quick to dispose of it. Indeed, Zalzenkavl said. The chilly light of greed played across his face. I had heard the same thing long ago, but it never occurred to me to test its truth. You'll test it without me, Sleet cried suddenly. The Skandar glanced at him. Eh? Sleet showed intense strain, as though he had been doing his blind juggling routine all afternoon. His lips were taut and bloodless. His eyes were fixed and unnaturally bright. If you go to Illyravoin, he said tensely, I will not accompany you. I remind you of our contract, said Zalzenkavl. Nevertheless, nothing in it obliges me to follow you into metamorph territory. Imperial law is not valid there, and our contract lapses the moment we enter the reservation. I have no love for the shapeshifters, and refuse to risk my life and soul in their province. We'll talk about this later, Sleet. My response will be the same later. Zalzan Kavl looked about the circle. Enough of this. We've lost hours here. I thank you for your help, he said without warmth to Lisa Monhalton. I wish you a profitable journey, she said, and rode off into the forest.
Because they had consumed so much time at the roadblock, Zals and Kavul chose to keep the wagon moving through the night, contrary to his usual practice. Valentine, exhausted by a lengthy run and hours of juggling, and feeling some lingering haziness from the dwicker fruit he had eaten, fell asleep sitting up in the back of the wagon, and knew nothing more until morning. The last he heard was a forceful discussion of the notion of venturing into metamorph territory, but suggesting that the perils of Illyravoin had been exaggerated by rumor, Carabella noting that Zalzenkavl would be justified in prosecuting Sleet, and expensively if he broke his contract, and Sleet insisting with almost hysterical conviction that he dreaded the metamorphs and would not go within a thousand miles of them. Shanamir and Venorcus, too, expressed fear of the shapeshifters, who they said was sullen, tricky, and dangerous. Valentine woke to find his head nestled cozily in Carabella's lap. Bright sunlight streamed into the wagon. They were camped in some broad and pleasant park, a place of sweeping blue-gray lawns and narrow, sharp-angled trees of great height. Low, rounded hills surrounded everything. Where are we? he asked. Outskirts of Macedon. The Skandar drove like a madman all night long. Carabella laughed prettily. And you slept like one who has been dead a long time. Outside, Zals and Kavl and Sleet were engaged in heated argument a few yards from the wagon. The small, white-haired man seemed half again his normal size with rage. He paced back and forth, pounded fist into palm, shouted, scuffed at the ground, once seemed at the verge of launching a physical attack on the Skandar, who seemed, for Zals and Kavl, remarkably calm and forbearing. He stood with all his arms folded, looming high over Sleet, and making only an occasional quiet, cold reply to his outbursts. Carabella turned to Deli Amber. This has continued long enough. Wizard, can you intervene before Sleet says something really rash? The Vroon looked melancholy. Sleet has a terror of the metamorphs that goes beyond all reason. Perhaps it's connected with that sending of the king that he had long ago in Narabal, that turned his hair white in a single evening. Or perhaps not. In any case, it may be wisest for him to withdraw from the troop, whatever the consequences. But we need him! And if he thinks terrible things will befall him in Illyravoin, can we ask him to subject himself to such fears? Perhaps I can calm him, Valentine said. He rose to go outside. But at that instant, Sleet, face dark and set, stormed into the wagon. Without a word, the compact little juggler began to stuff his few possessions into a pack. Then he swept out, his fury unabated, and striding past the motionless Zals and Kavl, began to march at a startling clip toward the low hills to the north. Helplessly they watched him. No one made a move to pursue until Sleet was nearly out of sight. Then Carabella said, I'll go after him. I can get him to change his mind. She ran off toward the hills. Zals and Kavl called to her as she went past him, but she ignored him. The Skandar, shaking his head, summoned the others from the wagon. Where is she going? he asked. To try to bring Sleet back, said Valentine. Hopeless. Sleet has chosen to leave the troop. I'll see to it that he regrets his defection. Valentine, greater responsibilities now will fall upon you, and I'll add five crowns a week to your salary. Is this acceptable? Valentine nodded. He thought of Sleet's quiet, steady presence in the troop, and felt a pang of loss. The Skandar continued. Deli Amber? I have, as you might suspect, decided to seek work for us among the metamorphs. Are you familiar with the routes to Illyravoin? I have never been there, the Vroon answered, but I know where it is. And which is the quickest way? To Kintor from here, I think, and then eastward by riverboat some four hundred miles, and at Verf there's a road due south into the reservation. Not a smooth road but wide enough for the wagon, so I believe. 
I will study it. And how long will it take for us to reach Illyravorn, then? Perhaps a month, if there are no delays. Just in time for the Metamorph Festival, said Zalzenkavl. Perfect. What delays do you anticipate? Deli Amber said, The usual. Natural disasters, breakdown of the wagon, local disturbances, criminal interferences. Things are not as orderly in mid-continent as they are on the coasts. There are risks involved in traveling in those parts. You bet there are, boomed a familiar voice. Protection is what you need. The formidable presence of Lisa Munhalton suddenly was among them. She looked rested and relaxed, not at all as though she had ridden all night, nor was her mount particularly spent. In a puzzled voice, Zalzenkavl said, How did you get here so quickly? Forest trails. I'm big, but not so big as your wagon, and I can take back ways. Going to Illyravoin, are you? Yes, said the Skandar. Good, I knew you would, and I've come after you to offer my services. I'm out of work. You're going into dangerous parts. It's a logical partnership. I'll escort you safely to Illyravoin, that I guarantee. Your wages are too high for us. She grinned. You think I always get five royals for a little job like that? I charged so much because you made me angry, tromping in on me while I was trying to have a private feed. I'll get you to Illyravoin for another five, no matter how long it takes. Three, said Zalzenkavl sternly. You never learn, do you? The giantess spat almost at the Skandar's feet. I don't haggle. Get yourselves to Illyravoin without me, and good fortune attend you, though I doubt it will. She winked at Valentine. Where are the other two? Sleet refused to go to Illyravoin. He went roaring out of here ten minutes ago. I don't blame him. And the woman? She went after him, to talk him into returning. Up there. Valentine pointed to the path winding up into the hills. There? Between that hill and that. Into the mouth plant grove? There was disbelief in Lisa Monhulton's voice. What is that? Valentine asked. Deli Amber at the same moment said, Mouth plants? Here? The park is dedicated to them, the giantess declared. But there are warning signs at the foot of the hills. They went up that trail, on foot. The divine protect them. Exasperated, Zalzenkavl said, They can eat him twice for all I care, but I need her. As I do, said Valentine. To the warrior woman, he said, Possibly if we rode up there now, we could find them before they enter the mouth plant grove. Your master feels he can't afford my services. Five royals, Zalzenkavl said. From here to Illyravoin? Six, she said coolly. Six, then. But get them back. Get her, at least. Yes, said Lisa Monhalton in disgust. You people have no sense, but I have no work, so we deserve each other, perhaps. Take one of those mounts, she said to Valentine, and follow me. You want him to go? Zalzenkavl wailed. I'll have no humans at all in my troop. I'll bring him back, the giantess said, and with luck the other two also. She clambered onto her mount. Come, she said. Seven. The path into the hills was gently sloping, and the blue-gray grass looked soft as velvet. It was hard to believe that anything menacing dwelled in this lovely park. But as they reached the place where the path began to rise at a sharper angle, Lisa Monhalton grunted and indicated a bare wooden stake set in the ground. Beside it, half hidden by the grass, was a fallen sign. Valentine saw only the words, Danger, no foot traffic beyond this, in large red letters. 
Sleet, in his rage, had not noticed. Carabella, perhaps in her urgent haste, had failed to see the sign also, or else had ignored it. Quickly now the path climbed, and just as quickly it leveled off on the far side of the hills, in a place that was no longer grassy but densely wooded. Lisa Mon Hulton, riding just ahead of Valentine, slowed her mount to a walk as they entered a moist and mysterious copse, where trees with slender, strong-ribbed trunks grew at wide intervals, shooting up like beanstalks to create a thickly interlaced canopy far overhead. See there, the first mouth plants, the giantess said. Filthy things! If I had the keeping of this planet, I'd put the torch to all of them. But our colonels tend to be nature lovers, so it seems, and preserve them in royal parks. Pray that your friends have had the wisdom to stay clear of them. On the bare forest floor, in the open spaces between the trees, grew stemless plants of colossal size. Their leaves, four or five inches broad and eight or nine feet in length, sharp-toothed along their sides and metallic of texture, were arranged in loose rosettes. At the center of each gaped a deep cut a foot in diameter, half filled with a noxious-looking greenish fluid, out of which a complex array of stubby organs projected. It seemed to Valentine that there were things like knife blades in there, and paired grinders that could come together nastily and still other things that might have been delicate flowers partly submerged. These are flesh-eating plants, Lisa Mon Hulton said. The forest floor is underlain by their hunting tendrils, which sense the presence of small animals, capture them, and carry them to the mouth. Observe. She guided her mount toward the closest of the mouth plants. When the animal was still at least twenty feet from it, Something live like a whip suddenly began to writhe in the decaying forest duff. It broke free of the ground to coil itself with a terrifying snapping sound around the animal's pastern just above the hoof. The mount, placid as usual, sniffed in puzzlement as the tendril began to exert pressure, trying to pull it toward the gaping mouth in the plant's central cup. The warrior woman, drawing her vibration sword, leaned down and sliced quickly through the tendril. It snapped back as the tension was released, almost to the cup itself, and at the same time a dozen other tendrils rose from the ground, flailing the air furiously on all sides of the plant. She said, The mouth plant lacks the strength to tug anything so big as a mount into its maw, but the mount wouldn't be able to break free. In time it would weaken and die, and then it might be pulled in. One of these plants would live for a year on that much meat. Valentine shuddered. Carabella, lost in a forest of such things? Her lovely voice stilled forever by some ghastly plant? Her quick hands? Her sparkling eyes? No! No! The thought chilled him. How can we find them, he asked. It might already be too late. How are they called? the giantess asked. Shout their names. They must be near. Carabella! Valentine roared with desperate urgency. Sleet! Carabella! A moment later he heard a faint answering shout, but Lisa Mon Hulton had heard it first, and was already going forward. Valentine saw Sleet ahead, down on one knee on the forest floor, and that knee dug in deep to keep him from being dragged into a mouth plant by the tendril that encircled his other ankle. Crouching behind him was Carabella, her arms thrust through his and hooked tight around his chest in a desperate attempt to hold him back. All about them excited tendrils belonging to neighboring plants snapped and coiled in frustration. Sleet held a knife, with which he sawed uselessly at the powerful cable that held him. And there was a trail of skid marks in the duff, showing that he had already been drawn four or five feet toward the waiting mouth. Inch by inch he was losing the struggle for his life. Help us, Carabella called. With a stroke of her sword, Lisa Mon Hulton severed the tendril grasping sleet. He recoiled sharply as he was freed, toppling backward and coming within an eye blink of being seized around the throat by the tendril of another plant. 
but with an acrobat's easy grace he rolled over, avoiding the groping filament, and sprang to his feet. The warrior woman caught him about the chest and lifted him quickly to a place behind her on her mount. Valentine now approached Carabella, who stood shaken and trembling in a safe place between two sets of thrashing tendrils, and did the same for her. She clung to him so tightly that his ribs ached. He twisted himself around and embraced her, stroking her gently, nuzzling her ear with his lips. His relief was overwhelming and startling. He had not realized how much she had come to mean to him, nor how little he had cared about anything just now except that she was all right. Gradually her terror subsided, but he could feel her still quivering at the horror of the scene. Another minute, she whispered. Sleet was starting to lose his foothold. I could feel him slipping toward that plant. Carabella winced. Where did she come from? She took some shortcut through the forest. Zalzan Kavl has hired her to protect us on the way to Illyravoin. She's already earned her fee, Carabella said. Follow me, Lisa Monhalton ordered. She chose a careful route out of the mouth plant grove. But for all her care, her mount was seized twice by the leg, and Valentine's once. Each time the giantess cut the tendril away, and in moments they were out into the clearing and riding back down the path toward the wagon. A cheer went up from the Skandars as they reappeared. Zalzan Kavl regarded Sleet coldly. You chose an unwise route for your departure, he observed. Not nearly so unwise as the one you've picked, said Sleet. I beg you excuse me. I will go on toward Mazedon by foot and seek some sort of employment there. Wait, Valentine said. Sleet looked at him inquiringly. Let's talk. Come walk with me. Valentine laid his arm over the smaller man's shoulders and drew him aside, off into a grassy glade, before Zalzan Kavl could provoke some new wrath in him. Sleet was tense, wary, guarded. What is it, Valentine? I was instrumental in getting Zalzan Kavl to hire the giantess. But for that you'd be tidbits for the mouth plant now. For that I thank you. I want more than thanks from you, said Valentine. It could be said that you're indebted to me for your life, in a way. That may be. Then I ask by way of repayment that you withdraw your resignation. Sleet's eyes flashed. You don't know what you ask. The metamorphs are strange and unsympathetic creatures, yes, but Deli Amber says they're not as menacing as often reported. Stay with the troop, Sleet. You think I'm being whimsical and quitting? Not at all, but irrational, perhaps. Sleet shook his head. I had a sending from the king once, in which a metamorph imposed on me a terrible fate. One listens to such sendings. I have no desire to go near the place where those beings dwell. Sendings don't always bear the literal truth. Agreed. But often they do. Valentine, the king told me I would have a wife that I loved more dearly than my art itself, a wife who juggled with me the way Carabella does, but far more closely, so much in tune with my rhythms that it was as if we were one person. Sweat broke out on Sleet's scarred face, and he faltered, and almost did not go on. But after a moment he said, I dreamed, Valentine, that the shapeshifters came one day and stole that wife of mine, and substituted for her one of their own people, disguised so cunningly that I couldn't tell the difference. And that night, I dreamed, we performed before the coronal, before Lord Malibor that ruled then and drowned soon after. And our juggling was perfection. It was a harmony unequaled in all of my life. And the coronal feasted us with fine meats and wines and gave us a bedchamber draped with silks. And I took her in my arms and began to make love. And as I entered her, she changed before me and was a metamorph in my bed, a thing of horror, Valentine, with rubbery gray skin and gristle instead of teeth, and eyes like dirty puddles, who kissed me and pressed close against me. I have not sought the body of a woman, Sleet said, since that night. 
out of dread that some such thing might befall me in the embrace. Nor have I told this story to anyone, nor can I bear the prospect of going to Illyravoin and finding myself surrounded by creatures with shapeshifter faces and shapeshifter bodies. Compassion flooded Valentine's spirit. In silence he held the smaller man for a moment, as if with the strength of his arms alone he could eradicate the memory of the horrific nightmare that had maimed his soul. When he released him, Valentine said slowly, Such a dream is truly terrible. But we are taught to use our dreams, not to let ourselves be crushed by them. This one is beyond my using, friend, except to warn me to stay clear of metamorphs. You take it too straightforwardly. What if something more oblique was intended? Did you have the dream spoken, Sleet? It seemed unnecessary. It was you who urged me to see a speaker when I dreamed strangely in Pidruid. I remember your very words. The king never sends simple messages, you said. Sleet offered an ironic smile. We are always better doctors for others than for ourselves, Valentine. In any event, it's too late to have a fifteen-year-old dream spoken, and I am its prisoner now. Free yourself. How? When a child has a dream that he is falling, and awakens in fright, what does his parent say? That falling dreams are not to be taken seriously, because one doesn't really get hurt in dreams? Or that the child should be thankful for a falling dream because such a dream is a good dream? That it speaks of power and strength? that the child was not falling but flying, to a place where he would have learned something, if he had not allowed anxiety and fear to shake him loose of the dream world. That the child should be thankful for the dream, said Sleet. Indeed, and so too with all other bad dreams. We must not be frightened, they tell us, but be grateful for the wisdom of dreams and act on it. So children are told, yes. Even so, adults don't always handle such dreams better than children. I recall some cries and whimpers coming from you in your sleep of late, Valentine. I try to learn from my dreams, however dark they may be. What do you want from me, Valentine? That you come with us to a Lyravoin. Why is that so important to you? Valentine said, You belong to this troop. We are a whole with you and broken without you. The Skandars are masterly jugglers. It hardly matters what the human performers contribute. Carabella and I are with the troop for the same reason as you, to comply with a stupid law. You'll learn your pay whether I'm with you or not. I learn the art from you, though. You can learn from Carabella. She's as skilled as I am, and is your lover besides, who knows you better than I ever could. And the divine spare you, said Sleet in a suddenly terrifying voice, from losing her to the shapeshifters in Illyravoin. It isn't something I fear, said Valentine. He extended his hands toward Sleet. I would have you remain with us. Why? I value you. And I value you, Valentine. But it would give me great pain to go where Zalzan Kabul would have us go. Why is it so urgent for you to insist on my enduring that pain? You might be healed of that pain, said Valentine, if you go to Illyravoin and find that the metamorphs are only harmless primitives. I can live with my pain, Sleep replied. The price of that healing seems too high. We can live with the most horrible wounds. But why not attempt to cure them? There is some other thing not being spoken here, Valentine. Valentine paused and let his breath out slowly. Yes, he said. What is it, then? With some hesitation, Valentine said, Sleet, have I figured in your dreams at all since we met in Pidruid? You have, yes. In what way? How does this matter? Have you dreamed, said Valentine, that I might be somewhat unusual in Majipur, 
someone of more distinction and power than I myself comprehend? Your bearing and poise told me that at our first meeting, and the phenomenal skill with which you learned our art, and the content of your own dreams that you shared with me. And who am I in those dreams, Sleet? A person of might and grace, fallen through deceit from his high position. A duke, maybe. A prince of the realm. Or higher? Sleet licked his lips. Higher, yes. Perhaps. What do you want with me, Valentine? To accompany me to Illyravoin and beyond. Do you tell me that there's truth in what I've dreamed? This I'm yet to learn, said Valentine. But I think there's truth in it, yes. I feel more and more strongly that there must be truth in it. Sendings tell me there's truth in it. My lord, Sleet whispered. Perhaps. Sleet looked at him in amazement and began to fall to his knees. Valentine caught him hastily and held him upright. None of that, he said. The others can see. I want nobody to have an inkling of this. Besides, there remain great areas of doubt. I would not have you kneeling to me, Sleet, or making starbursts with your fingers, or any of that, while I still am uncertain of the truth. My lord, I remain Valentine the juggler. I am frightened now, my lord. I came within a minute of a foul death today, and this frightens me more to stand here quietly talking with you about these things. Call me Valentine. How can I, Sleet asked. You called me Valentine five minutes ago. That was before. Nothing has changed, Sleet. Sleet shook the idea away. Everything has changed, my lord. Valentine sighed heavily. He felt like an impostor, like a fraud, manipulating Sleet in this way. And yet there seemed a purpose to it, and genuine need. If everything has changed, then will you follow me as I command, even to Illyravoin? If I must, said Sleet, dazed. No harm of the kind you fear will come to you among the metamorphs. You will emerge from their country healed of the pain that has racked you. You do believe that, don't you, Sleet? It frightens me to go there. I need you by me in what lies ahead, said Valentine. And through no choice of mine, Illyravoin has become part of my journey. I ask you to follow me there. Sleet bowed his head. If I must, my lord. And I ask you by the same compulsion to call me Valentine and show me no more respect in front of the others than you would have shown me yesterday. As you wish, Sleet said. Valentine. Valentine, said Sleet reluctantly. As you wish, Valentine. Come then. He led Sleet back to the group. Zalzenkavl was, as usual, pacing impatiently. The others were preparing the wagon for departure. To the Skandar, Valentine said, I've talked Sleet into withdrawing his resignation. He'll accompany us to Illyravoin. Zalzenkavl looked altogether dumbfounded. How did you manage to do that? Yes, said Venorcus. What did you say to him, anyway? With a cheerful smile, Valentine said, It would be tedious to explain, I think. Eight. The pace of the journey now accelerated. All day long the wagon purred along the highway, and sometimes well into the evening. Lisa Mon Hulton rode alongside, though her mount, sturdy as it was, needed more rest than those that drew the wagon. And occasionally she fell behind, catching up as opportunity allowed. Carrying her heroic bulk was no easy task for any animal. On they went through a tamed province of city after city, broken only by modest belts of greenery that barely obeyed the letter of the density laws. This province of Mazedon was a place where commercial pursuits kept many millions employed. 
for Mazadone was the gateway to all the territories of the northwestern Zimrowell for goods coming from the east, and the chief transshipment point for overland conveyance of merchandise of Pidruid and Tillamon heading eastward. They passed quickly in and out of a host of interchangeable and forgettable cities. Cynthian and Apurtel and Dewiric time, Mazadone city itself, Borgax and Thagabar beyond it, all of them subdued and quiescent during the morning period for the late duke, and strips of yellow dangling everywhere as sign of sorrow. It seemed to Valentine a heavy thing to shut down an entire province for the death of a duke. What would these people do, he wondered, over the death of a pontifex? How had they responded to the premature passing of the coronal Lord Voriax two years ago? But perhaps they took the going of their local duke more seriously, he thought, for he was a visible figure, real and present among them, whereas to people of Zimrowell, thousands of miles separated from Castlemount or Labyrinth, the powers of Majipur must seem largely abstract figures, mythical, legendary, immaterial. On a planet so large as this, no central authority could govern with real efficiency, only symbolic control. Valentine suspected that much of the stability of Majipur depended on a social contract whereby the local governors, the provincial dukes and the municipal mayors, agreed to enforce and support the edicts of the imperial government, provided that they might do so as they pleased within their own territories. How, he asked himself, can such a contract be upheld when the coronel is not the anointed and dedicated prince, but some usurper, lacking in the grace of the divine through which such fragile social constructs are sustained? He found himself thinking more and more upon such matters during the long, quiet, monotonous hours of the eastward journey. Such thoughts surprised him with their seriousness for he had grown accustomed to the lightness and simplicity of his mind since the early days of Pidruid, and he could feel a progressive enrichment and growing complexity of mental powers now. It was as if whatever spell had been laid upon him was wearing thin, and his true intellect was beginning to emerge. If, that is, any such magic had actually befallen him as his gradually forming hypothesis required. He was still uncertain but his doubts were weakening from day to day. In dreams now he often saw himself in positions of authority. One night it was he, not Zalzan Kavl, who led the band of jugglers. On another he presided in princely robes over some high council of the metamorphs, whom he saw as eerie fog-like wraiths that would not hold the same shape more than a minute at a time. A night later... He had a vision of himself in the marketplace at Thagabar, dispensing justice to the cloth sellers and vendors of bangles in their noisy little disputes. You see, Carabella said, all these dreams speak of power and majesty. Power? Majesty? Sitting on a barrel in a market and expounding on equity to dealers in cotton and linen? In dreams many things are translated. These visions are metaphors of high might. Valentine smiled, but he had to admit the plausibility of the interpretation. One night as they were nearing the city of Kintor, there came to him a most explicit vision of his supposed former life. He was in a room panelled with the finest and rarest of woods, glistening strips of semitan and bannercop and rich dark swamp mahogany and he sat before a sharp-angled desk of burnished palisander, signing documents. The starburst crest was at his right hand. Obsequious secretaries hovered about, and the enormous curving window before him revealed an open gulf of air, as though it looked out upon the titanic slope of Castlemount. Was this a fantasy? Or was it some fugitive fragment of the buried past that had broken free and come floating up in his sleep to approach the surface of his conscious mind. He described the office in the desk to Carabella and to Deliamber, hoping they could tell him how the office of the coronal looked in reality. But they had no more idea of that than they did of what the Pontifex had for breakfast. The Vroon asked him how he had perceived himself when sitting at that palisander desk. Was he golden-haired, 
like the valentine who rode in the juggler's wagon, or dark, like the coronel who had made grand processional through Pidwit in the western provinces. Dark, said valentine immediately. Then he frowned. Or is that so? I was sitting at the desk, not looking at the man who was there, because I was the man. And yet, and yet, Carabella said, in the world of dreams we often see ourselves with our own eyes. I could have been both fair and dark. Now one, now the other. The point escaped me. Now one, now the other, eh? Yes, Deli Amber said. They were almost into Kintor now, after too many days of steady, wearying overland travel. This, the major city of north-central Zimruel, lay in rugged, irregular terrain, broken by lakes and highlands and dark, virtually impassable forests. The route chosen by Deli Amber took the wagon through the city's southwestern suburbs, known as Hot Kintor because of the geothermal marvels there. Great hissing geysers, and a broad, steaming pink lake that bubbled and gurgled ominously, and a mile or two of gray, rubbery-looking fumaroles from which every few minutes came clouds of greenish gases, accompanied by comic belching sounds and deeper, stranger subterranean groans. Here the sky was heavy with big-bellied clouds the color of dull pearls, and although the last of summer still held the land, there was a cool autumnal quality to the thin, sharp wind that blew from the north. The river Zimmer, largest in Zimruel, divided hot Kintor from the city proper. When the travelers came upon it, the wagon emerging suddenly from an ancient district of narrow streets to enter a broad esplanade leading to the Kintor Bridge, Valentine gasped with amazement. What is it? Carabella asked. The river. I never expected it to be as big as this. Are rivers unfamiliar to you? There are none of any consequence between Pidruid and here, he pointed out. I remember nothing clearly before Pidruid. Compared with the Zimmer, said Sleet, there are no rivers of any consequence anywhere. Let him be amazed. To the right and left, so far as Valentine could see, the dark waters of the Zimmer stretched to the horizon. The river was so broad here that it looked more like a bay. He could barely make out the square-topped towers of Kintor on the far shore. Eight or ten mighty bridges spanned the waters here, so vast that Valentine wondered how it had been possible to build them at all. The one that lay directly ahead, Kintor Bridge, was four highways wide, a structure of looping arches that rose and descended and rose and descended in great leaps from bank to bank. A short way downstream was a bridge of entirely different design, a heavy brick roadbed resting on astounding lofty piers, and just upstream was another that seemed made of glass and gleamed with a dazzling brightness. Deli Amber said, That is Coronel Bridge. And to our right, the bridge of the Pontifex. And farther downstream is the one known as the Bridge of Dreams. All of them are ancient and famous. But why try to bridge the river at a place where it's so wide? Valentine asked in bewilderment. Deli Amber said, This is one of the narrowest points. The Zimmer's course, declared the Vroon, was some seven thousand miles, rising northwest of Delorne at the mouth of the rift, and flowing in a southeasterly direction across all of Upper Zimrowell toward the coastal city of Pillaplock on the inner sea. This happy river, navigable for its entire length, was a swift and phenomenally broad stream that flowed in grand sweeping curves like some amiable serpent. Its shores were occupied by hundreds of wealthy cities, major inland ports, of which Kintor was the most westerly. On the far side of Kintor, running off to the northeast and only dimly visible in the cloudy sky, were the jagged peaks of the Kintor marches, nine great mountains on whose chilly flanks lived tribes of rough, high-spirited hunters. These people could be found in Kintor much of the year, exchanging hides and meat for manufactured goods. 
That night in Kintor, Valentine dreamed he was entering the labyrinth to confer with the Pontifex. This was no vague and misty dream, but one with sharp, painful clarity. He stood under harsh winter sunlight on a barren plain, and saw before him a roofless temple with flat white walls, which Deliamber told him was the gateway to the labyrinth. The Vroon and Lysamon Hulton were with him, and Carabella, too, walking in a protective phalanx. But when Valentine stepped out onto the bare slate platform between those white walls, he was alone. A being of sinister and forbidding aspect confronted him. This creature was of alien shape, but belonged to none of the non-human forms long settled on Majipur. Neither Lima nor Gayrog nor Vroon nor Skandar nor Hjort nor Susu Harris, but something mysterious and disturbing. A muscular, thick-armed creature with cratered red skin and a blunt dome of a head, out of which blazed yellow eyes bright with almost intolerable rage. This being demanded Valentine's business with the Pontifex in a low, resonant voice. Kintor Bridge is in need of repair, Valentine replied. It is the ancient duty of the Pontifex to deal with such matters. The yellow-eyed creature laughed. Do you think the Pontifex will care? It is my responsibility to summon his aid. Go then. The guardian of the portal beckoned with sardonic politeness and stepped aside. As Valentine went past, the being uttered a chilling snarl and slammed shut a gateway behind Valentine. Retreat was impossible. Before him lay a narrow winding corridor, sourcelessly lit by some cruel white light that numbed his eyes. For hours Valentine descended on a spiral path. Then the walls of the corridor widened, and he found himself in another roofless temple of white stone, or perhaps the same one as before, for the pockmarked red-skinned being again blocked his way, growling with that unfathomable anger. Behold the Pontifex, the creature said and Valentine looked beyond it into a darkened chamber, and saw the imperial sovereign of Majipur seated upon a throne, clad in robes of black and scarlet, and wearing the royal tiara. And the pontifex of Majipur was a monster with many arms and many legs, and the face of a man but the wings of a dragon, and he sat shrieking and roaring upon the throne like a madman. A terrible whistling sound came from his lips, and the smell of the pontifex was a frightful stink, and the black leathery wings flailed the air with fierce intensity, buffeting Valentine with cold gales. Your Majesty, Valentine said, and bowed, and said again, Your Majesty. Your Lordship, replied the pontifex, and laughed and reached for Valentine and tugged him forward, and then Valentine was on the throne, and the Pontifex, laughing insanely, was fleeing up the brightly lit corridors, running and flapping wings and raving and shrieking, until he was lost from sight. Valentine woke, wet with perspiration, in Carabella's arms. She showed a look of concern bordering on fear, as if the terrors of his dream had been only too obvious to her. And she held him a moment saying nothing, until he had had a chance to comprehend the fact that he was awake. Tenderly she stroked his cheeks. You cried out three times, she told him. There are occasions, he said after gulping a little wine from a flask beside the bed, when it seems more wearying to sleep than to remain awake. My dreams are hard work, Carabella. There's much in your soul that seeks to express itself, my lord. It expresses itself in a very strenuous way, Valentine said, and nestled down against her breasts. If dreams are the source of wisdom, I pray to grow no wiser before dawn. Nine. In Kintor, Zalzan Kavl booked passage for the troop aboard a riverboat bound toward Nimoya and Pilaplok. They would be journeying only a short way down the river, though, to the minor city of Verf, gateway to the Metamorph territory. 
Valentine regretted having to leave the riverboat at Verf, when he could easily, for another ten or fifteen royals, sail all the way to Pillaplock and take ship for the Isle of Sleep. That, after all, and not the shapeshifter reservation, was his most urgent immediate destination. The Isle of the Lady, where perhaps he might find confirmation of the visions that tormented him. But that was not to be. Just yet. Destiny, Valentine thought, could not be rushed. Thus far things had moved with deliberate speed, but towards some definite, if not always understandable, goal. He was no longer the cheerful and simple idler of Pidruid, and although he had no sure knowledge of what it was he was becoming, he had a definite sense of inner transition, of boundaries past and not to be recrossed. He saw himself as an actor in some vast and bewildering drama, the climactic scenes of which were still far away in space and time. The riverboat was a grotesque and fanciful structure, but not without a beauty of sorts. Ocean-going ships such as had been in port at Pidruid were designed for grace and sturdiness, since they would face journeys of thousands of miles between harbors. But the riverboat, a short-haul vessel, was squat and broad-beamed, more of a floating platform than a ship, and as if to compensate for the inelegance of its design, its builders had festooned it with ornament, a great soaring bridge topped with triple figureheads painted in brilliant reds and yellows, an enormous central courtyard almost like a village plaza, with statuary and pavilions and game parlors, and at the stern an upswept superstructure of many levels in which passengers were housed. Below decks were cargo holds, steerage quarters, dining halls, and cabins for the crew, as well as the engine room, from which two gigantic smokestacks sprouted that came curving up the sides of the hull and rose skyward like the horns of a demon. The entire frame of the ship was of wood, metal being too scarce on Majipur for such large-scale enterprises, and stone being generally deemed undesirable for maritime use and the carpenters had exerted their imaginations over nearly every square foot of the surface, decorating it with scrollwork, bizarre dados, outjutting joists, and similar flourishes of a hundred kinds. The riverboat seemed a vast and teeming microcosm. As they waited for sailing, Valentine and Deli Amber and Carabella strolled the deck, thronged with citizens of many districts and of all the races of Majipur. Valentine saw frontiersmen from the mountains beyond Kintor, gay rugs in the finery affected in Dulorn, people of the humid southlands in cool white linens, travellers in sumptuous robes of crimson and green, which Carabella said were typical of western Alhanroel, and many others. The ubiquitous Leomen sold their ubiquitous grilled sausages. Officious Hjorts strutted about in uniforms of the riverboat line, giving information and instructions to those who asked and to many who did not. A Susu Harris family in diaphanous green robes, conspicuous because of their unlikely double-headed bodies and aloof imperious mien, drifted like emissaries from the world of dreams through the crowds, who gave way in automatic deference. And there was one small group of metamorphs on deck that afternoon. Deli Amber saw them first. The little rune made a clucking sound and touched Valentine's hand. See them? Let's hope sleep doesn't. Which ones? Valentine asked. By the railing, standing alone, looking uneasy. They wear their natural form. Valentine stared. There were five of them, perhaps a male and a female adult and three younger ones. They were slender, angular, long-legged beings, the older ones taller than he, with a frail, insubstantial look to them. Their skins were sallow, almost green in hue. Their faces approached the human pattern in construction, except that their cheekbones were sharp as blades, their lips were almost non-existent, and their noses were reduced to mere bumps, and their eyes, set on angles that sloped inward toward the center, were tapered and without pupils. Valentine was unable to decide whether these metamorphs bore themselves with arrogance or with timidity, 
Certainly they must regard themselves as in hostile territory aboard this riverboat. These natives of the ancient race, these descendants of those who had possessed Majipur before the coming of the first earthborn settlers fourteen thousand years ago. He could not take his eyes from them. How is the changing of shape accomplished, he asked. Their bones are not joined like those of most races, answered Deli Amber. Under muscular pressure, they will move and take up new patterns. Also, they have mimicry cells in their skins that allow them to alter color and texture. And there are other adaptations. An adult can transform itself almost instantaneously. And what purpose does this serve? Who can say? Most likely the metamorphs ask what purpose there was in creating races in this universe that are unable to shift shape. It must have some value to them. Very little, said Carabella acidly, if they could have such powers and still have their world snatched away from them. Shifting shape is not enough of a defense, Deli Amber replied, when people travel from one star to another to steal your home. The metamorphs fascinated Valentine. To him they represented artifacts of Majipur's long history, archaeological relics, survivors from the era when there were no humans here, nor skandars, nor vroons, nor gayrogs. Only these fragile green people spread out across a colossal planet. Before the settlers came, the intruders, ultimately the conquerors. How long ago it had been. He wished they would perform a transformation as he watched, perhaps turn into skandars or lee men before his eyes. But they remained unwavering in their identities. Shanamir, looking agitated, appeared suddenly out of the crowd. He seized Valentine's arm and blurted, Do you know what's on board with us? I heard the cargo handlers talking. There's a whole family of shape... Not so loud, Valentine said. Look yonder. The boy looked and shivered. Scary things they are. Where's Sleet? On the bridge, with Zalzan Kavl. They're trying to get a permit to perform tonight. If he sees them... He'll have to confront Metamorph sooner or later, Valentine murmured. To Deli Amber, he said. Is it uncommon for them to be seen outside their reservation? They are found everywhere, but never in great numbers, and rarely in their own form. There might be eleven of them living in Pidruid, say, and six in Falkenkip, nine in Dulorn. Disguised? Yes, as gay rugs or shorts or humans, whatever seems best in a certain place. The metamorphs began to leave the deck. They moved with great dignity, but unlike the little Susu Harris group, there was nothing imperious about them. They seemed rather to give an impression of wishing they were invisible. Valentine said, Do they live in their territory by choice or compulsion? Some of each, I think. When Lord Stiermat completed the conquest, he forced them to leave Alanroel entirely. But Zimroel was barely settled then, just the coastal outposts and they were allowed most of the interior. They chose only the territory between the Zimmer and the southern mountains, though, where access could easily be controlled, and withdrew into that. By now there's a tradition that the metamorphs dwell only in that territory, except for the unofficial few living out in the cities. But I have no idea whether that tradition has force of law. Certainly they pay little attention to the decrees that emerge from the labyrinth or castle mount. If imperial law matters so little to them, are we not taking great risks in going to Illyravoin? Deli Amber laughed. The days when metamorphs attacked outsiders for the sheer love of vengeance are long over, so I am assured. They are a shy and a sullen people, but they will do us no harm, and will probably leave their country intact and well laden with the money that Zalzan Kabul loves so much. Look, here he comes now. The Skandar, with sleep beside him, approached, looking self-satisfied. 
We have arranged the right to perform, he announced. Fifty crowns for an hour's work, right after dinner. We'll give them our simplest tricks, though. Why exert ourselves before we get to Illyravoin? No, Valentine said. We should do our best. He looked hard at Sleet. There's a party of metamorphs aboard this boat. Perhaps they'll carry the word of our excellence ahead of us to Illyravoin. Wisely argued, said Zalzenkabel. Sleet was taut and fearful. His nostrils flickered. His lips compressed. He made holy signs with his left hand at his side. Valentine turned to him and said in a low voice, Now the process of healing begins. Juggle for them tonight as you would for the court of the Pontifex. Hoarsely, Sleet said, They are my enemies. Not these. They are not the ones of your dream. Those have done you all the damage that lay in their power, and it was long ago. It sickens me to be on the same boat. There's no leaving it now, Valentine said. There are only five of them. A small dose. Good practice for meeting what awaits us in Illyravoin. Illyravoin? There is no avoiding Illyravoin, said Valentine. You're pledged to me, Sleet. Sleet regarded Valentine in silence a moment. Yes, my lord, he whispered. Come, then. Juggle with me. We both need practice. And remember to call me Valentine. They found a quiet place below decks and worked out with the clubs. There was an odd reversal in their roles at first, for Valentine juggled flawlessly, while Sleet was as clumsy as a tyro, dropping the clubs constantly and in several instances bruising his fingers. But in a few minutes his disciplines asserted themselves. He filled the air with clubs, interchanging them with Valentine in patterns of such complexity that it left Valentine laughing and gasping, and finally he had to beg a halt and ask Sleet to return to more manageable cascades. That night at the deckside performance, their first since the impromptu event staged for the amusement of the forest brethren, Zals and Kavl ordered a program that they had never done before an audience. The jugglers divided into three groups of three. Sleet, Carabella, and Valentine, Zalzenkavl, Felkar, and Gibor Hairn, Hytrogkavl, Rovorn, and Erfenkavl, and engaged in simultaneous triple exchanges in the same rhythm, one group of Skandars juggling knives, the other flaming torches, and the human silver clubs. It was one of the most severe tests of his skill that Valentine had yet experienced. The symmetry of the routine depended on perfection. One dropped implement by any of the nine would ruin the total effect. He was the weakest link. On him the entire impact of the performance depended, therefore. But he dropped no clubs, and the applause, when the jugglers had ended their act in a flurry of high throws and jaunty catches, was overwhelming. As he took his bows, Valentine noticed the family of metamorphs seated only a few rows away. He glanced at Sleet, who bowed and bowed again, ever more deeply. As they skipped from the stage, Sleet said, I saw them when we started, and then I forgot about them. I forgot about them, Valentine. He laughed. They were nothing at all like the creature I remember from my dream. Ten. The troops slept that night in a dank, crowded hold in the bowels of the riverboat. Valentine found himself jammed between Shanamir and Lisa Monholton on the thinly cushioned floor, and the proximity of the warrior woman seemed to guarantee that he would have no sleep, for her snoring was a fierce, insistent buzz. And more distracting even than the snore was the fear that as her vast body rolled and thrashed about beside him, he would be crushed beneath it. Several times, indeed, she fetched up against him, and he was hard put to extricate himself. But soon she lay more quietly, and he felt sleep stealing over him. A dream came in which he was coronal, Lord Valentine of the Olive Skin and Black Beard, and sat once more in Castlemount, wielding the seals of power, and then somehow he was in a southern city, 
a moist, steaming tropical place of giant vines and gaudy red blossoms, a city that he knew to be Tillamon at the far side of Zimroel, and he attended there a grand feast in his honor. There was another high guest at the table, a somber-eyed man with coarse skin, who was Dominin Bargesid, second son of the King of Dreams. And Dominin Bargesid poured wine in honor of the coronal, and offered toasts, crying out long life and predicting a glorious reign, a reign to rank with those of Lord Stiamat and Lord Pristimian and Lord Confalum. And Lord Valentine drank, and drank again, and grew flushed and merry, and offered toasts of his own, to his guest and to the mayor of Tillamon, and to the duke of the province, and to Simon and Bargesid, the king of dreams, and to the Pontifex Tieverus, and to the lady of the isle, his own beloved mother. And the goblet was filled and filled once again, amber wine and red wine, and the blue wine of the south, until finally he could drink no more, and went to his bedchamber and dropped instantly into sleep. As he slept, figures moved about him, the men of Dominin Bargesid's entourage, lifting him and carrying him wrapped in silken sheets, taking him somewhere. And he could give no resistance, for it seemed to him that his arms and legs would not obey him, as if this were a dream, this scene within a dream. And Valentine beheld himself on a table in a secret room, and now his hair was yellow and his skin was fair, and it was Dominin Bargesid who wore the face of the coronal. Take him to some city in the far north, said the false Lord Valentine, and turn him loose, and let him make his own way upon the world. The dream would have continued, but Valentine found himself smothering in his sleep, and came up into consciousness to discover Lisa Monhulton sprawled against him with one of her beefy arms over his face. With some effort he freed himself, but then there was no returning to sleep. In the morning he said nothing to anyone of his dream. It was becoming time, he suspected, to keep the informations of the night to himself, for they were starting to border on affairs of state. This was the second time he had dreamed of having been supplanted as coronal by Dominin Bargesid, and Carabella, weeks ago, had dreamed that enemies unknown had drugged him and stolen his identity. All these dreams might yet prove to be nothing but fantasy or parable. But Valentine inclined now to doubt that. There was too strong a consistency to them, too frequent a repetition of underlying structures. And if a barges had now wore the starburst crown, what then? What then? The Valentine of Pidruid would have shrugged and said, No matter, one overlord is the same as another. But the Valentine now sailing from Kintor to Verf, took a more thoughtful view of things. There was a balance of power in this world, a balance carefully designed over a span of thousands of years, a system that had been evolving since Lord Stiermont's time, or perhaps earlier. Out of whatever forgotten polities had ruled Majipur in the first centuries of the settlement. And in that system, an inaccessible pontifex ruled through the vehicle of a vigorous and dynamic coronal of his own choosing with the official known as the King of Dreams functioning to execute the commands of the government and chastise lawbreakers by virtue of his entry into the minds of sleepers, and the Lady of the Isle, Mother of the Coronal, contributing a tempering of love and wisdom. There was strength to the system, or else it could not have endured so many thousands of years. Under it, Majipur was a happy and prosperous world, Subject true to the frailties of flesh and the vagaries of nature, but mainly free of conflict and suffering. What now, Valentine wondered, if a bargesid of the king's blood were to put aside a lawfully constituted coronal and interpose himself in that divinely ordained balance? What harm to the commonwealth? What disruption of public tranquility? And what might be said of a fallen coronal who chooses to accept his altered destiny and leaves the usurper unchallenged? Was that not an abdication? And had there ever been an abdication of a coronal in Majipur's history? 
Would he not thereby become a co-conspirator in Dominin Bargesid's overthrow of order? The last of his hesitations were going from him. It had seemed a comical thing, or a bizarre one, to Valentine the juggler, when the first hints had come to him that he might be truly Lord Valentine the coronal. That had been an absurdity, a lunacy, a farce. No longer. The texture of his dreams carried the weight of plausibility. A monstrous thing had happened indeed. The full import of it was only now coming clear to him. And it was his task that he must accept without further question to set things right. But how? Challenge an incumbent coronal? Rise up in juggler's costume to claim Castlemount? He spent the morning quietly, giving no hint of his thoughts. Mostly he remained at the rail, staring at the far-off shore. The river's immensity was beyond his understanding. At some points here it was so wide that no land could be seen, and in other places what Valentine took to be the shore turned out to be islands, themselves of great size, with miles of water between their farther sides and the river bank. The flow of the river was strong, and the huge riverboat was being swept rapidly along eastward. The day was bright, and the river rippled and glinted in the sparkling sunlight. In the afternoon a light rain began to fall, out of clouds so compact that the sunlight remained bright around them. The rain increased in intensity, and the jugglers were forced to cancel their second performance, to Zalz and Kavl's great annoyance. They huddled under cover. That night Valentine took care to sleep beside Carabella, and left the snores of Lisa Manhulton for the Skandars to cope with. He waited almost eagerly for revealing new dreams. But what came to him was useless, the ordinary formless hodgepodge of fantasy and chaos, of nameless streets and unfamiliar faces, of bright lights and garish colors, of absurd disputes, disjointed conversations, and unfocused images. And in the morning the riverboat arrived at the port of Verf on the river's southern bank. 11. The province of the Metamorphs said Orifan de Amber, is named Purifane, after the name by which the Metamorphs call themselves in their own language, which is Purivar. It is bounded on the north by the outlying suburb of Verf, on the west by the Velithis Scarp, on the south by the substantial range of mountains known as the Gongars, and on the east by the river Staichi, an important tributary of the Zimmer. I have beheld each of those boundary zones with my own eyes, though I have never entered Purifane itself. To enter is difficult, for the Velithis Scarp is a sheer wall a mile high and three hundred miles long. The Gongars are storm-swept and disagreeable, and the Staichi is a wild, unruly river full of rapids and turbulence. The only rational way in is through Verf and down through Purifane Gate. The jugglers now were only a few miles north of that entrance, having left the drab mercantile city of Verf as quickly as possible. The rain, light but insistent, had continued all morning. The countryside here was unexciting, a place of light sandy soil and dense stands of dwarf trees with pale green bark and narrow twittering leaves. There was little conversation in the wagon. Sleet seemed lost in meditation. Carabella juggled three red balls obsessively in the mid-cabin space. The Skandars, who were not driving, engaged in some intricate game played with slivers of ivory and packets of black troll whiskers. Shanomir dozed. Vinorkis made entries in a journal he carried. Deli Amber entertained himself with minor incantations, the lighting of tiny necromantic candles, and other wizardly amusements. And Lisa Manhulton, who had hitched her mount to the team drawing the wagon so that she could come in from the rain, snored like a beached sea dragon, awakening now and then to gulp a globlet of the cheap grey wine she had bought in Verf. Valentine sat in a corner, up against a window, thinking of Castle Mount. What could it be like a mountain thirty miles high, 
a single stone shaft rising like a colossal tower into the dark night of space. If Velothis Scarp, a mile high, was, as Deli Amber said, an impassable wall, what sort of barrier was a thing thirty times as tall? What shadow did Castlemount cast when the sun was in the east? A dark stripe running the length of Alhanroel? And how were the cities on its lofty slope provided with warmth and air to breathe? Some machines of the ancients, Valentine had heard, that manufactured heat and light and dispensed sweet air, miraculous machines of that forgotten technological era of thousands of years ago, when the old arts brought from earth still were widely practiced here. But he could no more comprehend how such machines might work than he understood what forces operated the engines of memory in his own mind to tell him that this dark-haired woman was Carabella, this white-haired man Sleet. He thought, too, of Castlemount's highest reaches, and that building of forty thousand rooms at its summit, Lord Valentine's castle now, Lord Voriax not so long ago, Lord Malibor's when he was a boy in that childhood he no longer remembered. Lord Valentine's Castle. Was there really such a place? Or was the castle and its mount only a fable, a vision, a fantasy such as comes in dreams? Lord Valentine's Castle. He imagined it clinging to the mountaintop like a coat of paint, a bright splash of color just a few molecules thick, or so it would seem against the titanic scale of that impossible mountain a splash that coursed irregularly down the flank of the summit in a tentacular way, hundreds of rooms extending on this face, hundreds more on that, a cluster of great chambers extending themselves pseudopod fashion here, a nest of courtyards and galleries over there. And in its innermost place, the coronal in all grandeur, dark-bearded Lord Valentine. Except that the coronal would not be there now, he would still be making his grand processional through the realm, in Nimoya by now or some other eastern city. And I, thought Valentine, I once lived on that mount, dwelled in that castle. What did I do when I was coronal? What decrees, what appointments, what duties? The whole thing was inconceivable, and yet, and yet he felt the conviction growing in him. There was fullness and density and substance to the phantom bits of memory that drifted through his mind. He knew now that he had been born not in Nimoya, by the river's bend, as the false recollections planted in his mind had it, but rather in one of the fifty cities high up on the mount, almost at the verge of the castle itself, and that he had been reared among the royal caste, among that cadre from which princes were chosen that his childhood and boyhood had been one of privilege and comfort. He still had no memory of his father, who must have been some high prince of the realm, nor could he recall anything of his mother except that her hair was dark and her skin was swarthy, as his once had been. And a memory rushed into his awareness out of nowhere, and that she had embraced him a long while one day, weeping a little, before she told him that Voriax had been chosen as coronal in the place of the drowned Lord Malabar, and she would go thenceforth to live as lady on the Isle of Sleep. Was there truth to that, or had he imagined it just now? He would have been, Valentine paused, calculating, twenty-two years old, very likely, when Voriax came to power. Would his mother have embraced him at all? Would she have wept on becoming lady, or rather rejoice that she and her eldest son were chosen powers of Majipur? To weep and to rejoice at once, maybe. Valentine shook his head. These mighty scenes, these moments of potent history, would he ever regain access to them? Or was he always to labor under the handicap placed upon him by those who had stolen his past? There was a tremendous explosion in the distance, a long, low, ground-shaking boom that brought everyone in the wagon to attention. It continued for several minutes and gradually subsided to a quiet throb, then to silence. What was that? Sleet cried, 
groping in the rack for an energy thrower. Peace, peace, Deli Amber said. It is the sound of Purifane Fountain. We are approaching the boundary. Purifane Fountain, Valentine asked. Wait and see, Deli Amber told him. The wagon came to a halt a few minutes later. Zalzan Kabul turned round from the driver's seat and yelled, Where's that rune? Wizard, there's a roadblock up ahead. We are at Purifane Gate, said Deli Amber. A barricade made of stout, glossy yellow logs lashed with a bright emerald twine spanned the narrow roadway, and to the left of it was a guardhouse occupied by two shorts in customs official uniform of grey and green. They ordered everyone out of the wagon and into the rain, though they themselves were under a protective canopy. Where bound? asked the fatter Hjort. Ilirevoin, to play at the Shapeshifter Festival. We are jugglers, said Zalzenkavl. Permit to enter Purifane Province, the other Hjort demanded. No such permits are required, Deli Amber said. You speak too confidently, Vroon. By decree of Lord Valentine the Coronal, more than a month past, no citizens of Majipur enter the metamorph territory except on legitimate business. Ours is legitimate business, growled Zalzan Kavl. Then you would have a permit. But we knew nothing of the need for one, the Skandar protested. The shorts looked indifferent to that. They seemed ready to turn their attention to other matters. Zalzan Kavl glanced toward Vinorkis as though expecting him to have some sort of influence with his compatriots. But the Hjort merely shrugged. Zalzan Kavl glared at Deli Amber next and said, It falls within your responsibilities, wizard, to advise me of such matters. The Vroon shrugged. Not even wizards can learn of changes in the law that happen while they travel in forest preserves and other remote places. But what do we do now, turn back to Verf? The idea seemed to bring a glow of delight to Sleet's eyes. Reprieved from this metamorph adventure after all. But Zalzan Kavl was fuming. Lisa Mon Hulton's hand strayed to the hilt of her vibration sword. Valentine stiffened at that. He said quietly to Zalzan Kavl, Shorts are not always incorruptible. A good thought, the Skandar murmured. Zalzan Kavl drew forth his money pouch. Instantly the attention of the Shorts sharpened. This was indeed the right tactic, Valentine decided. Perhaps I have found the necessary document, said Zalzan Kavl. Ostentatiously removing two one-crown pieces from the pouch, he caught a Hjort's rough-skinned, puffy hand in one of his, and with the others pressed a coin into each palm, smiling his most self-satisfied smile. The Hjort's exchanged glances and they were not glances of bliss. Contemptuously they allowed the coins to fall to the muddy ground. A crown? Carabella muttered in disbelief. He expected to buy them with a crown? Bribing an officer of the imperial government is a serious offense, the fatter Hjort declared ominously. You are under arrest and remanded for trial to Verf. Remain in your vehicle until appropriate escort can be found for you. Zalzan Kavl looked outraged. He whirled, began to say something to Valentine, choked it off, gestured angrily at Deli Amber, made a growling noise, and spoke in a low voice and in the Skandar language to the three nearest of his brothers. Lisa Mon Hulton again began to finger her sword hilt. Valentine felt despair. There would be two dead shorts here in another moment, and the jugglers would all be criminal fugitives at the edge of Purifane. That was not likely to speed his journey to the Lady of the Isle. Do something quickly, Valentine said under his breath to Autophon Deliamber. But the Vrunish sorcerer was already in motion. Stepping forward, he snatched up the money and offered it again to the Hjorts, saying, Your pardon, but you must have it dropped at these small coins. He dropped them into the Hjorts' hands, 
and at the same time allowed the tips of his tentacles to coil lightly about their wrists for an instant. When he released them, the thinner Hjort said, Your visa is good for three weeks only, and you must leave Purifane by way of this gate. Other exit points are illegal for you. Not to mention very dangerous, added the other. He gestured, and unseen figures pulled the barricade sideways fifteen feet along a buried track, so that there was room for the wagon to proceed. As they entered the wagon, Zalzenkavl said furiously to Valentine, In the future give me no illegal advice. And you, Deliamber, make yourself aware of the regulations that apply to us. This could have caused us great delay and much loss of income. Perhaps if you had tried bribing with royals instead of crowns, Carabella said, beyond the Skandar's range of hearing, we would have had a simpler time of it. No matter, no matter, Deli Amber said. We were admitted, were we not? It was only a small sorcery, and cheaper than a heavy bribe. These new laws, Sleep began, so many decrees. A new coronal, said Lisa Monhalton. He wants to show his power. They always do. They decree this, they decree that, and the old pontifex goes along with everything. This one decreed me right out of a job. Do you know that? How so? Valentine asked. I was bodyguard to a merchant in Mazedon, much afraid of jealous rivals. This Lord Valentine placed a new tax on personal bodyguards for anyone below noble rank amounting to my whole year's salary. And my employer, damn his ears, let me go on a week's notice. Two years, and it was good-bye, Lisamon. Thank you very much. Take a bottle of my best brandy as your going-away gift. She belched resonantly. One day I was the defender of his miserable life, the next I was a superfluous luxury, and all thanks to Lord Valentine. Oh, poor Voriax! Do ye think his brother had him murdered? Guard your tongue, Sleet snapped. Such things aren't done on Majipur. But she persisted. A hunting accident, was it? And the last one, old Malabor, drowned while out fishing? Why are our coronals suddenly dying so strangely? It never happened before like this, did it? They went on to become pontifex, they did and hid themselves away in the labyrinth and lived next to forever. And now here we have Malabor feeding the sea dragons and Boreax taking a careless boat in the forest. She belched again. I wonder. Up there on Castlemount, maybe they're getting too hungry for the taste of power. Enough, Sleep said, looking uncomfortable with such talk. Once a new coronal's picked, all the rest of the princes are finished, you know. No hope of advancement. Unless, 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 unless the coronal should die. And back they go into the hopper to be picked again. When Voriax died and this Valentine came to rule, I said, Stop it, Sleet cried. He rose to his full height, which was hardly chest high to the warrior woman and his eyes blazed as if he planned to chop her off at the thighs to equalize matters between them. She remained at her ease, but her hand again was wandering toward her sword. Smoothly, Valentine interposed himself. She means no offense to the coronal, he said gently. She is fond of wine, and it loosens her tongue. And to Lisa Monhalton, he said, Forgive him, will you? My friend is under strain in this part of the world, as you know. A second enormous explosion, five times as loud and fifty times as frightening as the one that had occurred half an hour earlier, interrupted the discussion. The mounts reared and squealed. The wagon lurched. Zalzan Kavl shouted ferocious curses from the driver's seat. Purifane Fountain, Delhi Amber announced. One of the great sights of Majipur. Well worth getting wet to see. Valentine and Carabella rushed from the wagon, the others close behind. They had come to an open place in the road, where the forest of little green bold trees fell away to create a kind of natural amphitheater, completely without vegetation, running perhaps half a mile back from the highway. 
At its farther end a geyser was in eruption, but a geyser that was to the ones Valentine had seen at Hot Kintor as a sea dragon is to a minnow. This was a column of frothing water that seemed taller than the tallest tower in Dulorn, a white shaft rising five hundred feet, six hundred, possibly even more, roaring out of the ground with incalculable force. At its upper end, where its unity broke and gave way to streamers and spouts and ropes of water that darted off in many directions, a mysterious light appeared to glow, kindling a whole spectrum of hues at the fringes of the column, pinks and pearls and crimsons and pale lavenders and opals. A warm spray filled the air. The eruption went on and on, an incredible volume of water driven by incredible might into the sky. Valentine felt his entire body massaged by the subterranean forces that were at work. He stared in awe and wonder, and it was almost with shock that he realized that the event was ending. The column now was shrinking, no more than four hundred feet, three hundred. Now just a pathetic strand of white sinking toward the ground. Now only forty feet, thirty, and then gone. Gone. Vacant air where that stunning shaft had been. Droplets of warm moisture as its only revenant. Every thirty minutes, Ortefan Deliamber informed them. As long as the metamorphs have lived on Majipur, so it is said, that geyser has never been a minute late. It is a sacred place to them. See, there are pilgrims now. Sleet caught his breath and began making holy signs. Valentine put a steadying hand to his shoulder. Indeed, metamorphs, shapeshifters, purivars, a dozen or more of them, gathered at a kind of wayside shrine not far ahead. They were looking at the travelers, and Valentine thought not in a particularly friendly way. Several of the aborigines in the front of the group stepped briefly behind others and when they reappeared they looked strangely blurred and indistinct. But that was not all, for they had undergone transformations. One had sprouted great cannonballs of breasts, in caricature of Lisa Monholton, and another had grown four shaggy Skandar arms, and another was mimicking Sleet's white hair. They made a curious thin sound which might have been the metamorph version of laughter, and then the entire group slipped away into the forest. Valentine did not release his grip on Sleet's shoulder until he felt some of the tension ebb from the little juggler's rigid body. Lightly, he said, A good trick, that is. If we could do that, perhaps grow some extra arms in the middle of our act. What do you say, Sleet? Would you like that? I would like to be in Narabal, Sleet said, or Pillaplock or someplace else very far from here. And I in Falkenkip, feeding slops to my mount, said Shanamir who looked pale and shaken. They mean us no harm, Valentine said. This will be an interesting experience, one that we will never forget. He smiled broadly, but there were no smiles about him, not even on Carabella, Carabella the inextinguishably buoyant. Zalzan Kavl himself looked oddly discomfited, as if perhaps he might now be having second thoughts about the wisdom of pursuing his love of royals into the Metamorph province. Valentine could not, by sheer force of optimistic energy alone, give his companions much cheer. He looked toward Deliamber. How far is it to Illyravorn? he asked. It lies somewhere ahead, the Vroon replied. How far I have no idea. We will come to it when we come to it. It was not an encouraging reply. Twelve. This was primordial country, timeless, unspoiled, an outpost of time's early dawn on civilized and housebroken Majipur. The shapeshifters lived in rainforest land, where daily downpours cleansed the air and let vegetation run riot. Out of the north came the frequent storms, down into that natural funnel formed by Velithis Scarp and the Gongars. And as the moist air rose in the ascent of the Gongar foothills, gentle rains were released, 
that soaked the light, spongy soil. Trees grew tall and slender trunked, sprouting high and forming thick canopies far overhead. Networks of creepers and lianas tied the treetops together. Cascades of dark leaves, tapering, drip-tipped, glistened as if polished by the rain. Where there were breaks in the forest, Valentine could see distant, green-cloaked, mist-wrapped mountains, heavy-shouldered, forbidding, great mysterious bulks crouching on the land. Of wildlife there was little, at least not much that let itself be seen. An occasional red and yellow serpent slithering along a bough, an infrequent green and scarlet bird or toothy, web-winged brown air lizard fluttering overhead, and once a frightened billantoon that scampered delicately in front of the wagon and vanished into the woods with a flurry of its sharp little hooves and a panicky wigwagging of its upturned, tufted tail. Probably forest brethren lurked here, since several groves of dwicker trees came into view. And no doubt the streams were thick with fish and reptiles, the forest floor teemed with burrowing insects and rodents of fantastic hue and shape. And for all Valentine knew, each of the innumerable dark little lakes held its own monstrous submerged amorphobot that arose by night to prowl, all neck and teeth and beady eyes, for whatever prey came within reach of its massive body. But none of these things made themselves apparent as the wagon sped southward over the rough, narrow wilderness road. Nor were the pure of ours themselves much in evidence. Now and then a well-worn trail leading into the jungle, or a few flimsy wickerwork huts visible just off the road, or a party of half a dozen pilgrims heading on foot up toward the shrine at the fountain. They were, said Deli Amber, a folk that lived by hunting and fishing, and collecting wild fruits and nuts, and a certain amount of agriculture. Possibly their civilization had once been more advanced, for ruins had been discovered, especially on Alhanroel, of large stone cities thousands of years old, that might have dated from early pure of our times before the starships arrived. Although, Delhi Amber said, there were some historians who maintained that the ruins were those of ancient human settlements, founded and destroyed in the turbulent pre-pontifical period twelve to thirteen thousand years ago. At any rate, the metamorphs, if they had ever had a more complex way of life, now preferred to be forest dwellers. Whether that was retrogression or progress, Valentine could not say. By mid-afternoon, the sound of Purifane Fountain could no longer be heard behind them, and the forest was more open, more thickly settled. The road was unmarked, and unexpectedly it forked in a place where no clues were to be had to anything beyond. Zalz and Carvel looked for guidance to Deli Amber, who looked to Lisa Monhalton, Damn my gut if I could say, the giantess boomed. Pick one at random. We've got a fifty-fifty chance of getting to Illyravoin on it. But Deli Amber had a better idea, and knelt down in the mud to cast an inquiry spell. He took from his pack a couple of cubes of a wizardy incense. Shielding them from the rain with his cloak, he ignited them to create a pale brown smoke. This he inhaled while waving his tentacles in intricate curlicues. The warrior woman snorted and said, It's only a fraud. He'll wiggle his arms for a while and then he'll make a guess. Fifty-fifty for Illyravoin. The left fork, Deli Amber announced eventually. It was good sorcery, or else lucky guessing. For shortly, signs of metamorph occupation increased. There were no more isolated scatterings of lonely huts, but now little clumps of wickerwork dwellings, eight or ten or more close together every hundred yards, and then even closer. There was much foot traffic, too, mainly aboriginal children carrying light burdens in slings dangling from their heads. Many stopped as the wagon went by, and stared and pointed and made little chittering sounds between their teeth. Definitely they were approaching a large settlement. The road was crowded with children and older metamorphs, and dwellings were numerous. The children were an unsettling crew. They seemed to be practicing their immature skills at transformation as they walked along, 
and took many forms, most of them bizarre. One had sprouted legs like stilts, another had tentacular runish arms that dangled almost to the ground. A third had swollen its body to a globular mass supported by tiny props. Are we the circus entertainers, Sleet asked, or are they? These people sicken me. Peace, Valentine said softly. In a grim voice, Carabella said, I think some of the entertainments here are dark ones. Look! Just ahead were a dozen large wicker cages by the side of the road. Teams of bearers, having apparently just put them down, were resting beside them. Through the bars of the cages, small, long-fingered hands were thrust, and some prehensile tails coiling in anguish. As the wagon drew alongside, Valentine saw that the cages were full of forest brethren, jammed three and four together, on their way to Illyravoin for... What? To be slaughtered for food? To be tormented at the festival? Valentine shivered. Wait! Shonamir blurted, as they rode past the final cage. What's that in there? The last cage was bigger than the others, and what it held was no forest brother, but rather some other sort of captive, a being of obvious intelligence, tall and strange, with dark blue skin, fierce and desolate purple eyes of extraordinary intensity and luminosity, and a wide, thin-lipped slash of a mouth. Its clothing, a fine green fabric, was ripped and tattered, and splotched with dark stains, possibly blood. It gripped the bars of its cage with terrible force, shaking and tugging at them, and cried out hoarsely at the jugglers for help in an odd, totally unfamiliar accent. The wagon went on. Chilled, Valentine said to Deli Amber, That is no being of Majipur. No, Deli Amber said, none that I have seen before. I saw one once, Lisa Mon Holton put in. An off-worlder, native to some star close by here, though I forget the name of it. But what would off-worlders be doing here, Carabella asked. There's little traffic between the stars these days, and few ships come to Majipur. Still, some do, Deli Amber said. We are not yet totally cut off from the star lanes, though certainly we are considered a backwater in the commerce of the worlds. And... Are you all mad, Sleet burst out in exasperation? Sitting here like scholars discussing the commerce between the worlds, and in that cage is a civilized being crying for help, who probably will be stewed and eaten at the Metamorph Festival. And we pay no attention to its cries, but ride blithely onward into their city? He made a tormented sound of anger and went rushing forward to the Skandars on the driver's seat. Valentine, fearing trouble, went after him. Sleet tugged at Zalzenkovel's cloak. Did you see it, he demanded. Did you hear? The offworlder in the cage. Without turning, Zalzenkovel said, So? You'll ignore its cries? This is no affair of ours, the Skandar replied evenly. Shall we liberate the prisoners of an independent people? They must have some reason for arresting that being. Reason? Yes, to cook him for dinner. And we'll be in the next pot. I ask you to go back and release Impossible. At least let's ask of it why it's caged. Zalzenkabel, we may be riding blithely to our deaths. Are you in such a hurry to reach Illyravoin that you'll ride right past someone who may know something about conditions here, and who is in such a plight? What Sleet says has wisdom in it, Valentine remarked. Very well, Zalzenkavl snorted. He pulled the wagon to a halt. Go and investigate, Valentine, but be quick about it. I'll go with him, Sleet said. Stay here. If he feels he needs a bodyguard, let him take the giantess. That seemed sensible. Valentine beckoned to Lisa Monholton, and they got down from the wagon and strode back toward the place of the cages. Instantly the forest brethren set up a frantic screeching and a banging on their bars. The metamorph bearers, 
armed, Valentine noticed now, with effective-looking short dirks of polished horn or wood, unhurriedly formed themselves into a phalanx in the road, keeping Valentine and Lisa Monholton from a closer approach to the large cage. One metamorph, plainly the leader, stepped forward and waited with menacing calmness for inquiries. Valentine said quietly to the giantess, Will he speak our language? Probably. Try it. We are a troop of roving jugglers, Valentine said in a loud, clear voice. Come to perform at the festival we hear you hold at Illyravoin. Are we near Illyravoin now? The metamorph, half a head taller than Valentine, though much flimsier of build, seemed amused. You are in Illyravoin, was the cool, remote reply. Valentine moistened his lips. These metamorphs gave off a thin, sharp odor, acrid but not disagreeable. Their strangely sloped eyes were frighteningly expressionless. He said, To whom would we go to make arrangements for performing in Illyravoin? The Donny Pure interviews all strangers who come to Illyravoin. You will find her at the House of Offices. The metamorph's frosty, self-contained manner was disconcerting. After a moment, Valentine said, One thing more. We see that in that large cage you keep a being of an unfamiliar sort. May I ask for what purpose? Punishment. A criminal? So it is said. The metamorph replied distantly. Why does this concern you? We are strangers in your land. If strangers are placed in cages here, we might prefer to find employment somewhere else. There was a flicker of some emotion. Amusement? Contempt? Around the metamorph's mouth and nostrils. Why should you fear such a thing? Are you criminals? Hardly. Then you will not be caged. Pay your respects to the Donipure and address further questions to her. I have important tasks to complete. Valentine looked toward Lisa Monhalton, who shrugged. The metamorph walked away. There was nothing more to do but return to the wagon. The bearers were lifting the cages and fastening them to poles laid across their backs. From the large cage came a roar of anger and despair. Thirteen Illyravoin was neither a city nor a village, but something intermediate, a forlorn concentration of many low, impermanent-looking structures of withes and light woods, arranged along irregular, unpaved streets that seemed to stretch for considerable distances into the forest. The place had a makeshift look, as though Illyravoin might have been located elsewhere a few years ago and might be in an altogether other district a few years hence. That it was festival time in Illyravoin was signaled, apparently, by fetish sticks of some sort planted in front of almost every house, thick-shaven stakes to which bright ribbons and bits of fur had been attached. Also, on many streets, scaffolding had been erected, as for performances, or, thought Valentine uneasily, for tribal rites of some darker kind. Finding the house of offices in the Donipur was simple. The main street opened into a broad plaza, bordered on three sides by small domed buildings with ornately woven roofs, and on the fourth by a larger structure, the first three-story building they had seen in Illyravoin with an elaborate garden of globular, thick-stemmed gray and white shrubs in front of it. Zalz and Kabul drew the wagon into a clearing just outside the plaza. Come with me, the Skandar said to Deli Amber. We'll see what we can arrange. They were inside the House of Offices a long while. When they emerged, a female metamorph of great presence and authority was with them, doubtless the Donipure and the three stood together by the garden in elaborate conversation. The Donipur pointed. Zalzan Kavl alternately nodded and shook his head. Orifan Deliamber, 
dwarfed between the two tall beings, made frequent graceful gestures of diplomatic conciliation. Finally, Zalz and Kavl and the Vroon returned to the wagon. The Skandar's mood seemed brighter. We've come just in time, he announced. The festival has already begun. Tomorrow night is one of the major holidays. Will they pay us, Sleet asked. So it would seem, said Zalz and Kavl. But they will supply us with no food and no lodging either, for Illyravoin is without hostelries, and there are certain specified zones of the city that we may not enter. I have had friendlier welcomes in other places, but also less friendly ones now and then, I suppose. Crowds of solemn, silent metamorph children trailed after them as they moved the wagon from the plaza to an area just back of it where they could park. In late afternoon they held a practice session, and though Lisa Mon Hulton did her formidable best to clear the young metamorphs from the scene and keep them away, it was impossible to prevent them from slipping back, emerging between trees and out of bushes to stare at the jugglers. Valentine found it unnerving to work in front of them, and he was plainly not the only one, for Sleet was tense and uncharacteristically awkward, and even Zalz and Carvel, the master of masters, dropped a club for the first time in Valentine's memory. The silence of the children was disturbing. They stood like blank-eyed statues, a remote audience that drained energy and gave none in return. But even more troublesome was their trick of metamorphosis, their way of slipping from one shape to another as casually as a human child might suck its thumb. Mimicry was their apparent purpose for the forms they took were crude, half-recognizable versions of the jugglers, such as the older metamorphs had attempted earlier at Purifane Fountain. The children held the forms only briefly. Their skills seemed feeble. But in the pauses between routines, Valentine saw them now sprouting golden hair for him, white for Sleet, black for Carabella, or making themselves bearish and many-armed like the Skandars, or trying to imitate faces, Individual features, expressions, everything done in a distorted and unflattering way. The travellers slept crammed aboard the wagon that night, one packed close upon the other, and all night, so it seemed, a steady rain fell. Valentine only occasionally was able to sleep. He dropped into light dozes, but mainly he lay awake listening to Lisa Manhulton's lusty snoring or the even more grotesque sounds coming from the Skandars. Somewhere in the night he must have had some real sleep, for a dream came to him, hazy and incoherent, in which he saw the metamorphs leading a procession of prisoners, forest brethren and the blue-skinned alien, up the road toward Purifane Fountain, which erupted and rose above the world like a colossal white mountain. And again toward morning he slept soundly for a time, until Sleet woke him by shaking his shoulder a little before dawn. Valentine sat up, rubbing his eyes. What is it? Come outside, I have to talk. It's still dark. Even so, come. Valentine yawned, stretched, got creakily to his feet. He and Sleet picked their way carefully over the slumbering forms of Carabelle and Shanamir, went warily around one of the Skandars, and down the steps of the wagon. The rain had stopped, but the morning was dark and chilly, and a nasty fog rose from the ground. I have had a sending, Sleet said, from the lady, I think. Of what sort? About the blue-skinned one, in the cage, that they said was a criminal going to be punished. In my dream he came to me and said he was no criminal at all but only a traveller who had made the error of entering shapeshifter territory, and had been captured because it's their custom to sacrifice a stranger in Purifane Fountain at festival time. And I saw how it is done, the victim bound hand and foot and left in the basin of the fountain, and when the explosion comes he is hurled far into the sky. Valentine felt a chill that did not come from the morning mist. I dreamed something similar, he said. In my dream I heard more, Sleet went on, that we are in danger too, not perhaps from sacrifice, but in danger all the same, 
and if we rescue the alien, he will help us to safety. But if we leave him to die, we will not leave pure of our country alive. You know I fear these shapeshifters, Valentine. But this dream is something new. It came to me with the clarity of ascending. It ought not be dismissed as more fears of foolish sleet. What do you want to do? Rescue the alien. Valentine said uneasily, And if he really was a criminal, by what right do we meddle in pure of our justice? By right of sending, said Sleet. Are those forest brethren criminals too? I saw them also go into the fountain. We are among savages, Valentine. Not savages, no, but strange folk whose way is not like the ways of Majipur. I'm determined to set the blue-skinned one free, if not with your help, then by myself. Now? What better time, Sleet asked. It's still dark, quiet. I'll open the cage. He'll slip off into the jungle. You think the cage is unguarded? No, Sleet, wait. This makes no sense. You'll jeopardize us all if you act now. Let me try to find out more about this prisoner and why he's caged, and what's intended for him. If they do mean to sacrifice him, they do it at some high point of the festival. There's time. The sending is on me now, Sleet said. I dreamed a dream something like yours, but not a sending. Not a sending, no. Still enough to let me think your dream holds truth. I'll help you, Sleet, but not now. This isn't the moment for it. Sleet looked restless. Clearly in his mind he was already on the way to the place of the cages, and Valentine's opposition was thwarting him. Sleet? Yes? Hear me. This is not the moment. There is time. Valentine looked steadily at the juggler. Sleet returned his gaze with equal steadfastness for a moment. Then, abruptly, his resolve broke, and he lowered his eyes. Yes, my lord, he said quietly. During the day, Valentine tried to gain information about the prisoner, but with little success. The cages, eleven holding forest brethren and the twelfth holding the alien, now had been installed in the plaza opposite the House of Offices, stacked in four tiers with the alien's cage alone on high, far above the ground. Purivars armed with dirks guarded them. Valentine approached, but he was only halfway across the plaza when he was stopped. A metamorph told him, This is forbidden for you to enter. The forest brethren began frantically to rattle their bars. The blue-skinned one called out, thickly accented words that Valentine could barely understand. Was the alien saying, Flee, fool, before they kill you too? Or was that only Valentine's heightened imagination at work? The guards held a tight cordon around the place. Valentine turned away. He attempted to ask some children nearby if they could explain the cages to him. But they looked at him in obstinate silence, giving him cool, blank-eyed stares and murmuring to one another and making little partial metamorphoses that mimicked his fair hair. And then they scattered and ran as though he were some sort of demon. All morning long, metamorphs entered Illyravorn, swarming in from the outlying forest settlements. They brought with them decorations of many sorts— Wreaths and buntings and draperies and mirror-bedecked posts and tall poles carved with mysterious runes. Everyone seemed to know what to do, and everyone was intensely busy. No rain fell after sunrise. Was it by witchcraft, Valentine wondered, that the pure of ours provided a rare dry day for their high holiday, or only coincidence? By mid-afternoon the festivities were underway. Small bands of musicians played heavy, pulsating, jangling music of eccentric rhythm, and throngs of metamorphs danced a slow and stately pattern of interweavings, moving almost like sleepwalkers. On certain streets races were run. 
and judges stationed at points along the course engaged in intricate arguments as the races went past them. Booths apparently constructed during the night dispensed soups, stews, beverages, and grilled meats. Valentine felt like an intruder in this place. He wanted to apologize to the metamorphs for having come among them at their holiest time. Yet no one but the children seemed to be paying the slightest attention to them, and the children evidently regarded them as curiosities brought here for their amusement. Young, shy metamorphs lurked everywhere, flashing jumbled imitations of Delhi Amber and Sleet and Zalz and Carvel and the rest, but never allowing anyone to get close to them. Zalz and Carvel had called a rehearsal for late afternoon, back of the wagon. Valentine was one of the first to arrive, glad of an excuse to remove himself from the crowded streets. He found only Sleet and two of the Skandars. It seemed to him that Zalzan Kabul was eyeing him in an odd way. There was something new and disturbing about the quality of the Skandar's attentiveness. After a few minutes, Valentine was so troubled by it that he said, Is something wrong? What would be wrong? You seem out of countenance. I? I? Nothing's the matter. A dream is all. I was thinking on a dream I had last night. You dreamed of the blue-skinned prisoner? Zalz and Kavl looked baffled. Why do you think that? I did, and Sleet. My dream had nothing at all to do with the blue-skinned one, the Skandar replied. Nor do I wish to discuss it. It was foolishness, mere foolishness. And Zalz and Kavl, moving away, picked up a double brace of knives and began to juggle them in an edgy, absent-minded way. Valentine shrugged. It had not even occurred to him that Skandars had dreams, let alone that they might have troublesome ones. But, of course, they were citizens of Majipur. They shared in all the attributes of people here. And so they must live full and rich dream lives like everyone else, with sendings from king and lady, and stray intrusions from the minds of lesser beings, and upwellings of self from their own deeper reaches, even as humans did, or, Valentine supposed, hjorts and runes and lee-men. Still, it was curious. Zalz and Kavl was so guarded of emotion, so unwilling to let anything of himself be seen by others save greed and impatience and irritation that Valentine found it strange that he would admit something so personal as that he was pondering a dream. He wondered if metamorphs had meaningful dreams, and sendings, and all of that. The rehearsal went well. Afterward the jugglers made a light and not very satisfying dinner of fruits and berries that Lisa Mon Hulton had gathered in the forest, and washed it down with the last of the wine they had brought from Kintor. Bonfires now were blazing in many streets of Illyravoin, and the discordant music of the various bands set up weird clashing near harmonies. Valentine had assumed the performance would take place in the plaza, but no, metamorphs in what perhaps were priestly costumes came at darkness to escort them to some entirely other part of town, a much larger oval clearing that already was ringed by hundreds or even thousands of expectant onlookers. Zalz and Kavl and his brothers went over the ground carefully, checking for pitfalls and irregularities that might disrupt their movements. Sleet usually took part in that, but Valentine noticed abruptly Sleet had vanished somewhere between the rehearsal place and this clearing. Had his patience run out? Had he gone off to do something rash? Valentine was just about to set out in search when Sleet appeared, breathing lightly as though he had just been jogging. I went to the plaza, he said in a low voice. The cages are still piled up, but most of the guards must be off at the dancing. I was able to exchange a few words with the prisoner before I was chased. And? He said he's to be sacrificed at midnight in the fountain, exactly as in my sending. And tomorrow night the same will happen to us. What? I swear it by the lady, said Sleet. His eyes were like augurs. 
It was under pledge to you, my lord, that I came into this place. You assured me no harm would befall me. Your fears seemed irrational. And now? I begin to revise my opinion, Valentine said. But we'll get out of Illyravoin in good health. I pledge you that. I'll speak with Zalzenkovel after the performance, and after I've had a chance to confer with Deli Amber. It would please me more to get on the road sooner. The metamorphs are feasting and drinking this evening. They'll be less likely to notice our departure later, said Valentine, and less apt to pursue us if pursuit is their aim. Besides, do you think Zalzenkovel would agree to cancel a performance merely on the rumor of danger? We'll do our act, and then we'll begin to extricate ourselves. What do you say? I am yours, my lord, Sleet replied. Fourteen. It was a splendid performance, and no one was in better form than Sleet, who did his blind juggling routine and carried it off flawlessly. The Skandars flung torches at one another with giddy abandon. Carabella cavorted on the rolling globe. Valentine juggled while dancing, skipping, kneeling, and running. The metamorphs sat in concentric circles around them, saying little, never applauding, peering in at them out of the foggy darkness with unfathomable intensity of concentration. Working to such an audience was hard. It was worse than working in rehearsal, for no one expects an audience then. But now there were thousands of spectators, and they were giving nothing to the performers. They were statue still, as the children had been, an austere audience that offered neither approval nor disapproval, but only something that had to be interpreted as indifference. In the face of that, the jugglers presented ever more taxing and marvelous numbers, but for more than an hour they could get no response. And then, astoundingly, the metamorphs began a juggling act of their own, an eerie, dreamlike counterfeit of what the troop had been doing. By twos and threes they came forward from the darkness, taking up positions in the center of the ring only a few yards from the jugglers. As they did so, they swiftly shifted forms, so that six of them now wore the look of bulky, shaggy skandars, and one was small and lithe and much like Carabella, and one had Sleet's compact form. And one, yellow-haired and tall, wore the image of Valentine. There was nothing playful about this donning of the jugglers' bodies. To Valentine it seemed ominous, mocking, distinctly threatening. And when he looked to the side at the non-performing members of the troop, he saw Otifan Deliamber making worried gestures with his tentacles, Vinorcus scowling and Lisa Monhulton rocking evenly back and forth on the balls of her feet as if readying herself for combat. Zalzan Kava looked disconcerted also by this development. Continue, he said in a ragged tone. We are here to perform for them. I think, said Valentine, we are here to amuse them, but not necessarily as performers. Nevertheless, we are performers, and we will perform. He gave a signal and launched, with his brothers, into a dazzling interchange of multitudinous, sharp, and dangerous objects. Sleet, after a moment's hesitation, scooped up a handful of clubs and began to throw them in cascades, as did Carabella. Valentine's hands were chilled. He felt no willingness in them to juggle. The nine metamorphs alongside them were beginning to juggle now, too. It was only counterfeit juggling, dream juggling, with no true art or skill to it. It was mockery and nothing more. They held in their hands rough-skinned black fruits and bits of wood and other ordinary things, and threw them from hand to hand in a child's parody of juggling now and again failing to make even those simple catches, and bending quickly to retrieve what they had dropped. Their performance aroused the audience as nothing that the true jugglers had done had managed to do. The metamorphs now were humming. Was this their form of applause? And rocking rhythmically, and clapping hands to knees. And, Valentine saw, some of them were transforming themselves almost at random. 
taking on odd alternate forms, human or short or Susu Harris as the whim struck, or modeling themselves after the Scandars or Carabella or Deli Amber. At one point he saw six or seven Valentines in the rows nearest him. Performing was all but impossible in such a circus of distractions, but the jugglers clung grimly to their routines for some minutes more, doing poorly now, dropping clubs, missing beats, breaking up long familiar combinations. The humming of the metamorphs grew in intensity. Oh, look, look, Carabella cried suddenly. She gestured toward the nine mock jugglers and pointed at the one who represented Valentine. Valentine gasped. What the metamorph was doing defied all comprehension and struck him rigid with terror and astonishment. For it had begun to oscillate between two forms. One was the Valentine image, the tall, wide-shouldered, big-handed, golden-haired young man. And the other was the image of Lord Valentine the Coronal. The metamorphosis was almost instantaneous, like the flashing of a light. One moment Valentine saw his twin before him, and the next instant there was in his place the black-bearded, fierce-eyed coronal, a figure of might and presence. And then he was gone, and the simple juggler was back. The humming of the crowd became louder. They approved of the show. Valentine, Lord Valentine, Valentine. Lord Valentine. As he watched, Valentine felt a trail of icy chill go down his back, felt his scalp prickle, his knees quiver. There was no mistaking the import of this bizarre pantomime. If ever he had hoped for confirmation of all that had swept through him these weeks since Pidruid, he was getting it now. But here, in this forest town, among these aboriginal folk, he looked into his own mimicked face. He looked into the face of the coronal. The other eight jugglers leaped and pranced in a nightmarish dance, their legs rising high and stamping down, the false scandar arms waving and thumping against their sides, the false sleet hair and carabella hair wild in the night wind, and the valentine figure remained still, alternating one face and the other. And then it was over. Nine metamorphs stood in the center of the circle, holding out their hands to the audience, and the rest of the Purivars were on their feet and dancing in the same wild way. The performance was ended. Still dancing, the metamorphs streamed out into the night, toward the booths and games of their festival. Valentine, stunned, turned slowly and saw the frozen, astonished faces of his companions. Sulz and Carvel's jaw sagged. His arms dangled limply. His brothers clustered close behind him, their eyes wide in awe and shock. Sleet looked frighteningly pale. Carabella the opposite, her cheeks flushed, almost feverish. Valentine held out a hand toward them. Zalz and Carvel came stumbling forward, dazed, all but tripping over his own feet. The giant Skandar paused a few feet from Valentine. He blinked. He ran his tongue over his lips. He seemed to be working hard to make his voice function at all. Finally, he said, in a tiny, preposterous voice, My lord. First Zalz and Kavl, and then his five brothers dropped hesitantly and awkwardly to their knees. With trembling hands, Zalz and Kavl made the starburst symbol. His brothers did the same. Sleet, Carabella, Venorcus, Deliamber, all knelt as well. The boy Shanamir, looking frightened and baffled, stared open-mouthed at Valentine. He seemed paralyzed with wonder and surprise. Slowly he bent to the ground also. Lisamon Holton cried out, have you all gone crazy? Down and pay homage, Sleet ordered her hoarsely. You saw it, woman. He is the colonel. Down and pay homage. The colonel? She repeated in confusion. 
Valentine stretched his arms out over them all in a gesture that was as much one of comfort as blessing. They were frightened of him, and of what had just befallen. So too was he, but his fear was passing quickly, and in its place came strength, conviction, sureness. The sky itself seemed to cry at him. You are Lord Valentine, who was coronal on Castlemount, and you shall have the castle again one day, if you fight for it. Through him now flowed the power of his former imperial office. Even here, in this rain-swept remote hinterland, in this ramshackle aboriginal town, here with the sweat of juggling still on his body, here in these coarse common clothes, Valentine felt himself to be what he once had been. And although he did not understand what metamorphosis had been worked on him to make him what he now was, he no longer questioned the reality of the messages that had come in dreams. And he felt no guilt, no shame, no deceitfulness at receiving this homage from his stupefied companions. Up, he said gently, all of you, on your feet. We must get out of this place. Shanamir, round up the mounts. Zalzan Kavl, get the wagon ready. To sleep, he said. Everyone should be armed. Energy throwers for those who know how to use them. Juggling knives for the rest. See to it. Zalzan Kavl said heavily, My lord, there is in all this the flavor of a dream. To think that all these weeks I traveled with, to think I spoke roughly to, that I quarreled with, Later, Valentine said, we have no time for discussing these things now. He turned to Lisa Monhalton, who seemed busy in some conversation with herself, moving her lips, gesturing, explaining things to herself, debating these bewildering events. In a quiet, forceful voice, Valentine said, You were hired only to bring us as far as Illyravoin. I need you to give us your strength as we escape. Will you stay with us to Nimoya and beyond? They made the starburst at you, she said puzzledly. They all kneeled. And the metamorphs, they... I was once Lord Valentine of Castlemount. Accept it. Believe it. The realm has fallen into dangerous hands. Remain at my side, Lisamon, as I journey east to set things right. She put her huge, meaty hand over her mouth and looked at him in amazement. Then she began to sag into an homage. But he shook his head, caught her by the elbow, would not let her kneel. Come, he said. That doesn't matter now. Out of here. They gathered up their juggling gear and sprinted through the darkness toward the wagon, far across town. Shanamir and Carabella had already taken off and were running well ahead. The Skandars moved in a single ponderous phalanx, shaking the ground beneath them. Valentine had never seen them move so quickly before. He ran just behind them, alongside Sleet. Venorcus, splay-footed and slow, struggled to keep pace with them. To the rear was Lisa Monhalton. She had scooped up Deli Amber and was carrying the little wizard perched in the crook of her left arm. In her right, she bore her unsheathed vibration sword. As they neared the wagon, Sleet said to Valentine, Shall we free the prisoner? Yes. He beckoned to Lisa Monhalton. She put Deli Amber down and followed him. With Sleet in the lead, they ran toward the plaza. To Valentine's relief, it was all but empty. No more than a handful of Purivar guards on duty. The twelve cages still were stacked in tiers at the far end, four on the bottom, then rows of four and three, and the one containing the blue-skinned alien perched on top. Before the guards could react, Lisa Mon Hulton was among them, seizing them two at a time and hurling them far across the plaza. Take no lives, Valentine warned. Sleet, Monkey Swift, was scrambling up the stack of cages. He reached the top and began to cut through the thick withes that held the cage door shut. With brisk, sawing motions of the knife, he slashed while Valentine held the withes taut. In a moment, 
the last of the fibers was severed, and Valentine hoisted the door. The alien clambered out, stretching his cramped limbs and looking questioningly at his rescuers. Come with us, Valentine said. Our wagon is over there, beyond the plaza. Do you understand? I understand, said the alien. His voice was deep, harsh, resonant, with a sharp clipped edge to each syllable. Without another word, he swung himself down past the cages of the forest brethren to the ground, where Lisa Manhulton had finished dealing with the metamorph guards and was piling them tidily in a heap. Impulsively, Valentine sliced through the lashings on the cage of forest brethren nearest to him. The busy little hands of the creatures reached through the bars and pulled the latch, and out they came. Valentine went on to the next cage. Sleet had already descended. One moment, Valentine called. The job's not quite done. Sleet drew his knife and set to work. In moments all the cages were open, and the forest brethren, dozens of them, were disappearing into the night. As they ran to the wagon, Sleet said, Why did you do that? Why not, Valentine asked. They want to live, too. Shanamir and the Skandars had the wagon ready to go. The mounts hitched, the rotors turning. Lisa Monhulton was the last one in. She slammed the door behind her and yelled to Zalzan Kabul, who took off immediately. And just in time, for half a dozen metamorphs appeared and began running frantically after them, shouting and gesticulating. Zalzan Kabul stepped up the wagon speed. Gradually the pursuers fell behind and were lost to sight as the wagon entered the utter darkness of the jungle. Sleep peered worriedly back. Do you think they're still following us? They can't keep up with us, said Lisa Manhalton, and they travel only by foot. We're safely out of there. Are you sure, Sleet asked. What if they have some side route to take in catching up with us? Worry about that when we must, said Carabella. We're moving quickly. She shuddered, and let it be a long while before we see Illyravorn again. They fell silent. The wagon glided swiftly onward. Valentine sat slightly apart from the others. It was inevitable, yet it distressed him, for he was still more Valentine than Lord Valentine, and it was strange and disagreeable to set himself up above his friends. But there was no helping it. Carabella and Sleet, learning privately of his identity, had come to terms with it privately in their own ways. Deli Amber, who had known the truth before Valentine himself, had never been overly awed by it. But the others, whatever suspicions they may have had that Valentine was something more than a happy-go-lucky wanderer, were dumbfounded by the open acknowledgment of his rank that had come out of the grotesque metamorph performance. They stared. They were speechless. They sat in stiff, unnatural postures, as if afraid to slouch in the presence of a coronal. But how should one behave in the presence of a power of Majipur? They could not sit here constantly making starbursts at him. The gesture seemed absurd to Valentine anyway, a comical outpoking of the fingers and nothing more. His growing sense of his own importance did not seem to include much spirit of self-importance yet. The alien introduced himself as Kun of Kyanamot, a world of a star relatively close by Majipur. He seemed a dark and brooding sort, with a crystalline anger and despair at his core. Something integral to his being, that expressed itself, Valentine thought, in the set of his lips and the tone of his voice, and particularly in the intense gaze of his strange, haunted purple eyes. Of course it was possible, Valentine conceded, that he was projecting his own human notions of expression onto this alien being, and that perhaps Kuhn was, as Kianamot folk went, a person of total jollity and amiability. But he doubted that. Kuhn had come to Majipur two years before, on business that he chose not to explain. It was, he said bitterly, the greatest mistake of his life. For among the merry Majipurans, he had been parted from all his money. He had unwisely embarked on a journey to Zimruel, unaware that there was no starport on that continent from which he could depart for his home world. And he had even more foolishly ventured into Purivar territory, 
thinking he could recoup his losses in some sort of trade with the metamorphs. But they had seized him instead, and thrust him in the cage, and held him prisoner for weeks, meaning to give him to the fountain on the high night of their festival. Which would perhaps have been best, he said. One quick blast of water and all this wandering would be at an end. Majipur makes me weary. If I am destined to die on this world of yours, I think I would prefer it to be soon. Pardon us for rescuing you, Carabella said sharply. No, no, I mean no ingratitude, but only... Kun paused. This place has been grief for me. So too was Kianamot. Is there any place in the universe where life does not mean suffering? Has it been that bad, asked Carabella? We find it tolerable here. Even the worst is tolerable enough. "'Considering the alternative?' "'She laughed. "'Are you always this gloomy?' "'The alien shrugged. "'If you are happy, I admire and envy you. "'I find existence painful and life meaningless. "'But these are dark thoughts for one who has just been rescued. "'I thank you for your aid. "'Who are you? "'And what rashness brought you to Purifane? "'And where do you go now?' "'We are jugglers,' said Valentine.' with a sharp glance at the others. We came to this province because we thought there was work for us here, and if we succeed in getting away from this place, we'll head for Nimoya, and down the river to Pillaplock. And from there? Valentine gestured vaguely. Some of us will make the pilgrimage to the Isle. Do you know what that is? And the others? I can't say where they'll go. I must reach Alhanroel, Kuhn said. My only hope lies in going home, which is impossible from this continent. In Pillarplock, perhaps I can arrange passage across the sea. May I travel with you? Of course. I have no money. We see that, said Valentine. It makes no difference. The wagon moved on swiftly through the night. No one slept, except in occasional quick naps. A light rain was falling now. In the darkness of the forest... Dangers might lie on any side, but there was a paradoxical comfort in not being able to see anything, and the wagon sped on unmolested. After an hour or so, Valentine looked up and saw Vinorcus standing before him, gaping like a gaffed fish and quivering with what must be unbearable tension. My lord, he said in a tiny voice. Valentine nodded to the hjort. You're trembling, Vinorcus. My lord. How do I say this? I have a terrible confession to make. Sleet opened his eyes and glared bleakly. Valentine signaled him to be calm. Vinorcus said, My lord, and faltered. He began again. My lord, in Pidruid a man came to me and said, There is a tall, fair-haired stranger at a certain inn, and we believe he has committed monstrous crimes. And this man offered me a bag of crowns if I would keep close by the fair-haired stranger and go wherever he went and give news of his doings to the imperial proctors every few days. A spy, Sleep blurted. His hand flew to the dagger at his hip. Who was this man who hired you, Valentine asked quietly. The hjort shook his head. Someone in the service of the coronal. By the way he dressed. I never knew his name. And you gave these reports, Valentine said. Yes, my lord, Vinorcus murmured, staring at his feet. In every city. After a time I hardly believed that you could be the criminal they said you were, for you seemed kind and gentle and sweet of soul. But I had taken their money, and there was more money for me every time I reported. Let me kill him now, Sleep muttered harshly. There'll be no killing, Valentine said. Neither now nor later. He's dangerous, my lord. Not any longer. I never trusted him, Sleet said. Nor did Carabella, nor Deli Amber. It wasn't just that he was a short. There was always something shifty about him. Sly, insinuating, all those questions, all that sucking around for information. Vinorcus said, I ask pardon. I had no idea whom I was betraying, my lord. You believe that, Sleet cried. Yes, Valentine said. Why not? He had no more idea who I was than... than I did. 
He was told to trail a fair-haired man and give information to the government. Is that so evil a thing? He was serving his coronal, or so he thought. His loyalty must not be repaid by your dagger, Sleet. My lord, sometimes you are too innocent, Sleet said. Perhaps true, but not this time. We have much to gain by forgiving this man, and nothing at all by slaying him. To the Hjort, Valentine said, You have my pardon, Venorcus. I ask only that you be as loyal to the true coronal as you've been to the false. You have my pledge, my lord. Good. Get yourself some sleep now and put away your fear. Venorcus made the starburst and backed away. "'settling down in mid-cabin beside two of the Scandis. "'Sleet said, "'That was unwise, my lord. "'What if he continues to spy on us? "'In these jungles? "'Messages to whom? "'And when we leave the jungles?' "'I think he can be trusted,' said Valentine. "'I know. "'This confession may have been only a double ruse "'to lull us into casting aside our suspicions. "'I'm not as naive as you think, Sleet.' I charge you to keep private watch over him when we reach civilization again, just in case. But I think you'll find his repentance is genuine. And I have uses for him that will make him valuable to me. Uses, my lord. A spy can lead us to other spies. And there'll be other spies, Sleet. We may want Vinorcus to maintain his contacts with the Imperial agents, eh? Sleet winked. I see your meaning, my lord. Valentine smiled, and they fell silent. Yes, he told himself, Vinorcus' horror and remorse were genuine, and provided much that Valentine needed to know. For if the colonel had been willing to pay good sums to have an insignificant wanderer followed from Pidruid to Illyravoin, how insignificant could that wanderer actually be? Valentine felt a weird prickling along his skin. More than anything else, Vinorcus' confession was a confirmation of all that Valentine had discovered about himself. Surely, if the technique that had been used to cast him from his body was new and relatively untried, the conspirators would be uncertain about how permanent the mind-wiping would be, and would hardly dare to allow the outcast coronal to roam about the land free and unobserved. A spy, then, and probably others close by, and the threat of quick preventive action if word got back to the usurper that Valentine was beginning to recover his memory. He wondered how carefully the Imperial forces were tracking him, and at what point they would choose to intercept him on his journey toward Alhanroel. Onward the wagon moved in the blackness of night. Deli Amber and Lisa Monhulton conferred endlessly with Zalz and Carvel about the route. The other main metamorph settlement, Avendroin lay somewhere to the southeast of Illyravoin, in a gap between two great mountains, and it seemed likely that the road they were on would take them there. To ride blithely into another metamorph town hardly seemed wise, of course. Word must have gone on ahead of the freeing of the prisoner and the escape of the wagon. Still, there was even greater peril in trying to go back toward Purifane Fountain. Valentine, not at all sleepy, reenacted the metamorph pantomime a hundred times in his mind. It had the quality of a dream, yes, but no dream was so immediate. He had been close enough to touch his metamorph counterpart. He had seen beyond all doubt those shifts of features from fair to dark, dark to fair. The metamorphs knew the truth, more clearly than he himself. Could they read souls, as Deli Amber sometimes did? What had they felt, knowing they had a fallen coronal in their midst? No awe, certainly. Coronals were nothing to them, mere symbols of their own defeat thousands of years ago. It must have seemed terribly funny to them to have a successor to Lord Stiamat tossing clubs at their festival, amusing them with silly tricks and dances, far from the splendors of Castlemount. A coronal in their own muddy wooden village. How strange, he thought. How much like a dream. Fifteen. Toward dawn, huge rounded mountains became visible, with a broad notch between them. Avendroin could not be far. Zalzenkavl, with a deference he had never shown before, 
came aft to consult Valentine on strategy. Lie low in the woods all day, and wait until nightfall to try to get past Avondroin, or attempt a bold daylight passage. Leadership was unfamiliar to Valentine. He pondered a moment, trying to look far-seeing and thoughtful. At length, he said, if we go forward by day, we are too conspicuous. On the other hand, if we waste all day hiding here, we give them more time to prepare plans against us. Tonight, Sleep pointed out, is the high festival again in Illyravoin, and probably here also. We might slip by them while they're merrymaking, but in daylight we have no chance. I agree, said Lisa Monhalton. Valentine looked around. Carabella? If we wait, we give the Illyravoin people time to overtake us. I say go onward. Deli Amber? The Vroon delicately touched tentacle tips together. Onward. Bypass Avendroin. Double back toward Verth. There'll be a second road to the fountain from Avendroin, surely. Yes, Valentine said. He looked to Zalz and Carvel. My thoughts run with Deli Amber and Carabella. What of yours? Zalz and Carvel scowled. Mine say, let the wizard make this wagon fly and take us tonight to Nimoya. Otherwise, continue on without waiting. So be it, said Valentine, as if he had made the decision single-handedly. And when we approach Avondroin, we'll send scouts out to find a road that bypasses the town. On they went, moving more cautiously as daybreak arrived. The rain was intermittent, but when it came now, it was no gentle spatter more an almost tropical downpour, a heavy cannonade of drops that rattled with malign force against the wagon's roof. To Valentine the rain was welcome. Perhaps it would keep the metamorphs indoors as they went through. There were signs of outskirts now, scattered wicker huts. The road forked and forked again, Deli Amber offering a guess at each point of division, until finally they knew they must be close to Avondroin. Lisa Monhalton and Sleet rode out as scouts, and returned in an hour with good news. One of the two roads just ahead ran right into the heart of Avondroin, where festival preparations were underway, and the other curved toward the northeast, bypassing the city entirely, and going through what looked like a farming district on the farther slopes of the mountains. They took the northeast road. Uneventfully they passed the Avondroin region. Now, in late afternoon, they journeyed down the mountain pass and into a broad, thickly forested plain, rain-swept and dark, that marked the eastern perimeter of Metamorph territory. Zalz and Carvel drove the wagon furiously onward, pausing only when Shanamir insisted that the mounts absolutely had to rest and forage. Virtually tireless they might be, and of synthetic origin, but living things were what they were, and now and then they needed to halt. The Skandar yielded reluctantly. He seemed possessed by desperate need to put Purifane far behind him. Toward twilight, as they went in heavy rain through rough, irregular country, trouble came suddenly upon them. Valentine was riding in mid-cabin, with Deli Amber and Carabella. Most of the others were sleeping, and Hytra Carvel and Giboy Hairn were driving. There came a crashing, crackling, smashing sound from ahead, and a moment later the wagon jolted to a stop. Tree down in the storm, High Track Carvel called. Road blocked in front of us. Zalz and Carvel muttered curses and tugged Lisa Monhalton awake. Valentine saw nothing but green ahead, the entire crown of some forest giant blocking the road. It might take hours or even days to clear that. The Skandars, hoisting energy throwers to their shoulders, went out to investigate. Valentine followed. Darkness was falling rapidly. The wind was gusty, and shafts of rain swept almost horizontally into their faces. Let's get to work, Zalzan Kavl growled, shaking his head in annoyance. Thelkar, you start cutting from down there. Rovorn, the big side branches. Ervan. It might be swifter, Valentine suggested, to back up and look for another fork in the road. The idea startled Zalz and Carvel, 
as if the Scandar would never in a century have conceived such a notion. He mulled it for a moment. Yes, he said finally, that does make some sense. If we... And a second tree, larger even than the first, toppled to the ground a hundred yards behind them. The wagon was trapped. Valentine was the first to comprehend what must be happening. Into the wagon, everyone. It's an ambush. He rushed toward the open door. Too late. Out of the darkening forest came a stream of metamorphs, fifteen or twenty of them, perhaps even more, bursting silently into their midst. Zalzenkavl let out a terrible cry of rage and opened fire with his energy thrower. The blaze of light cast a strange lavender glow over the roadside, and two metamorphs fell, charred hideously. But in the same instant, High Track Cowell uttered a strangled gurgle and dropped, a weapon shaft through his neck, and Thelkar fell, clutching at another in his chest. Suddenly the rear end of the wagon was ablaze. Those within came scrambling out, Lisa Mon Halton leading the way with her vibration sword high. Valentine found himself attacked by a metamorph wearing his own face. He kicked the creature away, pivoted, slashed a second one with the knife that was his only weapon. That was strange, to inflict a wound. In weird fascination he watched the bronze-hued fluid begin to flow. The Valentine metamorph came at him again. Claws went for his eyes. Valentine dodged, twisted, stabbed. The blade sank deep, and the metamorph reeled back, clutching at its chest. Valentine trembled in shock, but only for an instant. He turned to confront the next. This was a new experience for him, this fighting and killing, and it made his soul ache. But to be gentle now was to invite a quick death. He thrust and cut, thrust and cut. From behind him he heard Carabella call, How are you doing? Holding my own, he grunted. Zalzan Kavl, seeing his magnificent wagon on fire, howled and caught a metamorph by the waist and hurled it into the pyre. Two more rushed at him. But another Skandar seized them and snapped them like sticks with each pair of hands. In the frantic melee, Valentine caught sight of Carabella wrestling with a metamorph, forcing it to the ground with the powerful forearm muscles years of juggling had developed. And there was Sleet, ferociously vindictive, pounding another with his boots in savage joy. But the wagon was burning. The wagon was burning. The woods were full of metamorphs. Night was swiftly coming on, the rain was a torrent, and the wagon was burning. As the heat of the fire increased, the center of the battle shifted from the roadside to the forest, and matters became even more confused, for in the darkness it was hard to tell friend from foe. The metamorph trick of shape-shifting added another complication. Although in the frenzy of the fight they were unable to hold their transformations for long, and what seemed to be Sleet or Shanamir or Zalzan Kavl reverted quickly to its native form. Valentine fought savagely. He was slippery with his own sweat and the blood of metamorphs, and his heart hammered mightily with the furious exertion. Panting, gasping, never still an instant, he waded through the tangle of enemies with a zeal that astonished him, never pausing for an instant's rest. Thrust and cut, thrust and cut, the metamorphs were armed with only the simplest of weapons, and though there seemed to be dozens of them, their numbers soon were dwindling rapidly. Lisa Mon Hulton was doing awful destruction with her vibration sword, swinging it two-handed and lopping off the boughs of trees as well as the limbs of metamorphs. The surviving Skandars, spraying energy bolts wildly around the scene, had ignited half a dozen trees and had littered the ground with fallen metamorphs. Sleet was maiming and slaughtering as if he could in one wild minute avenge himself for all the pain he fancied the metamorphs had brought upon him. Kuhn and Vinorcus, too, were fighting with passionate energy. As suddenly as the ambush had begun, it was over. By the light of the fires, Valentine could see dead metamorphs everywhere. Two dead skandars lay among them. Lisa Mon Hulton bore a bloody but shallow wound on one thigh. Sleet had lost half his jerkin, and had taken several minor cuts. Shanamir had claw marks across his cheek. Valentine, too, felt some trifling scratches and nicks, and his arms had a leaden ache of fatigue. 
but he had not been seriously harmed. Delhi Amber, though? Where was Delhi Amber? The rune wizard was nowhere to be seen. In anguish, Valentine turned to Carabelle and said, Did the rune stay in the wagon? I thought we all came out when it burst a fire. Valentine frowned. In the silence of the forest, the only sounds were the terrible hissing and crackling of fire, and the quiet mocking patter of the rain. Delhi Amber, Valentine called. Delhi Amber, where are you? Here, answered a high-pitched voice from above. Valentine looked up and saw the sorcerer clinging to a sturdy bough, fifteen feet off the ground. Warfare is not one of my skills, Delhi Amber explained blandly, swinging outward and letting himself drop into Lisa Mon Hulton's arms. Carabella said, What do we do now? Valentine realized that she was asking him. He was in command. Zals and Kabul, kneeling by his brother's bodies, seemed stunned by their deaths and by the loss of his precious wagon. He said, We have no choice but to cut through the forest. If we try to take the main road, we'll meet more metamorphs. Shanamir, what of the mounts? Dead, the boy sobbed. Every one! The metamorphs! On foot, then. A long, wet journey it will be, too. Delhi Amber, how far do you think we are from the river Staichi? A few days' journey, I suspect. But we have no sure notion of the direction. Follow the slope of the land, Sleet said. Rivers won't lie uphill from here. If we keep going east, we're bound to hit it. Unless a mountain stands in our way, Delhi Amber remarked. We'll find the river, Valentine said firmly. The Staichi flows into the Zimmer at Nimoya, is that right? Yes, said Delhi Amber. But its flow is turbulent. We'll have to chance it. A raft, I suppose, will be the quickest to build. Come, if we stay here much longer, we'll be set upon again. They could salvage nothing from the wagon, neither clothing, nor food, nor belongings, nor their juggling gear. All lost, every scrap, everything but what had been on them when they came forth to meet the ambushers. To Valentine that was no great loss, but to some of the others, particularly the Skandars, it was overwhelming. The wagon had been their home a long while. It was difficult to get Zalzan Kavl to move from the spot. He seemed frozen, unable to abandon the bodies of his brothers and the ruin of his wagon. Gently, Valentine urged him to his feet. Some of the metamorphs, he said, might well have escaped in the skirmish. They could soon return with reinforcements. It was perilous to remain here. Quickly they dug shallow graves in the soft forest floor and laid Thelkar and Hytrak Kavl to rest. Then, in steady rain and gathering darkness... They set out in what they hoped was an easterly direction. For over an hour they walked, until it became too dark to see. Then they camped miserably in a little soggy huddle, clinging to one another until dawn. At first light they rose, cold and stiff, and picked their way onward through the tangled forest. The rain at least had stopped. The forest here was less of a jungle, and gave them little challenge except for an occasional swift stream that had to be forded with care. At one of those, Carabella lost her footing and was fished out by Lisa Monhulton. At another it was Shonamir who was swept downstream, and Kun who plucked him to safety. They walked until midday, and rested an hour or two, making a scrappy meal of raw roots and berries. Then they went on until darkness, and passed two more days in the same fashion and on the third came to a grove of dwicker trees, eight fat squat giants in the forest, with monstrous swollen fruits hanging from them. Food, Zalzenkaufel bellowed. Food sacred to the forest, brethren, Lisa Monhulton said. Be careful. The famished Skandar, nevertheless, was on the verge of cutting down one of the enormous fruits with his energy thrower, when Valentine said sharply, No, I forbid it. Zalz and Carvel stared incredulously. For an instant, his old habits of command asserted themselves, and he glared at Valentine as if about to strike him. But he kept his temper in check. Look, Valentine said. 
forest brethren were emerging from behind every tree. They were armed with their dart blowers, and seeing the slender ape-like creatures encircling them, Valentine in his weariness felt almost willing to be slain. But only for a moment. He recovered his spirits and said to Lisa Monhalton, Ask them if we may have food and guides to the Staichi. If they ask a price, we can juggle for them with stones or pieces of fruit, I suppose. The warrior woman, twice as tall as the forest brethren, went into their midst and talked with them a long time. She was smiling when she returned. They are aware, she said, that we are the ones who freed their brothers in Illyravoin. Then we are saved, cried Shanamir. News travels swiftly in this forest, Valentine said. Lisa Monhalton went on. We are their guests. They will feed us. They will guide us. That night the wanderers ate richly on wicker fruit and other forest delicacies, and there was actually laughter among them for the first time since the ambush. Afterward the forest brethren performed a sort of dance for them, a monkeyish prancing thing, and Sleet and Carabella and Valentine responded with impromptu juggling using objects collected in the forest. Afterward Valentine slept a deep, satisfying sleep. In his dreams he had the gift of flight and saw himself soaring to the summit of Castle Mount. And in the morning, a party of chattering forest brethren led them to the river Staichi, three hours' journey from the Dwicker Tree Grove, and bade them farewell with little twittering cries. The river was a sobering sight. It was broad, though nothing remotely like the mighty Zimmer, and it sped northward with startling haste, flowing so energetically that it had carved out a deep bed bordered in many places by high rocky walls. Here and there ugly stone snags rose above the water, and downstream Valentine could see white eddies of rapids. The building of rafts took a day and a half. They cut down the young slim trees that grew by the river bank, trimmed and trued them with knives and sharp stones, lashed them together with vines. The results were hardly elegant, but the rafts, though crude, did look reasonably river-worthy. There were three altogether. One for the four Skandars, one for Kuhn, Vinorkis, Lisa Monhalton, and Sleet, and one occupied by Valentine, Carabella, Shanamir, and Deliander. We will probably become separated as we go down river, Sleet said. We should choose a meeting place in Nimoya. Deliander said, the Staichi and the Zimmer flow together at a place called Nisimon. There is a broad, sandy beach there. Let us meet at Nisimon Beach. At Nisimon Beach, yes, Valentine said. He cut loose the cord that bound his raft to the shore, and was carried off into the river. The first day's journey was uneventful. There were rapids, but not difficult ones, and they poled safely past them. Carabella showed skill at handling the raft, and deftly steered them around the occasional rocky patches. After a time, the rafts became separated, Valentine's taking some sub-current and moving rapidly ahead of the other two. In the morning he waited, hoping the others would catch up, but there was no sign of them, and eventually he decided to depart. On, 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 for the most part swept easily along with occasional moments of anxiety in the white water stretches. By afternoon of the second day, the course was becoming rougher. The land seemed to dip here, sloping downward as the Zimmer drew near, and the river, following the line of descent, plunged and bucked. Valentine began to worry about waterfalls ahead. They had no charts, no notion of dangers. They took everything as it came. He could only trust to luck that this swift water would deliver them safely to Nimoya. And then? By boat to Pillaplock, and by pilgrim ship to the Isle of Sleep, and somehow procure an interview with the lady, his mother. And then? And then? How did one claim the coronal's throne, when one's face was not the face of Lord Valentine, the rightful ruler? By what claim? By what authority? It seemed to Valentine an impossible quest. He might be better remaining here in the forest, ruling over his little band. They readily enough accepted him for what he thought himself to be. 
But in that world of billions of strangers, in that vast empire of giant cities that lay beyond the edge of the horizon, how, how, how would he ever manage to convince the unbelievers that he, Valentine the Juggler, was... No, these thoughts were foolish. He had never, not since he had appeared shorn of memory and past on the verge overlooking Pidruid, felt the need to rule over others. And if he had come to command this little group, it was more by natural gift and by Zazen Kalvel's default than out of any overt desire on his part. And yet he was in command, however tentatively and delicately. So it would be as he traveled onward through Majipur. He would take one step at a time and do that which seemed right and proper. And perhaps the lady would guide him, and if the divine so willed it, he would one day stand again on Castle Mount. And if that was not part of the great plan, why, that would be acceptable also. There was nothing to fear. The future would unroll serenely in its own true course, as it had done since Pidruid. And, Valentine! Carabella shouted. The river seemed to sprout giant stony teeth. There were boulders everywhere, and monstrous white whirlpools. And just ahead, an ominous tumbling descent, a place where the Staichi leaped out into space and went roaring down a series of steps to a valley far below. Valentine gripped his pole, but no pole could help him now. It lodged between two snags and was ripped from his grasp. A moment later there was a ghastly grinding sound as the flimsy raft, battered by submerged rocks, swung around at right angles to its course and split apart. He was hurled into the chilly stream and swept forward like a cork. For a moment he grasped Carabella by the wrist. But then the current pulled her free, and as he clutched desperately for her he was engulfed by the swift water and driven under. Gasping and choking, Valentine struggled to get his head above water. When he did, he was already far downstream. The wreckage of the raft was nowhere in sight. Carabella, he yelled. Shanamir, Deli Amber, hoy, hoy! He roared until his voice was ragged, but the booming of the rapids so thoroughly covered his cries that he could scarcely hear them himself. A terrible sense of pain and loss numbed his spirit. All gone then? His friends, his beloved Carabella the wily little rune, the clever, cocky boy Shanamir, all swept to death in an instant. No, no, unthinkable. That was an agony far worse than this business, still unreal to him, of being a coronal thrust from the castle. What did that mean? These were beings of flesh and blood, dear to him. That was only a title and power. He would not stop calling their names as the river threw him about. Carabella, he shouted, Shanamir! Valentine clawed at rocks, trying to halt his willy-nilly descent. But he was in the heart of the rapids now, buffeted and battered by the current and by the stones of the riverbed. Dazed and exhausted, half paralyzed by grief, Valentine gave up struggling and let himself be carried along, down the giant staircase of the river, a tiny plaything spinning and bouncing along. He drew his knees to his chest and wrapped his arms over his head attempting to minimize the surface he presented to the rocks. The power of the river was awesome. So here is how it ends, he thought. The grand adventure of Valentine of Majipur, once coronal, later wandering juggler, now about to be broken to bits by the impersonal and uncaring forces of nature. He commended himself to the lady whom he thought to be his mother, and gulped air and went heels over head, head over heels, down and down and down, and struck something with frightening force, and thought this must be the end, only it was not the end, and struck something again that gave him an agonizing blow in the ribs, knocking the air from him, and he must have lost consciousness for a time, for he felt no further pain. And then he found himself lying on a pebble-strewn strand, in a quiet side stream of the river. It seemed to him that he had been shaken in a giant dice box for hours, and cast up at random, discarded and useless. His body ached in a thousand places. His lungs felt soggy when he breathed. He was shivering and his skin was covered with goosebumps, and he was alone, under a vast cloudless sky, at the edge of some unknown wilderness, 
with civilization some unknown distance ahead, and his friends perhaps dashed to death on the boulders. But he was alive, that much was sure. Alone, battered, helpless, grief-stricken, lost, but alive. The adventure then was not ended. Slowly, with infinite effort, Valentine hauled himself out of the surf and tottered to the river bank, and let himself carefully down on a wide, flat rock, and with numb fingers undid his clothing and stretched out to dry himself under the warm, friendly sun. He looked toward the river, hoping to see Carabella come swimming along, or Shanami with the wizard perched on his shoulder. No one. But that doesn't mean they're dead, he told himself. They may have been cast up on farther shores. I'll rest here for a time, Valentine resolved, and then I'll go searching for the others. And then, with them or without, I'll set out onward, toward Nimoya, toward Pilaplock, toward the Isle of the Lady. Onward, onward, onward toward Castlemont, or whatever else lies ahead for me. Onward, onward, onward. <laughs>